Yo. Well, well, well. It would appear that it's that time again. Time to deep dive into yet another massive iceberg. I'm sure you know the drill by now of these sorts of videos, so I won't bore you with any of that. But I would like to shout out the creator of this iceberg, Nora, who not only put this massive iceberg together, but they also personally contacted me to cover this iceberg, provided me with a Google Doc of extra information so that we can very clearly see what every entry on this iceberg is about, or at least point me in the right direction of where to start researching, and generally just put a ton of hard work, passion, and time into this thing. So an absolute gigantic thank you and shout out to them. But with that said, after our traversing of the deep and exhibition through Creepypasta Island, I think it's time we go somewhere a little more refined, you and me. A place full of wonder, years of lore, mysteries, tragedies, horror, and a good helping of a green gay and general good old fashioned weirdness for good measure. The place that I refer to of course is none other than what have I got? the Deviant Heart Museum. Be you an old time user back from the 2000s to a newer user or someone who's only ever heard mentions of this fabled place, you are sure to discover many new things from within the walls of this abode of art. I've also got some history with this website, so I'll be recounting some old memories and tales from my early days on the internet as we go along. So, with that in mind, let's begin our tour through its halls and see what wonders we may discover. The Origin DeviantArt is an American online art community that features artwork, videography, photography, literature, etc. And the site first launched on August 7th of 2000 by Angelo Sortia, Scott Jarkoff, and Matthew Stevens, among others, as part of a larger network of music-related websites called the D Music Network. The site flourished largely because of its unique offering and contributions of its core member base and a team of volunteers after its launch, but was officially incorporated in 2001 about 8 months after launch. All three of the co-founders shared backgrounds in the application skinning community, but it was Matt Stevens who had the perhaps most major contribution to the website, that being the suggestion to take the concept further than skinning and more towards a general art community. Many of the individuals involved with the initial development and promotion of DeviantArt still hold positions with the project, with Angelo Sarita currently serving as the Chief Executive Officer of DeviantArt Incorporated, for example. Oh, and if you're wondering what the term skinning refers to, well, again, according to Wikipedia, in computing, a skin is a custom graphical appearance preset package achieved by the use of a graphical user interface or GUI that can be applied to specific computer software, operating system, and websites to suit the purpose, topic, or tastes of different users. As such, a skin can completely change the look and feel and navigation interface of a piece of application software or operating system. Software that is capable of having a skin applied is referred to as being skinnable, and the process of writing or applying such a skin is known as skinning. 
Applying a skin changes a piece of software's look and feel. Some skins merely make the program more aesthetically pleasing, but others can rearrange elements of the interface, potentially making the program easier to use. So, in other words, skinning is the design or art of interfaces in applications. I suppose an easy example of this would be the difference between light and dark mode. As simple as it is, that would be a different skin, I suppose. Of course, once the floodgates were opened from this very specific niche onto just general art, the website would truly then begin to flourish. In fact, back in July of 2011, DeviantArt was the largest art community, and by 2015, the site had over 358 million images, which have been uploaded by its over 35 million registered members. Of course, things are a little bit different now, uh, but we'll get to that later. Now it's time to start going over the many functions, terminology, and general basic info about the site, as well as uh, some of its more notable members and communities, of course. Fella. Fella is the official mascot of DeviantArt, or a DA as I'm going to now start referring to it as. His design can be traced back to 2001, with him being the winner of a contest to design a mascot for the site. From my own research, it would seem that the creator of the iconic mascot went by the username of Switched on DA. However, his account has since been deleted, so we unfortunately cannot see what else the user did or get any basic info about them. However, what is known is that Fela used to look a bit different before he was redesigned by user the Kid Chaos or Pedro. Pedro would also design the first official plushie for Fela, which was released back in 2007. The toy was very popular and it sold out pretty quickly thanks to the holiday sales of that year. Fela would then go through yet another redesign once more by Pedro in 2008, which design-wise I can only describe as a clear case of Raymanification. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. This is the design that is still being used to this very day, the most iconic of them all. Pedro also once wrote a little something about the character of Fela and why he thinks the mascot is so beloved to this day. Quote, Fella is one cheeky little guy. He represents the mischievous, devious artist inside us all. He's that spark that makes you go nuts and bananas and come up with some awesome piece. That's why every deviant loves him." Unquote. Journals Journals are sort of the personal yet public diaries for users to share their thoughts and concerns. I suppose it works a lot like tweets, but there was some elements of customization to them which we'll get into later. Needless to say though, journals are where you could post updates about future art projects, use it as a personal diary for everything or anything you're doing in your life, complete like artist tags and shout other people out, and it was sure to be a place where people posted about whatever drama was going on in whatever community, group, friend group, or even their own personal lives that was going on at that given moment. Augmented by the ability to appoint the very top of a journal with your general mood and what you're currently playing and eating and whatever. So basically, they're just a long form Twitter post. Collections. This is just in reference to how DA users can make small folders to categorize their art. Uh, by genre, fan art versus original stuff, prose versus poems, etc. Artists can also categorize their favorites or art that they really like this way as well. And there are even some users that had some rather infamous or prestigious favorite collections that made one of your pieces of art being a part of made the piece and by extension you a part of a bigger collection for uh, better or worse. This was also used as a means of trolling as some people had collections made up of what they deemed to be a bad, cringe, disgusting, etc. And thus was used as a sort of cringe compilation but for art. While others had collections that were all about showcasing art that was by smaller creators that they really enjoyed and thought people should see. And these would usually also be followed up by journals, which would sometimes be tied into these collections to further showcase 
all the new art by lesser known artists that was being created. There were entire accounts dedicated to both the positive and the negative and the neutral to all these collections. All working as part of the bigger picture, the ecosystem of the Deviant Art website. And speaking of being a part of a larger picture, groups. Groups are basically like fan pages you can make on DeviantArt that other members can follow and be a part of. Or I guess if you really must make this comparison, I guess it's sort of similar to making a subreddit, but on DeviantArt. These groups can be for a specific genre of art, for a fandom, which the majority of them were for that, as well as a niche interest. Niches or subgroups from within a fandom, a role-playing group, and pretty much anything else that you can possibly imagine. As we go through this iceberg, we'll be covering several groups, especially those that are, well, the most interesting, shall we say. Groups are a very concentrated version of DeviantArt to me, because some of the darkest and most bizarre aspects of the site can be found fairly easy within them. But of course, there were also plenty that were perfectly fine and fun to be a part of, for being all up to date with the current art, fan fictions, or just general community of a fandom that you happen to really enjoy. I remember for myself back in the day, whenever I was first going on DeviantArt, those groups would have been for things like Sonic the Hedgehog, Spyro the Dragon, Crash Bandicoot, Star Fox groups, basically whatever video game slash anime franchises I just happen to be a fan of. And at one point, I even had a super popular group dedicated to creative writing and reading slash critiquing other people's works. This is kind of a funny thing looking back since I really didn't know what the hell I was personally doing writing wise. Being a very young teen at the time, after all. But I created a group because I liked the idea of reading other people's works and in exchange them reading your own and giving each other thoughts on your written stuff. But that being said, as the founder of a fairly popular creative writing group, suddenly a lot of eyes were put on my work at that time which was very fun for me to see, especially when I remember all the genuinely nice things people had to say about, well, frankly, my terrible, awful writing. Like seriously, whatever edgy phase you thought you were going through, it didn't even come close to the type of running with scissors stuff that I was doing at the time. Of course, for good reason, I also got a fair bit of criticism through all this as well, all of which I really did take the heart and there might have even been a couple of really good lessons that came from the whole thing. But I suppose I bring this up all to say that these groups really had a way of connecting people on this site. I ended up getting a lot of friends because of that group. Though some people might have used it as a general dumping ground for their art related to whatever fandom that they're currently in so that maybe some more eyes can get on it, these really were social hubs. And being the head of such a group, or among its staff, put a lot of eyes on you, with some even looking at them as a sort of leader or important member of the community, even if it was, in reality, just some guy or gal who made a fan page on the site. DeviantArt Summit Speaking of groups, the Summit is an invitation-only group. It's the largest photography-based group and is very heavily moderated. On their page, they say the following about themselves. Quote, Welcome to the summit. We carefully select the unseen and the renowned alike, so that they may be viewed equally. We select only the best from you. We do not accept submissions, so please do not ask. They will feature an exceptional artist every so often. As soon as we can become a supergroup again, we will resume blogs and journals. Please be patient and look forward to amazing artists once more. Join the movement and be part of the revolution." Unquote. Pretty elite group, or at least that's how they like to carry themselves anyway. Of note, however, is it seems the group has since gone dormant as there has not been a new journal entry for the group since 2012, and all the newest submissions to this prestigious group all last come from 2014. There also seems to have been some interviews with two of the co-founders and its single moderator. 
but all three of the pages to these three interviews are no longer available, as well as all of those three going dormant as well. Still, I suppose the gallery still remains as a legacy of a once respected group full of very talented photographers, best works of the time. Ratings. Many artists allow ratings on their art, with a rating out of five stars being available to be given as well as rating various aspects. This was something you could turn on or off, and you could also allow or disallow official critiques of your work as well in case you did or did not want any of that. Of course, this wouldn't stop people from commenting their thoughts either way on a piece in the comment section, but it was a feature all the same. Notes. This is just the name for DeviantArt's direct messaging system. While now we may share drama through leaked Discord and Twitter DMs, back in the day, they all came from this place. More like X. The More Like X is a tab when viewing any given piece of art that shows similar pieces, and many of which often lead down a rabbit hole of bizarre and random art. If you're at all familiar with how it works on YouTube, which, I mean, you're watching this video right now, I'm sure you're aware of how it works, you can really find yourself in strange and interesting places if you do this for long enough. Though I would be amiss if I did not note that on DeviantArt in particular, the strange place it almost always leads to is fetish art of pretty much every variety. Stash. This was a sister site to DA of sorts that acts as a sort of a uh, storage space for your art. Not much more to it than that. Badges. Badges are small pixel icons that show up next to a user's profile with each having a different meaning. Some of these badges were given out for participating in a site-wide event. Some were given out after special milestones had been crossed on your profile, and others were purely a thing that could be gifted slash traded with other users, with the most popular badge that was very often traded being llamas. Llamas are one of those things that were really, really popular on the site, downright iconic even, and everyone had at least a few as they were given out for free to any user you wanted to give them to, essentially. Llamas were given out to people you were friends with, people you were a fan of, or just for the hell of it. And there really didn't have to be any particular reason you gave someone a llama badge. And there were even some people that ran around the site just giving them out like candy to every single person that they saw. After a bit, if you collected a certain amount of llama badges, the badge would then upgrade to like a super llama, and then to an albino llama, a ninja llama, a fancy llama, a king llama, and so on and so forth. You could say that having a certain amount of these on your profile was a bit of a status symbol. A status symbol that means absolutely nothing, uh, but since, you know, say you had a thousand llamas, it did mean that at least a thousand different users went to your page and gave you one. So when you saw someone with, say, a fancy or king or hell even a golden llama, you knew that they were pretty damn popular. Well, along with being able to see how many page views they had gotten and how many followers they probably had, of course. Hell, they even sold llama plushies, but we'll get to that in a minute. Stamps. Stamps are little icons users would use to express small tidbits about themselves. The stamps would usually say something like, this user is X, or this user likes X. People would put their astrological sign here, what fandoms that they're a part of, parts of their personality, religion or lack thereof, sexuality, career choice, etc. These would also have a rather divisive counterpoint with the rise of anti-tags, which are the same as normal tags, but would often be separately categorized as it was about what things the user doesn't like, what kind of users they are anti against, from you know, fandoms to philosophies, racism, types of art, or even in some cases specific users or people, since some people were pretty petty, and you bet that they'd be petty enough to make a tag just to denote who their enemies were. This of course would only be seen as hilarious by whoever the enemy was, but at the same time, I did see a lot of these back in the day. Some people really thought they were owning the trolls by making a little stamp card they put on their profile page showcasing that they don't like this guy. 
for everyone else to see. Stamps was just another piece of customization one could have on their page, and everyone who used DA as a sort of social media platform was sure to have a ton of stamps on their page somewhere. Membership. Similar to YouTube Premium, Core Membership is a paid subscription users can purchase for a wide array of benefits, uh, be they custom page layouts, uh, more storage and stash, the ability to schedule post days in advance, changing your username, and more. This was how you could really make your page stand out and was one of those things that frequent users of the site would buy into to further express themselves. Again, in fact, I remember getting this membership thing a few times back when I was a teen. Points. Points were an online currency used for DA. Points could be purchased using actual money and points most often were used to purchase commissions. They were also something you could hand out to people as a sign of appreciation, a bit of a donation if you will. And they could also be used to buy memberships and other things on the website, such as stuff from the shirt and gear shop. This is now defunct, but this was the shop for various DA merch from shirts to hoodies, etc. But the thing I remember being the most popular were the plushies, especially the fella plush, as well as the llama plushies. Though it seems as though the store was closed around early 2013. And, another fun piece of trivia, I just so happen to own not one, but two super llama plushies. <laughs> yep. That's right, I'm out of myself as one of those guys that bought a super llama back in the day. Though, since the store has been closed for oh, literally 10 years at this point, and far fewer people bought this Super Llama plushie versus, like, the Fella plushie, I now happen to own two extremely rare pieces of DeviantArt history, I'll have you know. Though, what's kind of funny is when I tried to research how much these things tend to sell for online, I had a... <laughs> I had a bit of trouble finding anyone selling them period online, which means I don't actually know what these things are worth. I saw the fella plushie selling for about a hundred bucks on eBay, but that's about as close as I got. But still, marvel at probably one of the only videos you're ever going to see of this plushie in action. Commissions. While not exclusively or even really started by DA, commissioning as a whole is pretty ingrained through the history of the site. Commissioning is the act of paying an artist to draw something for you. Commissioning to this day is still a really good way for artists to get paid for their work. And as noted earlier, some even allowed points to be used as currency, though this was often done by younger users since I mean, the points kind of are worthless at the end of the day, especially now. Requests were also fairly popular amongst smaller artists who wanted to just get started drawing for others and work their way up to commissions as well. Art Trades Art trades are when artists collaborate and one would draw the other person's OC or original character while the other person draws the other person's OC. This was a pretty fun way to try your hand out at drawing someone else's character in your own style while getting to see your own character in their style. Art Memes While not exclusive to DA, art memes can be traced back to the site. Essentially, you draw your OCs or canon characters to match a meme or template or funny screenshot. Think those draw your OCs like this memes you see on Twitter or the draw the squad memes from Tumblr. I also remember huge art trades being done, and these were 5, 6, 7, or even 10 or however many artists in a friend group would use a core base or meme template and each draw their characters as part of the squad. Usually they'd all be playing video games or hanging out at some kind of big dinner table or partying or something like that. This was also very popular for groups and what I like to refer to as DA families to do, which speaking of, bonus entry, Deviant Art Families, otherwise known as the Families. This is something that I don't think is really unique to DeviantArt, but I remember the highest concentration of it I I've ever seen comes from DeviantArt. Basically what a DeviantArt family was is you take your friend group 
and then list them on your main profile page as your brothers, sisters, cousins, father, mother, wife, husband, etc. And then every other person in that group who is a part of the family then lists that in like the exact same order but from their perspective. Thus you all have matching pages for the canonized pretend DeviantArt family. Now, I really couldn't say where or why this first came to be, but I wanted to make note of it here because this was extremely common. I saw it all the time back when I used to use DeviantArt as a teen. It was often seen as both a very normal thing to do as well as a symbol that you were part of some a greater group. And it's also a phenomenon that I haven't really seen emulated exactly the same way. The closest I've seen it is sometimes people have stuff like this in Discord servers, I guess? But that's like one person setting up a whole big thing versus like groups up to 30 people all setting up this big DeviantArt family thing. Not even necessarily passing judgment, just felt like it should be noted. Carlos Ramirez. Most of you, through one means or another, are probably familiar with the troll face, right? It's been used unironically and ironically for years at this point. It's evolved in some ways, and in many ways is sort of a precursor to the, I guess, more modern-ish Wojak. And just generally speaking, is quite popular and kind of a piece of internet iconography, I'd argue at this point. Well, I wonder how many of you know about this infamous face's origins. The earliest known use of the troll face is on Carlos's own DeviantArt page under his account, Wine. You can see its original use here. The troll face was made as sort of a satirization of trolls and internet culture of the time. Posted in September of 2008, the now infamous MS Paint webcomic poking fun at 4chan's slash vboard would eventually make its way onto 4chan and later Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and the internet at large. However, in a funny twist of fate, the troll face became something of an actual face, a persona for trolls to use that was recognizable, perhaps even slightly relatable, and would be used by nearly everyone at least at one time or another back in the day, which I suppose really goes to show that old tried and true piece of advice, don't feed the trolls, because sometimes that piece of humble pie you thought was meant to own them, they just might use as the basis for a bakery that turns into a worldwide chain. To this very day, the troll face is often used with its current evolution into troll face stories or incidents uh, being an example of that here. It's also become a sort of symbol for that time frame of the internet generally speaking. The good old days, some may say. It all long going past its original use intent, which is undeniably a very internet outcome for such a thing. Also of note is in 2011, a man claiming to be Carlos sent an email to an unknown individual claiming that the troll face being shared on Reddit violated his copyright. This wouldn't be the last instance of this either, as in 2015, the game Meme Run would be removed from the eShop following a DMCA. It should also be noted, by the way, that because DeviantArt was the birthplace of the troll face, you can bet that there was a lot of emojis and a lot of people using troll face and other troll face comic emojis and faces all over the site for quite some time. Art turned into memes. This entry is just referencing that there are many pieces of art from DA that would later be used in memes, with one popular example being this picture of a knight protecting a princess, which was created in 2015 by DA user Walp, who is pretty damn popular and prolific, might I add, and makes some pretty stunning pieces of art. Sketchbook. This is a free program that artists can use to post directly to DA from. It's also fairly popular. DeviantArt World Tour. Started in 2009, this is the live event world tour of various cities with artists being highlighted and even invited to join, including Sydney, Singapore, Warsaw, Istanbul, Berlin, Paris, London, New York City, Toronto, and Los Angeles. During the world tour, the new portfolio feature of DA 
was also previewed to attend these. It was a way for the community of DeviantArt from around the world to come together and show off their stuff. There's actually some footage of these events as well as some of the other DeviantArt related events we're about to go over here in a moment that was thankfully recorded and documented. I don't want to go over too much of it here, but you can look forward to a future livestream where I'll be looking at all these in detail. Just for a bit of fun. Deviant Art Summit. Not to be confused with the group as mentioned earlier, on June 17th and 18th of 2005, DeviantArt held their first ever convention, the DeviantArt Summit at the Palladium in the Hollywood area of Los Angeles. The summit consisted of several exhibitions by numerous artists, including art scene groups old and new at around 200 different booths. Giant projection screens displayed artwork as it was being submitted live to DeviantArt, which was receiving 50,000 new images daily at the time. Bonus Entry, Birthday Bashes and Deviant Meet. This is yet another live event where artists could meet up in 2010, European DeviantArt members held a Deviant Meet to celebrate DeviantArt's birthday in August, and there was also a celebration that same year in the House of Blues in Hollywood. Again, these are pretty self-explanatory, they were DeviantArt conventions. Bases slash pixel dolls. Oh, now this one is rather notorious. Bases or dolls are blank drawing guides that users can draw over uh, with them being most common for anime characters, My Little Pony, Furries, and Sonic the Hedgehog characters. These were hotly contested at the time, and many found them to be in bad taste since some considered it cheating to just trace over a drawing someone else made and then call it your own art. Though it should be noted that bases were originally made with the express purpose of doing that, which at least for me means they're not quite on the same level as just literally tracing over someone else's art. But then again, I suppose no one was stopping someone from making a base out of someone else's drawing, and then someone else would trace over the base, and so now it's like, uh, like stealing art from another art, and it could all get rather complicated fast. Just on a personal note, it really helps if you just don't care at all. Which is my personal stance, at least on my own stuff, but you know, that's, that, that's just me. There were many that also thought that the bases could be used as a good jumping off point for dynamic poses and the like which there are many people on DA to this day that are essentially live human bases, posing in various ways for reference. And you'd be hard pressed to not see a professional artist that doesn't at least use a reference once in a while, if not fairly frequently. However, many wouldn't do that and instead would literally just draw hair and skin tight clothing on top of the MS Paint drawing, which often looked pretty tacky to say the least but not really any more offensive than someone just going ham and doodling all sorts of random things in MS Paint. YouTuber Izzy also made a, a video breaking down the history of this practice, so if you want more lore about the drama of these things, you can go check that video out. She goes way more in depth than I can really go into here for this iceberg. But needless to say, this was a hotly debated topic of DA, and entire groups were dedicated to both creating bases, trashing on bases, and everything in between. Everyone had an opinion, some being far more louder than others. Furries While DeviantArt isn't the origin point for furries, in its prime, DA had arguably the largest furry community of any online platform, with many well-known fursuiters getting their start with DA. Now, if you somehow never heard of furries, or maybe don't really know what they are, according to wikifur.com, quote, Someone who says they are furry is generally expressing an interest in anthropomorphic animals and or creatures, and perhaps some affiliation to furry fandom. They may express that interest in a variety of ways, through art and stories, through roleplay and performance, like fursuits, how deep or meaningful interest in furry is varied greatly from person to person. Below is a list of common interests with which a fur is likely to identify. 
A furry may be interested in any or all of them to any degree. Cartoons and Games Interest in anthropomorphic animals and or creatures can be as simple as the many popular furry cartoon characters known as funny animals. These may include Bugs Bunny, Tony the Tiger, Sly Cooper, Star Fox, etc. However, someone who merely happens to like these characters is not necessarily a furry. The degree and nature of one's interests are relevant here. Spirituality Some furs believe they have a spiritual connection to a particular animal which is typically their fursona, but also may be a totem. Strong spiritual believers may often say that they are an animal in a human body, and in fact may identify themselves as other kin, wares and or Therians, which are their own categories and not linked to furry fandom just by interest. Some join and find the furry fandom to be a place to be themselves, as most of their groups are underground and the furry fandom is more open to the world. However, not all Therians have their therotype as their persona. Art and Creativity Some furs may be interested only in the creative aspect of the furry fandom, furry content, both online and off, is easy to obtain and available in vast amounts. The furs produce new works regularly. Furry artwork is also done by many non-furries as well in targeting the fandom. Others may disassociate themselves from the fandom and refer to themselves as funny animal artists. Furries may also enjoy role-playing a particular furry character or persona, sometimes writing about this character or recording their online interactions for posterity. Fursuiting Some furries enjoy the practice of dressing up in a costume that is typically designed after a fursona. These fursuits are usually worn at conventions, and a few are even designed to accommodate sexual situations. Some furries opt to wear a partial suit, consisting of a head, tails, and paws, instead of a full fursuit. Others may just wear a tail or varied other pieces. While only a minority, about 15-20%, to 20 consider themselves fursuiters, they tend to be highly visible at events where many furries are present. And finally, sexuality. To some furs, the sexual attraction to anthropomorphic animals is part of what makes them furry. This is a topic of much controversy as it has been the subject of early media attention, such as that from the Wired magazine and Vanity Fair leading to its becoming a common stereotype of the furry community at large. This has spawned a few groups in response, such as the burned furs, with a desire to discourage this angle or create a clear distinction between these furries and the rest of the community." Unquote. Now, uh, the reason I went through the trouble of really going over every aspect of what furries are is because we're going to be seeing a lot of them across this iceberg, and in particular, that last a sexuality aspect of the fandom is going to be coming up a lot. So it's important to know the context. That being said, these days furries like most are pretty much everywhere, and many furry artists also find their home over at Fur Affinity, which I believe actually came about around 2005, which is kind of like a deviant art, but just specifically for furries. But all the same, furries are an important piece of this site's history and general community. Both the best of them and the worst of them. And on that topic, bonus entry, Sonic the Hedgehog art. Yet again, we'll be going into more specific individuals and communities in later tiers. But to say Sonic the Hedgehog art was popular on DA is, well, the understatement of a century. Everything from fan art, fan fiction, heated fandom wars, strange members, it became stories in of themselves that goes far beyond the depths of DA, and everything else that DeviantArt is. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Its very essence, so too, is Sonic the Hedgehog. And the same goes for our next entry, bonus entry, MLP art. Everything I just said about Sonic, you can nearly double it as far as My Little Pony fandom is concerned, though I don't know the exact statistics on that, that's just how it felt. I'll never forget when that show really started getting super popular and bronies were first coming about in full swing as a thing. Uh, that is to say, an adult man who enjoys the 
a My Little Pony show for those who are unfamiliar somehow. I used to go into the new deviations page on the site all the time, just so I could see all the new art. It was also kind of a fun way to meet new people, because you could see a lot of smaller artists through this that would be willing to talk with you and discuss art and fandom and all that sort of stuff. Well, during the time when MLP was really at its height, I distinctly remember the New Deviations page on that site. For a time, you could not refresh that page without seeing at least 5 to 10 new pieces of My Little Pony fan art. It was unprecedented. And while MLP is certainly something that may be more connected with 4chan and the general internet at large more so than it is specifically DeviantArt, I feel like it's at least very much worth a mention. Fetish art. So this one will be expanded upon in future entries, but it cannot be understated enough just how much fetish art is on DA. In fact, for many, DeviantArt is almost universally known as a site that has tons of fetish art, ranging from every imaginable direction, with the most common being Vor, pregnancy, inflation, and feet-related fetishes. Like I said, we'll be getting to the nitty-gritty of many of these fetishes of the site, and I suppose suss out why certain ones are so popular, but it's quite unavoidable. Hell, I even remember as a teen being a big fan of both Star Fox and Sonic the Hedgehog, I really enjoyed looking at all the art and fan fictions of my favorite characters, and I'm... Sure, you can also imagine my utter confusion when I kept noticing a very strange phenomenon where those same characters would be drawn with their feet fully exposed and detailed in a way that I could only describe as weird. Almost as if something in my brain was telling me that these feet were being gandered at for reasons I didn't quite fully understand yet. Oh, and I also wondered why so many pictures featured the characters either being cartoonishly fat, or being inflated with a bike pump. <laughs> yes, uh, you might say DA was a place where my innocence was quite quickly taken away from me. Comment down below if, uh, you can relate. YCH, shorthand version of Your Commission Here. Some artists offer a preset pose in which they'll draw your character in place of the, uh, well, preset pose. You might consider this kind of like using a base for a commission, though it was often one created by the artists themselves. Basically a template for commissions. I remember this being super popular among those who made custom DA avatar slash user icons, because you could make a basic base for a GIF for an icon where everyone in your DA family could have matching GIFs or pictures based on said base. Creative Commons License On November 16th, 2006, DeviantArt added the feature to be able to submit art under the Creative Commons License, allowing users to choose how their work can be used. This was a pretty big landmark part of the site's history, and played a significant role in DA becoming one of the largest art hosting platforms ever created. Holiday Art Events Holiday art event sounds pretty self-explanatory, what with October being a time when users may end up doing horror-related pieces, etc. However, on DA, these events can be related to more than just normal holidays. It can be instead holidays related to a fandom, like an anniversary of a game or a film franchise, the site's birthday itself, or, in some particularly interesting cases, events that can span an entire month long. You've probably heard of Inktober before, where the whole idea is to draw using, well, ink. But have you ever heard of Maternity May? The event where people with a pregnancy fetish draw a bunch of art related to, well, you know. Or how about Turntober, which is the same thing, but for the Vore fetish. Pretty intriguing stuff. Bonus Entry Forums So, one feature I don't often hear people talk about when discussing DA are its forums. I, however, believe that they were a concentrated center for all things good and bad about the site, with the community and all its weird corners coming out in full swing. Over the course of this iceberg, I'll be covering specific aspects 
and memories I have related to these forums, with some of them being very, very obscure and very dark indeed. But for now, I want to at least mention them, since again, they were something that I enjoyed lurking on and seeing all the conversations for back in the day. I still remember so many of the video game and film arguments people had, and I might have even posted a few things in there from time to time, but uh, we'll get to that later. Literature. As noted before, DA was also frequently used for written works as well, and in fact, many of the creepypastas we read on the Creepypasta Iceberg originated from DA, and not the Creepypasta Wiki. This meant DA was also a great place to read fanfiction, and I remember damn near every artist had at least one or two especially edgy poems about their feelings, the world, their life, etc. Including myself. <laughs> People even wrote full-fledged novels on this site, and would later have them published officially, which I think is pretty badass. I have a lot of good memories reading fanfiction on this site, as well as even a few original stories here and there, so it'll always be associated with that in my eyes. Flash games. Yes indeed, DeviantArt was also once the home of hundreds of Flash games, all of which, sadly enough, was made useless when Flash went defunct. Thousands of budding developers took to the art sharing site and made a variety of games, most of which were just stuff like dress-up games and little visual novel slash choose-your-own-adventure stuff, and occasionally mini-games. I remember quite a few of those make-your-own-Sonic the Hedgehog character templates being pretty popular back in the day. There are still some games that are functional to this day, however, but many are lost to the sands of time. Which, speaking of, removed features. As DA has become more streamlined and user-friendly, certain features have been changed or axed completely. Some for obvious reasons, with DA shifting more towards the business aspects of art and a lot less the social media aspect of the website, and others in an attempt to modernize the site. Some noteworthy features that were taken away include custom gallery folder icons, custom journal skins, which again were super popular to use back in the day, HTML and CSS coding, which again could be used to customize your page, the critique widget, which was a place where you could see all the pieces someone had officially critiqued on their page. Deviation and friends list manager. Daily page views and other statistics. Online and offline statuses on people's profiles. Friend birthday notices. The general message navigation tab. And much, much more. It should be noted that the majority of these things were changed in 2017 when DA was acquired by Wix.com Incorporated for $36 million and came with some major changes in order to integrate the sites together, such as DeviantArt slash DeviantArt brand change. Though a small change, all the branding for DeviantArt was once written with the word Deviant in all lowercase letters and the word Art in all capital letters. And for some odd reason, this was changed from its rather iconic branding to a more standard spelling. Also, the main icon and symbol of the site was changed from this to this, which, while again minor, many found to be a bad change and a sign of desperate moves to change the site from what many people loved to this more business-forward approach that it has now. Subscriptions. This was also another new feature added within the last few years. Subscriptions allow people to be able to create art that can only be viewed via a subscription to the artist. So basically it's kind of like a Patreon page, but done directly from within DeviantArt. This was a controversial new feature, as some enjoyed the way that it was before, when everything on the site could be seen for free, a truly endless gallery. On the other hand, this is an objective good as far as artists being able to be paid outside of commissions, and can be seen as another source of potential revenue for any freelancing artist. That being said, I don't know how many people actually use this feature on DeviantArt, since it is a far less popular site now than it was before. Uh, but we'll get to that momentarily. God, I wish that were me. Ah, now this is a classic. 
This is one of those super infamous images from the website that really got rather widespread. God, I wish that were me is a comment made by BigJB21 on October 16th of 2012. And this is the picture that this man commented upon and wished that he was in. <coughs> Uh, this piece was uploaded on January 15th of 2011 uh, by user Misson002. This piece features a small man being cradled like a baby by a larger woman, and Big JB21 really wishes that he was that small little man being cradled like a child. According to knowyourmeme.com, yes, I know, just shut up and listen to the quote. On April 7th of 2015, a screenshot of the 3D art and Big JB21's comment was submitted to r slash cringe anarchy, where it received more than 1,300 votes, 97% upvoted, and 60 comments prior to being archived. That day, a screenshot of Big JB21's DeviantArt page was also uploaded to Imgur, showcasing that he had a collection of diaper fetish art titled Diapered Kids. The image and accompanying comment would also make its way to 4chan, thus the comment, God, I wish that were me, became a popular reaction image to post under stuff." Unquote. Now, in case you're wondering, the artist who made this piece is a middle-aged woman who enjoys making 3D art, for their fetish of turning adults into babies and then having them be humiliated by being a breastfed, put into diapers, and bathed, etc. It's a... Uh, well, you know, I mean, there's lots of opinions one could have about such a such a thing, but if you were, you know, wondering what my opinion of it was, you know, what's the old Night Owl's thoughts on this, you know, I'd say it's fucking disgusting! And, uh, pretty weird, in my humble opinion. But, who am I to judge, I suppose? It would seem that they are still fairly active, and still, all these years later, making this exact same type of art. Whatever makes them happy, I suppose. As for Big JB21, well, sadly it seems his account has been deleted and scrubbed from the web as far as I was able to see. No doubt due to the trolling he surely receives from this newfound publicity. Though, there is a PLZ account with his avatar as a sort of strange memento of what was. Which, speaking of, bonus entry, PLZ or please accounts. So, here's a random bit of info that if you happen to use DeviantArt as a social media website back during the day, you're probably aware of, and everyone else, you've probably never ever heard of this. But there are actually hundreds, if not thousands, of what the community called PLZ accounts. You see, while DeviantArt had its own batch of emojis and even GIF emojis that you could use and the like, many hungered for, well, more. And that's when someone realized that when you at someone's account on DA, be it in a comment, a journal, in the forums, etc., their account profile picture would come up as a result. So what people would do is they started creating accounts with names like Smile PLZ or insert random character or emotion here please to use them purely as new emojis. The PLZ part being the part that you write in so that you can more easily identify which accounts are just specifically adding a useless emoji and which ones are an actual person. These things were really, really popular, and since you were allowed to have gifts as icons too, many of these allowed for thousands of new emojis on the site. Someone could even create an entire set all their own based around their own OC or whatever. And speaking of OCs, Sonic Recolors slash OCs. Like I said before, Sonic is connected deep into the roots of DA, and with it came a lot of fan art, in particular of OCs. Now, OCs legit just mean original character, and in many contexts, especially these days, an OC can just be a character that you made. But the only real reason this sort of redundant term came about was that of its original context. That being, OC was an original character you made from within a fandom. 
So in other words, you created an original character uh, based on, say, the Sonic franchise. Now, this does get a little wishy-washy, as I remember I always used to call these sorts of characters fan characters, as you're a fan of that franchise and made a character to fit in to that series. But I think many took it far more seriously than that, and thus the term OC became the de facto term for such a creation. Anyway, OCs, while not at all exclusive to Sonic, in fact, there are OCs for nearly every franchise you can imagine still being made to this very day, OCs became mainly associated with Sonic fandom uh, due to the sheer amount of Sonic OCs that existed and were constantly being created, including a rather infamous figure that we'll get to in a moment. For some time, it was a meme to search your name plus the hedgehog to see if an OC has been made, since many of these OCs were literally named stuff like Ryan the Hedgehog, Susie the Hedgehog, James, Frankie, hell, Dylan the Hedgehog, why not? In fact, why don't we look up and see what Dylan the Hedgehog looks like? Okay, so I looked up Dylan the Hedgehog on Google, and I... I really do not mean to demean or make fun of anyone here, okay? It's not my purpose, uh, but I am kind of flabbergasted by just how many random Dylan characters there are, including Dylan the Hedgehog, age 15, gender male, relationship, friend of Zack and Shakira, enemy of anti zack Powers going fast, likes girls, edges, geometry because of edges, <laughs> Linking Park, pizza, dislikes evil Sonic rainbows, bio, he's like Sonic but faster, he was created by Dr. Eggman in his secret Syrian base, he then became a good guy and almost cooled Eggman. Now, I'm gonna guess this is a... Uh, this is a parody here, okay? But some of these are definitely not. You got this orange, like, ascot wearing Sonic the Hedgehog character called Dylan the Hedgehog. We got this emo hedgehog called Dylan the Hedgehog. You know, yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that guy. He's pretty, he's a pretty good Dylan the Hedgehog. We got Shadow the Hedgehog, but blue, right? Uh, and green eyes, can't forget the green eyes, and this is also Dylan the Hedgehog. We got, uh, we got, like, uh, 80s hair metal band Dylan the Hedgehog, you know? He's, uh, he's, he's got something going on. We got this Dylan the Hedgehog, which is, like, this echidna hedgehog, silver boot-wearing guy. I, I like this Dylan the Hedgehog. This is, like, a peak Dylan the Hedgehog, I must say. Very, very cool. Uh, we got Dylan the Hedgehog, which is, uh, you know, you, yeah, that's a pretty interesting Dylan the Hedgehog. Honestly, I could probably go on for quite some time, as there's, there's a lot of Dylan the Hedgehogs, as it turns out. Uh, but among these, something I was not actually aware of, which I figured I might as well point out, is there actually is an official Dylan the Porcupine from the Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics, which is, that's, uh... You know, I didn't know about that. That's pretty cool. So there you go. I may not have made the cut to be a hedgehog officially, but Porcupine, I've got it covered. I've got some representation right there. So, uh, pretty cool. But at any rate, the most common trait among these OCs was that they are often blatant recolors of canon characters, which became a really big aspect of uh, what they were mocked for, essentially. In addition to their often over-the-top and dark backstories, being the brother or sister of Shadow or Sonic or something like that, and they were almost always created by Dr. Robotnik through one means or another. Though, in the end, it is all rather harmless fun, mostly done by kids and young teens at that. It is still rather amusing just how many of these exist, and continue to be created to this very day, of course. And yes, some of these certainly have more effort and skill put into them than others, but there always has been something rather charming about this whole practice of creating a fan character for a, a series that you really enjoy. It's like, it's like peak enjoyment. It's when you like something so much, you just have to create some kind of thing to be a part of it. These characters are also almost always self-inserts through some means or another as well. But like I said, it's harmless fun and 
Though it certainly can be a bit, uh, cringy from time to time, it is overall something that I quite enjoy looking into. Which brings us to our next subject, and without a doubt, the most infamous and smelly part of this entrance. Christian. If you know, you know. And you knew this individual was going to show up eventually on this iceberg. So we might as well cover it now. For those who have lived under a rock and clicked on this video yet still don't know who Chris Chan is, well, Christian Weston Chandler, but now going by Christine, aka Chris Chan, is quite possibly the most well-documented person on the internet with entire wikis dedicated to them countless video essays, and an ongoing 60-plus part documentary series by YouTuber Gino Samuel. Which, if you want to have an unbiased and crystal clear look at Chris's story and why so many are interested in this individual, as well as what they did to get so much attention over the years, then I highly recommend Gino's series. That being said, Chris Chan only had a brief presence on DeviantArt before being banned for and numerous community violations, which we might as well go into detail about now. According to the CWC Wiki, which is the main hub where everything related to Chris Chan's life is meticulously documented, the page entitled DeviantArt notes, quote, DeviantArt is a large online art community where artists can host their artwork and receive comments and critique from fellow artists and art appreciators. Being one of the most popular amateur art websites in the world, DeviantArt attracts the best and the worst of us. Especially the worst. In the trolling world, DeviantArt is notorious as a den for sonic recolors and poorly drawn panorals. So it's no surprise that Chris became a member." Unquote. It then goes on to note the three accounts Chris had on the site and why they each got banned at the time. Of note is that Chris Chan was actually one of the very early adopters of the site. Quote, Sonichu, established 28th of 2005 and banned in early September of 2008, presumably for the Thyrconok artwork. Sonichu site, established the 19th of September of 2008, permaban for a kind of nebulously defined failure, like the blatant Thyrconok from Sonichu number 7. In his next account's journal, Chris said he had no idea why he was banned. Reading comprehension is apparently not part of the most prestigious reaches of the American education. CWCpedia. Used while this CWCpedia was down, the account was open on the 9th of August 2009 and closed on the 28th for evasion of the previous ban and posting erotic artwork featuring underage characters. Which is to say, Rose Chu's washing machine pick from episode 20. It was actually deleted before the account was banned completely." Unquote. Now, for better context, Chris Chan is pretty well known for their fan comic series entitled Sonichu, where Sonic the Hedgehog and a Pikachu merge to become a new, ORIGINAL character. And while this is a rabbit hole perhaps save for a different time, of note is the comic's crude and badly done artwork. Chris Chan inserting themselves into the story, with entire issues and parts being a rather interesting look into their bizarre psyche, and their at the time love quest to find a boyfriend free girl, their hatred for trolls, as well as their general biases, etc. Of note of these biases is Chris Chan's then hatred of gay people which reflected in both the comic as well as their YouTube channel and other pages. Now, goading Chris into doing something stupid is, frankly, a little too easy, some may say. But certainly back in the day, one of the easiest ways to get Chris angry was by simply implying that they were gay, and that their original characters, the Sonichus, are also gay. So, in an attempt to prove that they weren't gay, and to assuage trolls from drawing their character having gay relations, Chris would draw hetero of both themselves and their characters on various occasions. Thus, the bands from DeviantArt. Finally of note is two greetings messages collected via the Wayback Machine from Chris's profiles. The first being what one would find if they stumbled upon their second account, Sonichu site. 
Quote, Mood Joy, listening to Light Rock Z95.1, reading my comics as I draw them, or feeling nostalgic, watching Sonic the Hedgehog, Family Guy, anime, etc., playing Guitar Hero and Sonic on PlayStation 3, eating healthy choice TV entrees, drinking Pepsi Cola, similar formula found in CWC Cola. Greetings, my loyal Sonichu and Rose Chu fans. Christian Weston Chandler is the official owner of this page, and I am here to tell you the news of this page. The main reason I am uploading the Sonichu and Rose Chu fan art more than my original and official stuff is because this deviant art account is to be the official. Sonichu and Rose Chu fan art section of Sonichu.net. I am thinking of backing up my comic book pages as well as more original art on here in the future. But for now, this is basically for fan art, so enjoy the other people's work I have been mostly delighted to find and have received. Just a reminder that if you'd like to offer a submission to the fan art section, of your own, you may create your own DeviantArt account and upload it, or them, or you may email me your fan art at chrischansonichu at aol.com. Peace to all my loyal Sonichu and Rose Chu fans, Christian Weston Chandler." Unquote. And the second being what one would be greeted with upon the third and last page of the CWCpedia. Quote, I am Christian Weston Chandler, born on February 24th, 1982, as Christopher, then changed my first name in 1989. I am the true, original creator of Sonichu and Roshu, the Electric Hedgehog Pokemon. I created him on March 17th of 2000, with my copyrights on every image, as well as full comic books except no substitute. I had an array of CWC sites before, CWC's PokeSite 2, El PokeSite DRWC, and most importantly, the original Sonichu site known as CWC's Sonichu site, which was a spin-off of CWC's PokeSite 2. I had to take the websites down June 2009 because my internet bullies slash trolls hacked into my webmaster accounts. But I am back in the saddle of CWCpedia, the new official CWC's Sonichu and Roshu site link. I will be putting up a sampling of the original Sonichu and Roshu drawings from myself onto this account. But I have opened this new account up because my past Sonichu site account was permanently banned. I forgot why. This account will mainly be used to get in touch with choice fan artists." Unquote. The final thing of note, DA related to Chris, is the Sonichu fan club, which Chris deemed as an official sanctioned Sonichu DA community. This group can still be accessed and looked at to this very day, though it seems to have gone inactive around 2015. The group's info page notes, quote, We are a fan club of CWC's Sonichu, TM, we're like a typical fan club of any popular cartoon slash anime series. The chat room is mostly used for RPs, and we mainly gather good fan art from DA and collaborate with fans. We are fairly new too, so we encourage more new members right now. No trolls, please. Unquote. Like I said, Chris Chan is a well-known and interesting internet figure, to put it plainly. But as far as DA is concerned, this is about as far as it goes. Still, Chris Chan, much like Sonic the Hedgehog himself, is tied to the site's identity and history. And it's worth noting before we eventually dive into the more obscure locales and generally interesting internet figures that came from the site. Eclipse. Eclipse is the name for the major UI change from this to this, and sort of everything that changed with it, including taking features away, adding some new features, and in general being a massively unpopular change by the community at large. Now last I checked, there was ways you could still utilize the old UI and setup of the website, but it seems this was one of the deciding factors for many to leave the website 
along with various other controversial changes. In addition to the final two entries of this tier, dying popularity. It's no secret that DeviantArt is not the site it once was as far as a popularity is concerned. In fact, many would say that it's just straight up dying, and at a fast rate no less. There's a lot of factors that go into this fate, such as the general mismanagement from the top, lackluster updates, failure to follow current trends, and the community seeking better opportunities in other platforms. That last one in particular is noteworthy, as many artists have gone everywhere from Tumblr, to Instagram, to Twitter, and beyond for sharing their art. There was a perception for a long time that if you were an artist on the internet, DeviantArt was the place that you had an account. These days, while you may see someone with a DeviantArt account, it's not their main hub for their art anymore. After all, if you want your art to be seen, it doesn't do much good to post it to a dying website, now does it? Of course, many would also point to DeviantArt's general reputation as one of the reasons why many artists may have been apprehensive from posting there. But honestly, I do think that this is a bit of a cop-out. I think there are plenty of places that have some of the absolute most fiendish, devious shit posted to it on a daily basis, and no one really bats an eye or even cares at this point anymore. No, rather, it's DeviantArt's mismanagement and refusal to actually change in a way that its community enjoys that is the biggest problem. And again, in addition to just not being able to follow any of the trends or evolve the site in any kind of meaningful way. Besides a random shitty new UI change, of course, which all that did was upset people and change what was once a perhaps nostalgic look for many in exchange for no real new features outside of like subscriptions and the like. That being said, there are still some dedicated communities on the site and even if it is, as a whole, a shell of what it once was, it's still not dead yet. You never know, crazier things have happened, maybe they can turn things around. Or maybe not, who knows. Lack of archive. What makes this all the worse, and particularly sad in some cases when documenting the history and the like of this site, is DA is horrendous when it comes to preservation. Quite infamously, the site lacks any form of an archive, meaning if a piece is deleted or a user's page is banned, anything and everything they posted is gone forever. Even using the Wayback Machine yields little to no results, which I suppose on one hand allows those who wanted to leave the site and their history behind for good with a clean break, but on the other hand, internet storytellers like myself are kind of shit out of luck. But all the same, that means a lot of internet history, some really crazy and interesting pieces at that, are pretty much lost to time, for better or worse. Though a weird exception to this is if you're a user that favorited a piece of art from a user that got banned or shut their account down, you can still view the art from that person's favorites. Or if you have a direct link to said art, it can be also viewed as well. Which is kind of bizarre. I would have assumed it was all deleted, but these still being viewable through these means suggest that it could be archived in a kind of limbo space that can only be accessed but very limitedly. Quite peculiar, to be sure. Ah, now that we're past the entrance and all introductions are out of the way, I believe it's now time we take a gander through the main gallery, the main corridor, see what pieces await us. We have lots of art to see, artists to learn about, and stories to tell, starting with one of the more popular exhibitions of this fine, if not a uh, peculiar establishment. Mary Sue's slash Anti Sue's. Talk about a can of worms to start with. Mary Sue's slash Anti Sue's aren't exclusive to DeviantArt, but when someone thinks Mary Sue, 
odds are DeviantArt is one of the first places that comes to mind, alongside maybe fanfiction.net or Tumblr, of course. Now, if you were to quickly look up what the hell Mary Sue means, Wikipedia would tell you, quote, A Mary Sue is a character archetype in fiction, usually a young woman, who is often portrayed as explicitly competent across all domains, gifted with unique talents or powers, liked or respected by most other characters, unrealistically free of weakness, extremely attractive, innately virtuous, and or generally lacking meaningful character flaws. A Mary Sue is often an author's idealized self-insertion and may serve as a form of wish fulfillment." Unquote. Now, the character can also be a male, mind you, and they are often referred to as Gary Stews in those cases. The actual term itself dates back to the Star Trek fandom of the 70s, in which a writer named Paula Smith became very frustrated at the sheer volume of girls who sent in letters saying that they wanted to date Captain Kirk and be part of the Starship Enterprise to the point she officially published a parody article featuring a character named Mary Sue, a good-at-everything girl who falls madly in love with Captain Kirk and saves the day. From here, in the fanfiction world, Mary Sues are often the product of a younger author's wanting to insert themselves into a story, usually to be the perfect love interest of whatever character they have the hots for. This is innocent enough, even if it is rather silly and can be rather cringy, especially when mixed with fetishes and the like, but there is still a kind of charm to it as well. Though, from a literary perspective, this idea does extend far beyond fanfiction and on into original works, though in the right hands, even a character that is kind of like a Mary Sue or Gary Stu can certainly be well written and be very interesting to watch or read. I think the key to writing them well is even if they are exceptionally good at an exceptional amount of things, they still need to be able to lose once in a while, to struggle and or have an equal in their villain that is exceptionally good or even better at those things than they are. If they are good at like literally everything and they never struggle and they always win all the time, you get a character like that of Rey from the new Star Wars trilogy, where she is consistently good at everything she does or touches and never really struggles or loses at all, and it just makes for a less engaging experience when there is no real struggle, flaw, or thing that the character cannot do. Now, all that being said, Mary Sue's in the context of DeviantArt is very similar, but more often than not refers to an OC with an often very overly complex design, an absurd list of powers, and seemingly every positive trait under the sun. Anyone who has been a part of major DeviantArt fandoms like MLP, Sonic the Hedgehog, Warrior Cats, etc. is sure to have seen a fair few Mary Sue OCs in their time on the web. Ask for Anti-Sues, well, I suppose the name kind of gives it away. Anti-Sues are essentially the same thing, but in the exact opposite end. So, instead of being an OP relative of a canon character who everyone loves, they're a depressed, edgy plank of wood everyone hates. I think there is a lesson here, in that working in extremes is often not the play, unless you're really good at writing that type of character and making them interesting or lovable anyway. After all, extremes can work exceptionally well if there is another extreme to a balance it out a little bit in the story. But again, nothing wrong with Mary Sue's, or let's just call it for what it is, badly written characters. Everyone has to start somewhere, and sometimes that over-the-top extremeness of these characters or stories has an interesting appeal, if only for being so outlandishly out there. Plus, they can kind of go hard every once in a while. I think if anything, the internet has really taught us that almost everyone's first type of character that they create in their head if they're a creative type is most likely a Mary Sue or Gary Stew of some kind. Because often when people first begin to create things and create characters, they're not thinking about how can they make this character more complex and full of depth and all this other sorts of stuff. 
they're thinking about how cool can they possibly make this character. Like, they're gonna make the coolest character of all time. But at any rate, YouTuber Izzy also made a video discussing this topic as well, with lots of examples of Mary Sue's and the many variations of this type of character, which I highly recommend you go give a watch if you want more info on this topic. Princess Neon Boom. And speaking of Mary Sue's, Princess Neon Boom is probably one of the most infamous. Made by DA user Nekomelo, Neon Boom was sort of a breaking point for a lot of people when it came to OCs that were deemed Mary Sue's. So what exactly is her story and why is she so infamous? Well, uh, I'll be honest, I don't really know. I guess it's her design, the pure black coloring, the neon color highlights, the knee-high converse with matching colors, the edgy design in general. She just sort of fit the perfect archetype for not only the typical MLP Mary Sue, but the exact same type of design language that you could see in many Mary Sues and other fandoms as well. She would often be shared around websites in the MLP fandom to mock and laugh at, for these reasons, and so she sort of gained infamy through this. All that being said, while yes, the design is rather cliche, I don't nor have I ever really thought there was anything wrong with this type of character design. I mean, it is very busy, but it's not as if she's being animated or something. I think this type of character can look quite nice. I suppose it all comes down to Aesthetic preferences, though, of course. But I've certainly seen OCs with much less appealing designs than this one. The creator of this OC, Nekomelo, is still very active to this day, by the way. It makes some pretty cool art, like this super cool Alucard, My Little Pony, Sona thing. And no design has ever gone harder than Alucard's fit. Izzy I've brought her up a few times already, but it's worth noting her here since she has made many videos about or tangentially related to DeviantArt. Izzy is a New Zealand-based YouTuber with a pretty massive following. Her content covers internet culture, mainly with DeviantArt being a very common subject for her, of vids, uh, be it fandom-related or old Flash games or even infamous users. I've not seen all of her content, but generally speaking from the stuff that I have seen, I think that she makes some pretty quality, interesting videos, and dives into deep rabbit holes that, while I've never really heard of most of the time, except like the general stuff like Mary Susan, what have you, but even the ones I'm not familiar with, I usually always find myself extremely fascinated by, and feel like I genuinely learn something new, which I always appreciate. P.K. Russell Speaking of YouTubers often associated and connected to DeviantArt, P.K. Russell, real name Parker Russell, is a rather controversial YouTuber in the DA ranting community, with much of his content highlighting wacky or bizarre art found on DA, and covering drama from both DeviantArt and the ranting community at large. He also did these animation meme reviews which are sort of semi-related to DA. See, animation memes are where people will take a quick snippet of a song or clip from something and do a basic animation to it, usually with their OC, to match the meme and beat of the song. They vary a lot in quality as you might expect, and PK Russell reviewed quite a few of these, typically highlighting the most cringe or more amateurish works, which yes, did mean he was mostly shitting on random teens and children trying to animate something without much knowledge over how to do any of it. Now, I'll be frank, I've never really been much of a fan of P.K. Russell personally. I think I've seen two or three of his videos across my time on YouTube, uh, mostly because I remember them being kind of boring, as I thought his commentary was super basic and not very insightful or funny or entertaining or worthwhile listening to in the slightest. Harsh words, I know, but I must be honest. However, putting that aside, P.K. Russell has managed to get himself into a ton of infamy, with a lot of it coming from just the type of content that he made. Again, that being targeting younger creators and putting them on blast, mainly just to mock or bully them. I guess you might say that he picked easy targets, and while he sometimes pretended it was all under the guise of criticisms towards these works, 
it was mostly just a guy making fun of kids' drawings and animations at the end of the day, which many have criticized him for, including other YouTubers. He also pissed off the fanbase of Hasbun Hotel, one of the animated series by creator Vivzipop, when he reviewed the pilot episode back when it first came out, and beyond being generally harsh to the show, he also took several clips of the show out of context and seemed to lack general media literacy when it came to the plot, the characters, what was going on, etc. When people pointed this out to him and criticized him, he would then respond to this, which would only get him into more hot water, as he often responded to criticisms by acting like a victim, and generally didn't take to it very well. Which, considering the type of content that he made, really started to paint a picture of the guy. P.K. Russell, the man who can dish it out, but can't take it. Another recent scandal with P.K. is that he posted a photo to his Twitter where he exposed his bare ass to his audience of mostly minors, because someone on Discord dared him to. Not the best look or a uh, best sense of judgment on this man's part, clearly. Since then, though, his content seemed to have kind of petered out, with less views, and eventually he stopped uploading and hasn't uploaded any new videos for an entire year by now. I don't really know what he's doing now, but moving on. RPG Monger. While not exclusively attached to DA, RPG Monger has covered a wide variety of topics from DeviantArt, be them fandoms, infamous users, or just the history of a fandom in general. I actually do remember watching a fair bit of this guy's content back in the day, when he was actively making these types of videos in his series titled The Fandom Files. However, since then, RPG Monger has been creating video game review and analysis type content for the last several years, which from what I've seen, seem like they're pretty good. I'm not sure why he eventually stopped making the other type of content, uh, maybe he just got bored or ran out of topics to cover, or maybe he wanted to step away from that type of content, or maybe he was just more passionate about game analysis, or maybe it's just a combination of all these things. But nonetheless, RPG Monger is remembered as an important YouTube figure for the general DeviantArt space, lick icons. Stepping away from DA-related YouTubers for a bit, Lick icons are animated GIF icons that look like this, typically of a cat or feline character licking the screen and, as weird as it is to say, are about as important to the history of DA as fella or llamas. These things were absolutely everywhere, and the GIF itself has its origins with user Bakamichi from back in 2010, who posted a series of stills that, when put together, create this iconic GIF set. I remember there being hundreds, more like thousands actually, of users, please accounts, and custom sets of this exact GIF being used near everywhere on the site. Character Age Meme an art meme almost as old as DA itself, the character age meme can be traced back to artist Amber Neely in 2009 to a piece simply called New Art Meme. The premise is to just take any character, OC or not, and show them aging from child to adult. It's simple, but it was a definite hit given the sheer volume you could see on DA and other art sharing sites. I remember most people who had an OC on DeviantArt were very likely to do this meme. It's a very nice way of seeing a character's progression. You get a peek into their past, or perhaps their future, or maybe even forces the creator of said OC to ponder upon the past or future of these characters, and what they look like, and why. Making it a Fun creative exercise overall. Bad art blogs. As you can imagine, with many groups and users and even YouTubers talking about the cringe or bad art of the site, bad art blogs are basically the exact same thing, but in the form of a blog. Many of these blogs were on Tumblr, mind you, but they would almost always be connected with DeviantArt since they were talking about art they deemed bad, trashy, cringe, or otherwise, from any site that they could possibly take from, DA being a prime candidate, of course. Now, when I tried looking for examples of these bad art blogs, I came up a bit short, as I think a lot of them were either taken down or 
were just more popular quite a few years back. But of the examples I did find, I found this one called Nicolas Cage, This is a Bad Art Blog, which also goes by the name of What the Fuck DeviantArt Ripoff, which What the Fuck DeviantArt was a rather popular bad art blog also on Tumblr that seems to have been purged from the internet completely, and I think it might have been one of the most popular of its time. As for this Nick Cage one, it seemed like it was pretty active all through 2015, but eventually stopped, with their last post being an answer by a user, Abby Lightwood, who asked them on December 8th of 2017 what the deal of this whole blog is about, like, you know, what, why'd they do this, What's, why, why would you make a blog dedicated to terrible art, who inspired you to do it, and also if they think it's worthwhile giving credit to the artists or not. And basically, the guy answered back that he did this whole blog because he was 16 at the time, it seemed like it was a good idea, he was inspired by others, but eventually just kind of got lazy and bored of it. Project Comment On the other side of the spectrum, Project Comment is a large community built to help smaller artists gain traction and exposure that is still active to this very day. On the group's welcome page, the rules for how to use this group goes as follows. Quote, Give constructive criticism on deviations in these folders. Give one comment of 200 plus words, get one comment in return. Give one comment of 300 plus words, get one comment in return. Give one comment of 200 plus words, get two comments in return, etc, etc, unquote. This reminds me a lot of fanfiction.net and fiction presses forum review games, where you would read a chapter of someone else's story, give a detailed review of that chapter, and in exchange, someone else will review a chapter from your thing. It's a means of getting exposure, giving fair criticism, and spreading some goodwill towards other artists and authors, since many can go months without ever having others see, let alone comment on their work. Overall, pretty wholesome. Muro. Muro is another sister site to DA that acts as a free art slash editing program. It's a very bare bones and almost laughable how basic it is. Still, I do remember many artists tried challenging themselves by drawing complex sketches or paintings, using this to flex their skills. Copyright infringement scandals. Numerous DMCAs and copyright infringement scandals have hit DA, with there being far too many to name. Though a recent one worth mentioning is in January of 2023, three artists, Sarah Anderson, Kelly McCarran, and Kara Oritz, filed a copyright infringement lawsuit against Stability AI, Midjourney, and DeviantArt, claiming that these companies have infringed the rights of millions of artists by training AI tools on 5 billion images scraped from the web without the consent of the original artists. Where this lawsuit will go, I really cannot say, but it's the most current legal controversy DA finds themselves in at the moment. But while we're on that topic, AI art controversy. The site recently, as of November of 2022, implemented a new feature called DreamUp, an AI that randomly generates art based on text prompts. Now this has people upset for quite a few reasons. The first is art theft, since the way that these AI art generators work is they need a source. They can't just make an art style out of nothing after all. There needs to be a reference for the AI to pull from. Thus, in order for this to work, thousands if not millions of users' artwork is being fed into a database for the AI to take from, which obviously many do not like and see it as art theft, since nearly no one agreed to their art being used in this fashion. Artists can opt out of being used in this data pool, of course, but at no point did DA state, nor do they even state how you can opt out. In fact, you have to use a third-party site for the chance to be approved to opt out. So you could very well be denied to opt out and thus have your art used without your consent, which is pretty shitty. And honestly, I feel like it would be so much easier and there'd be so much less controversy if the feature was simply there to be able to opt in or out at the very beginning before a, a piece is fully uploaded to the site. 
This alone has made many hightail it off the website, delete their pages, and go to other social media platforms. NFT controversy. And while we're on the topic of controversies, recently DA has gotten into a lot of hot water over various artists' work being stolen and sold as NFTs. Mind you, this happens everywhere and is kind of an issue with people stealing more than it is anything else. Mind you, I'm not about to talk about NFTs here in this video series for any extended period of time. But needless to say, NFTs have been rather controversial as a topic among artists in general, particularly those on Twitter to say the least. X Grab My Y. X Grab My Y is an exploitable comic originally made by DA user Angela Art in 2009, with it quickly being applied to various fandoms and scenarios due to the versatility of the comic. The original version had the line go, Angie Grab My Boobs, and then the duo went flying off accompanied by the word adventure as seen here. It's a relic of the 2010s and anyone involved in fandom is sure to tell you all about seeing this comic and its millions of variations. Inflation. Ah, it seems like it's time for our first deep dive into an art fetish. Be they belly, boobs, butt, etc. Inflation is a fetish that involves inflating of the entire body or a single body part. Many argue that the fetish is a byproduct of our evolutionary reaction to larger butts and the alike. However, there is also many that seem to enjoy the idea of inflation because it's kind of a fat fetish light. Uh, that is to say, a character can inflate to cartoonish sizes. Uh, but then deflate back to normal after. There's also a hell of a lot of people that love seeing a bike pump inserted into one's mouth or other places, and then inflated like a balloon. This being quite the popular scenario in this fetish. Now, the funny thing is about fetishes like these is you always have to ask yourself if it's always been a thing, or if there was some kind of catalyst for it at some point in time. While I think it's impossible to pinpoint an exact origin point for most people's fetishes, especially since most people's first exposure to said fetishes will just simply be the fetish art of these fetishes these days to begin with. One must ask though, before these fetish artists existed, how would someone with this fetish exist? Or how would they even know that they're into that? Is here where we have to turn to popular culture and you'll soon find some interesting connections. And for this fetish, there seems to be two main connections. The first being cartoons. Within cartoons, there are many times where a character will inflate and deflate like a balloon, usually for comedic effect. However, this second source actually comes from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with the character Violet, where she swells up like an anthropomorphic blueberry after eating an experimental chewing gum consisting of a three-course meal, which was tomato soup, roast beef and basic potato, and blueberry pie with ice cream. And sure enough, you will find many, many examples of this exact scenario playing out in inflation fetish art, which is pretty telling to where the idea might have first came into their head. Anyway, while this fetish has been around for a bit, I'd say DA was a prime spot for finding loads of art of this variety. And no matter what fanbase you were a part of, you were bound to see art of one of your favorite characters expanded into a balloon-like shape. Saburo X. Active on both Twitter and DeviantArt, Saburo is one of the most well-known artists doing hyperpreg or pregnancy that far exceeds the limits of a normal pregnancy, which you can see here. I suppose it goes without saying, but inflation, pregnancy, hyperpregnancy, and fat fetishes have a fair bit of crossover since, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just another premise for why someone is growing larger and more round in shape. Their clothes not fitting as, uh, well as they did before, etc. Even if there are some specific kink-related differences, I, I suppose. There are some flavors of vor that are also connected with this as well, but uh, 
we'll get to that in a bit. April Fool's Events Many site-wide pranks have occurred come April Fool's. A be they art-themed events, a site quirk, or even changed layouts. DA has made this a tradition and you just really never know what they're going to do each year. I remember one year in particular involved them changing everyone's icons to Twilight characters, which at the time freaked me out since I thought my account was hacked at first. I also remember I had this dumb hipster friend who hated everything popular, which meant he hated Twilight, and regardless of your feelings on Twilight, he hated it so much that he decided to make it half of his personality. Looking back, I think I was only ever friends with him because he also liked Star Fox. But anyway, you can imagine he wasn't, uh, very happy that his icon was changed to Edward Cullen. And I kid you not, he made 10 different detailed journal rants about how fucking mad he was at this April Fool's joke before the day was done. That he felt violated and that for a website about creativity that they are taking away his creative identity as a hipster by making him adorn the face of Edward Cullen. And then after the whole thing was over, he decided to talk about it for like the next two weeks. Anyway, DA has been doing this for years and it's always something to look forward to if you're a uh, consistent member. Bases versus Pixel Dolls. I mentioned bases and the like in the last year, but it's worth bringing up that bases and Pixel Dolls have two very dedicated fan bases and are often at war with one another and accuse the other of being illegitimate or even a form of art theft. But at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of people getting upset over who truly is the best or most legitimate at drawing hairless naked anime characters. So, uh, moving on. OC, do not steal. Now a meme, it was once commonplace to put do not steal when posting drawings of one's OC, usually in the description of the piece. While sometimes used literally to discourage fellow artists from stealing an artist's original character idea, these days if you see this on OC art, it is often used ironically to caption a picture of a character either obviously copied directly from an existing piece of pop culture or so sloppily rendered that no one would want to steal to begin with. Or maybe it is used on an actual effort OC, but it's just there because it's such a popular line to use and it's thus still ironic. Art tracing. Tracing is used to transfer an image into line work from photo or artwork. Basically you take a photo or a sketch or whatever and you place your tracing paper over it and draw the lines that you can see. It's one of those art industry things and often when people draw something uh, be it digitally or traditionally. They will start out with a sketch before then inking it in by tracing over the sketch with cleaner lines. However, art tracing when we're talking about deviant art and general art discussion is more often than not referring to the practice of someone else tracing someone else's art in an attempt to claim it as their own. This is almost always eventually found out though, and generally art tracers are massively dunked on for effectively stealing another person's art and not using their own skills to draw that cool pose or angle. Though do note that this is different from using someone's art as a reference or possible inspiration. And there are many people out there, including people who make bases, but also people who take photos of themselves or whatever, that are meant to be used as a starting point, be that for tracing, for sketching out basic shapes, or just as a reference for your own drawing. But art tracers and people who are called art tracers are usually people that take a finished piece of art and trace over it. Adoptables slash OCs for sale. The concept of selling OCs to others started on DeviantArt, with the general idea being someone designs a character and you pay for ownership and thus you're able to draw that character. Of course, I suppose that wouldn't stop someone from stealing someone's design for an OC rather than pay for it, but generally speaking, if you're deep enough into OCs and DA culture of this kind and even consider buying an OC, 
Yeah, you'll probably just buy it, I guess. This was usually done through DA points, since eh, this is more of a younger user thing than it was an adult thing. Guri-chan. Thailand-based artist Guri is one of the more big and notable artists on DA, having well over 4,000 followers, which is quite a lot on DeviantArt, mind you, and millions of views on her art with fans around the world. Her art is very colorful and full of pop, and all her paintings are absolutely stunning. For me, it almost gives me this strange sense of nostalgia. I particularly like this piece entitled Dark Angel Lilith, as well as this one entitled Zelbani Protector Tima. Sadly though, fans were utterly heartbroken upon her death in 2015, and many to this day visit the page to pay their respects to an amazingly talented artist taken too soon from this world. Rest in peace. I Hate DeviantArt from YouTuber I Hate Everything. I Hate Everything is a New Zealand-born English commentary YouTuber known for his rants on social media, movies, games, memes, and other such topics. He is best known for his I Hate series where he mingles hyperbole with his own thoughts to deliver comedic social commentary. He's been around for a while and as a YouTuber is quite influential, in fact far more than I think most people even give him credit for. All that being said though, his I Hate series was quite controversial as many missed out on the whole hyperbole part of the series. And regardless, a video entitled I Hate Insert a Thing is bound to get some negative attention, especially from those that will never even watch it and will see the title and just go and bitch about it in the comments and give it a dislike. And by far one of his most infamous of the series was I Hate DeviantArt, which was met with almost immediate backlash with people completely missing the joke of him playing a character and thinking he's being dead ass for real for real serious. Many responded negatively, saying that he was bullying young artists, and others said that he was just making fun of people for no reason, despite the fact that much of his criticism was actually pointed at delusional slash pretentious artists more than anyone else. In a follow-up, he showed that user Minor Light took such offense to the video and being featured within it, albeit for a very small segment, that they ended up deleting their account. I Hate Everything would then release another more updated version in 2018, and even did a reading of a particularly bad fanfic on DA called Hope. Overall, this is just one drop in the bucket in the sea of videos critiquing, uh, slash poking fun, slash mocking DA and its user base, but a popular one nonetheless. Ed's World. Ed's World is an animated series by British cartoonist slash web personality Ed Gold. According to Wikipedia, the series is about, quote, the misadventures of a group of young adults, or morons, living together in a house somewhere in the United Kingdom. Ed is an artist obsessed with Coca-Cola, Tom, a jaded nihilist who lacks eyeballs, Matt, a dim-witted narcissist, and prior to his departure, Tord, a trigger-happy Norwegian addicted to hentai. The series is generally episodic and typically has little continuity between episodes." Unquote. Ed's world is quite popular and very influential. And as far as its connection to DA goes, an official DeviantArt page would be started by the crew to post general behind the scenes stuff and small comics set within the Ed's World universe. Sadly though, Ed Gold himself would pass away from infection following complications from cancer and many took to the DA page to mourn his death with many still visiting to this day. Rest in peace. Beagle soon. Not as active nowadays, many Zelda and Earthbound fans will know her by name, having numerous pieces showing T-Link, that is Tetra X Link. Wind Waker fans are sure to be familiar with her art and how prolific her work was in the scene. Actually, while we're on the topic, it might be worth mentioning that on DA, especially back in the early days, no matter what fandom you were a part of, there was bound to be a few artists that were the most popular, made the most amount of art, or played into a specific niche, fandom, character pairing, or otherwise. And I even remember certain fandoms being much more small, or at least the artists for said fan base being much more few and far between. And thus, those who were drawing art in these fandoms became very important, and in some cases influential enough that their art styles would become connected with the franchise itself. And anyone else creating fan art for said franchise 
may take inspiration from their art style. These days I feel like it's so much more rare to find something that is truly, truly obscure that only a few artists control the entire scene, but it still can happen I suppose. But back in the day, it happened a fair bit actually. Corks slash barely human. So the creator of this iceberg, Nora, wanted to shout out a smaller DA slash Tumblr user who they're a big fan of. Forks, real name Ash, is the creator of a novel by the name of Barely Human. Barely Human follows Lot, a stand-in for humanity, and tells a story of class and the complexity of life, along with overlapping themes of racism, sexuality, religion, etc. Oh, and vampires, of course. Vampirism in Barely Human functions more like a virus than an actual paranormal force. Although magic does exist in-universe, vampires fall into what are called regional strains. And that's just the surface of the absolutely massive world Forks has crafted. I did take the opportunity to read through some of Barely Human myself, though I wasn't able to read through it all in this time since, uh, you know, I, I don't want to delay this iceberg series for too, too long. But from the parts that I've read, it seems like quite a well-written and interesting story, and from what I've been told is full of complex characters with individual arcs. Barely Human as a whole currently has two books, a near endless amount of art of the characters and plenty of lore from Horks themselves, and Nora highly recommends giving the books and Horks Tumblr page a read. Archie Sonic Communities The Sonic fanbase is one that is actually made up of like 300 smaller fandoms slash communities all engaging with one another with tons of crossover as well as clear divided lines. This is true of many fandoms mind you, but Sonic is quite a lot more diverse than most I'd say. One of these communities of fans are that of the Archie Sonic comic enjoyers. Now, Archie Sonic comic fans are also very much connected with the Sonic Sat AM cartoon fandom, as they both feature the freedom fighters like that of Sally Acorn and Bunny Rabbit. These are actually some of the most dedicated and oldest fans of the Sonic fandom, since many of them originate from the 90s, and many of the most important, well-kept, and popular Sonic-related fan sites on the earliest spaces of the internet belong to these factions of the Sonic fandom. All that to say, the Archie slash SatAM Sonic community was very big and popular on DA, with oodles of fan art, fan fiction, groups, communities, and users with very strong and, shall we say in some cases, infamous opinions and pages. There was also a wealth of infighting, ship wars, and all-around chaos on DA surrounding this community. And in fact, I actually made a 5-hour video on one such figure, though he isn't just tied to DA, by the name of Richard Kuda, or Som Manic as he was known back on DeviantArt and many communities he was a part of at that time. I highly recommend that if you're into old internet drama, fandom wars, fandom passion, and hearing the aftermath and story of someone who has hit rock bottom and came back out the other side a better man today, that you give this one a watch. But enough shilling. Anyways, there was also a fairly large community that was dedicated to hating, shitting on, or generally being anti-Archie Sonic or Sad AM, which also caused more fandom wars. And to this very day, I often see people who wish or want to see the Freedom Fire character show up, or at least be referenced in the new Sonic games, comics, etc. And a separate group that is also dedicated to trolling those same people. I guess it's safe to say that this fandom war spans decades and doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. Zero Light Source Zero Light Source is a well-known hentai artist who boasts a wide variety of OCs and fan art that has gained quite a bit of traction, be it on Tumblr or DeviantArt, with their recognizable style being quite successful, shall we say. Monty Oom. Many fondly remember Oom for his work on the award-winning original series, Ruby, 
along with his many other works at Rooster Teeth. His DeviantArt serves as a dumping ground for concept art and general behind the scenes stuff on whatever he was working on. Unfortunately though, Oom passed away in 2015 from a severe allergic reaction following a surgery. Rest in peace. Alternate DA mascots. So, time for a bit of lost media. As noted earlier, DA's mascot, Fella, was chosen via a poll, but unfortunately we have no documentation of what the other choices for said poll even were, or what the vote percentage was for that matter, leaving a very big part of DA's history completely unaccounted for. What did the other mascots look like? Did Fella win by a landslide, or was there another serious contender? We unfortunately may never know. Kianami. Now this is a pop popular user. Kianami has been on DA for 9 years and has nearly 60,000 watchers, near 13 million page views and over 1,000 pieces of art to their name. Most know her for her abundance of Pokemon fan art. But her main claim to fame is that she became a storyboard artist for Disney, storyboarding for the mega popular shows The Owl House and Amphibia. She still occasionally uses her DA page for her Pokemon fan art, uh, particularly Team Rocket flavored Pokemon fan art, as well as an outlet for behind the scenes content and looks into the shows that she works on. From fan artist to full time storyboarder, character designer, and even director at Disney Television Animation, Kianami is one of those people that many look up to and see as an inspiration. A showcase that no goal or dream job is too lofty, so long as you have the drive, passion, and put in the time to make it happen. Animatrix. Animatrix is the official DA account of Rebecca Sugar, otherwise known as the creator of the hit animated TV series Steven Universe. It is often well known knowledge that Rebecca had a Tumblr before working on Steven Universe but far fewer are aware that she also had a DeviantArt page too. Now, if there's success, the page is more for responding to fans and liking fan art, and many who love the series find it inspiring that someone who made it so big in the animation industry started off as just another artist on DA and Tumblr like so many others. Morph Art Closely related to pregnancy captions, which we'll get to later, but can include any number of fetishes, morph art is simply any given picture that's been edited, usually in Photoshop, to match whatever you fancy, I suppose. Be it a big belly edit onto someone, or big boobs, or something of that sort, or someone edited to look like an animal, like a cat, or a dog, or a fucking cow, or something. This, for obvious reasons, can lead to some pretty uncanny results. And speaking personally from the few that I've come across, gives me some majorly bad vibes. Nintendrawer. As the name suggests, Nintendrawer is a Nintendo-based artist, but rather than being the standard fan art page, they've essentially crafted a pretty in-depth domestic AU for the various characters of the Mario universe. Now, for those who are not familiar with the term domestic AU or domestic alternate universe, according to fanlore.com, quote, domestic fic or domestic AUs are works showing canon characters living their everyday lives. This form of AU is particularly popular in fandoms with supernatural or science fiction elements. But unlike mundane AUs, it's not necessary to remove these elements to have a domestic fic. Instead, the characters are placed in domestic scenarios, which are removed from the stresses of canon. In a domestic fic, characters in a canon or non-canon relationship are sometimes married with children." Unquote. Legit, this type of fanfic slash AU is so popular that it often feels like the default for many when they think of fanfiction. I can't tell you how many animations, fanfics, fan comics, and the like that I have seen and at times enjoyed featuring such things as what if Sonic and his friends all lived in the same house? I can't tell you how many fucking times that exact scenario has been played out. Um, or the Star Fox team and the Great Fox mucking about. The characters of Evangelion just sort of chilling out in the world without Avas and Angels and the like, etc, etc. It can be a pretty fun scenario to see, 
and makes for a very chill atmosphere, with any conflict that happens being between characters rather than life or death situations. But it can also at times serve as a kind of lazy default for when an artist or authors don't really want to write anything beyond the characters sitting around and doing really mundane shit. And other times it can serve as a weird look into the mind of the creator as they mirror their own life, habits, feelings, etc. onto the characters almost entirely changing them in a bizarrely specific way. At any rate, Nintendrawer has created quite an interesting one of these AUs, with a comic that has some really expressive art, featuring Peach, Daisy, Mario, and Luigi just living their everyday lives and facing various hurdles of marriage or family life. Their style immediately pops out to many as it's very similar to the old style used in Nintendo Power in the 90s, which many find to be quite nostalgic. Add that with some unique characterizations to the cast, like Luigi being the shy but confident dork, Wario being a childhood bully to Mario, to even Daisy as a rough and tumble farm girl, makes the characters similar enough to the games but recontextualized and just interesting enough to stand as their own interpretations of these iconic characters. Nintendo Drawer has nearly 7 million page views, and she's been crafting this comic and drawing Nintendo characters all the way back into 2007, with now over 1,000 pieces of art to her collection by now. Truly a prolific artist on the site, well worth mentioning. Hitalia Fandom DeviantArt in its prime was host to one of the largest collectives of Hitalia fans being second only to Tumblr at the time. Now for those who aren't aware what Hitalia is, according to the Hitalia Archives, a wiki dedicated to the fandom and series, quote, Axis Powers Italia is a webcomic later adapted into a manga and an anime series by creator, I'm going to definitely butcher this name, Hidekaz Himaruya. The series presents an allegorical interpretation of political and historic events particularly of the World War II era, in which the various countries are represented by human-like characters. Natalia is a portmanteau, that means a word blending the sounds and combining the meanings of two others, for example, motel from motor and hotel, or brunch from breakfast and lunch. Combining Hitare, Japanese for unreliable, and Italia, this is to make light of Italy's apparent cowardice during World War II and overall character." Unquote. This fandom was unbelievably popular back at its peak. We're talking homestuck levels of popularity. I can't tell you how much fan art, shipping and shipping wars, and non-stop fangirling was going on over this show. I only ever saw a few episodes of it back in the day out of curiosity, and I sadly enough don't really remember what I thought about it, but I must have not thought it was all that great if I didn't continue. All the same though, this was a very popular fandom on DA and you were sure to see lots of groups, fans, and fan art of this fan base. With uh, some examples being Parcel Pensart. Pars was a fairly popular artist in the Italia fandom, thanks in no small part to an Ask blog that they ran on Tumblr, with the DA page often being an extension of the Ask blog featuring the ship Nedcan, that is the character's Netherlands ex Canada, among other fandoms. Though they are inactive now, their queer positive AU for these characters was once quite popular amongst the fanbase. Hibbity Hub Another Hitalia fan artist stemming from a Tumblr Ask blog, her claim to fame is featuring the very popular ship of Suthin, that is Sweden ex Finland, but they've been active in other fandoms like Free Iwatobi Swim Club and the Frozen Tangled Guardians, which I would go into, but it is again more of a Tumblr thing. But the short version is basically Frozen Tangled Guardians as a fandom is this AU where the characters of Frozen, Tangled, and Rise of the Guardians are basically just shipped together as characters. Uh, mostly the Elsa and Jack Frost characters, since they're both snow people. It's also worth mentioning that an ass blog is usually a blog in which the creator roleplays as one or many characters, be they OCs or more likely a character from a series, and answers people's questions, usually with the twist of their versions of said character 
being a bit different or an AU version or something like that. Again, this is a Tumblr, not a DA thing, but there were certainly people who roleplayed as characters in a similar fashion on DeviantArt as well, though it was more rare. Bonus Entry, Homestuck. As mentioned earlier, Homestuck was one of the most popular fandoms on DeviantArt back in the day. As described on the MS Paint Adventures webcomics website or homestuck.com, quote, Homestuck, a tale about a boy and his friends and a game they play together, about 8,000 pages. Don't say we didn't warn you, unquote. Diving a bit deeper, the MS Paint Adventures wiki has the webcomic described as, quote, Homestuck is the fourth and largest story in the MS Paint adventures, with 8,123 pages. It started on the 13th of April, 2009, or 4-13-09, 4 becoming a recurring number in-universe. The story contains foul language, violence, gore, and other adult themes. The comic ended on April 13th, 2016, seven years after the stable release was first published. Unquote. Now, from what I've gathered, the webcomic first started off as a sort of game where the reader interacts with the comic, like a sort of basic flash game of sorts. But later in the fourth act of this seven-act story, this was abandoned in favor of just finishing the story. The actual plot centers around a group of teens who avoid the inevitable destruction of Earth by installing the beta version of an upcoming video game, S-Burb. Later, the group of teens come into contact with a group of internet trolls, who are like these horned aliens with gray skin and the like. And both groups work together to try and finish the game, and thus creating a new universe. Do note that I have never actually read much of Homestuck, so I am being rather general here, and I'd be lying if I said where this tale eventually goes in the end. I. I, I don't really know. All the same though, this webcomic became an internet phenomenon, and I remember I could not escape seeing thousands of pieces of fan art for the series nearly everywhere. Half of my friend group at the time changed all their icons to be various troll characters from this comic, and I even remember that with each troll character there's like a different astrology sign on their shirt, and while I think there may be a slightly different meaning to this, in the comics themselves, many just like using these characters with the matching star sign as a kind of symbol of who they are on the site. Now all that being said, this is not a dig against the comic or the fanbase, mind you. But what's funny is I remember seeing all this amazing fan art on DeviantArt, and these cool looking gothic emo boys and girls with fucking horns. I mean, I love horns, my dude! And I remember finally deciding to give the comic a try, ready to see some Kino art, and then I see this. And yeah, I won't lie, I was pretty disappointed. Again, no shade being thrown at the comic or the fanbase, but needless to say, uh, the fan art really gave me the wrong expectations going into it. Since then, the Homestuck fandom has continued to be fairly popular, though not as popular as it once was, to my knowledge. And this fandom and its various individuals there within, and the series lore itself, is big enough of a rabbit hole that it could easily be its own iceberg. So, we'll move on for now. Art Theft. Being an art platform, DeviantArt is of course going to have people claiming art as their own, when it's, in fact, not their own. There is no singular way of stealing it either, since it comes in many forms, be it tracing, downloading and claiming ownership, or impersonation. But regardless, the person almost always gets caught within a short period of time, and then proceeds to get dunked on and gets like negative XP from the general community for years after. So I really couldn't tell you why so many people feel compelled to do this. But they do, which is pretty silly. Impreg. Impreg stands for male pregnancy. Yep, DeviantArt was very well known for the most absurd amount of impreg, with fandoms like Italia being the most seen. As for why this fetish exists, I really couldn't tell you. Seems pretty weird to me. And even worse, when I try to imagine how the fuck they give birth. Seriously, quite cursed, the thought, I must say. But, uh, whatever floats your boat, 
I guess. Five Nights at Freddy's and Five Nights at Freddy's OCs. I don't think it's a shock to anyone when I say that FNAF is pretty damn popular on DA, as it is in most places. There's tons of fan art, fan groups, roleplay groups, and fan fiction to be found connected to the series, and has a lot of younger users completely dedicated to it, in a similar fashion to Sonic. Also, much like Sonic, one of the popular types of fan art for FNAF are OCs. Searching your name plus the animatronic is always sure to yield some results. With that being said, let's see what Dylan the animatronic looks like. The first we have looks like we have this uh, Dalmatian animatronic. He's uh, pretty cool looking, you know, I, I like that guy. And then we got Dylan the human animatronic, which is, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting. He's a guy. And then we got Dylan the Green Foxy from the hit game Five Nights at Gypsies or Gypsies, whatever. Um, so you know that's uh, that's a pretty good selection of Dylan-related animatronics, I'd say. Also, for the site's 22nd birthday, there was a Five Nights at Freddy's-related event and this art to accompany it. Lady Fizzy. While we're on that topic, Fizzy is a pretty well-known artist within the FNAF fandom with even series creator Scott Cawthon himself using her art for the spin-off novels. Though nowadays, she's more noted for the several controversies that she's gotten into over the years. It was discovered that she had written quite a disturbing fanfiction revolving around the series' villain, The Purple Guy, killing and getting intensely aroused by the whole thing. And remember, his victims are children. Now, technically, this series is all about children being abducted, killed, their spirits living on in animatronic suits and what have you. But many seem to feel that Fizzy's fanfiction seemed almost too into it, with much of the story being framed around the vivid description of these terrible acts. I've not personally read the fanfic, so I cannot speak to how true this actually is. And I've certainly read things before by very, very edgy boys and girls they came off as extremely messed up, but could have just been them being a bad or edgy writer. But who knows? I suppose a series like this, especially with such young fan base mostly, could attract some bad actors. Ask for if Fizzy is one of them or not, I really don't know. And I'm at no real authority to say so one way or the other. So, moving on. Sparkle Dogs. In the crossroads of Mary Sue OCs and Furries, Sparkle Dogs were a very bizarre byproduct of the boom of scene culture towards the mid 2000s. Generally being very brightly colored with stylized hair, Sparkle Dogs as a concept is very hard to pinpoint an origin for, but the earliest I or Iceberg author Nora was able to find was a base made by DA user Coral APTX as seen here. However, it wasn't until DA user Edward Ellerk32 shared their own rendition of the base that it really started to take off as seen here. Now I'd actually like to make a note here about scene and emo fashion and art because, honestly, so many iconic parts of DeviantArt culture and the art styles surrounding it come from these subcultures. When it comes to scene subculture, scene fashion is known for its bright colored clothing, skinny jeans, stretched earlobes, sunglasses, piercings, large belt buckles, wristbands, fingerless gloves, eyeliner, hair extensions, and straight slash androgynous flat hair with a long fringe covering the forehead and sometimes one or both eyes. Seeing people often dye their hair colors like blonde, pink, red, green, or bright blue as well. Basically, they look like neon colored versions of emos, which by contrast, their fashion and style wise is much more uh, darker in color and more gothic and punk inspired. Emos also have math rock music and MCR, which makes it automatically better than seeing kids, but you know, that's uh, neither here or there. All the same though, both scene and emo styles found themselves being a prevalent aesthetic for many OCs back in the day, and honestly even to this day in many ways. Rune Jan, truly a relic of uh, DeviantArt. Rune has been on the site since 2003, 
featuring the tell-tale style of anime mixed with lol so random. Much of her art revolves around her unique cast of OCs, living their everyday lives with wacky hijinks aplenty. She's one of the site's earliest adopters, and going through her gallery is both looking through her own amazing evolution in her art style, but also a look through the history of the artwork that could be found on DeviantArt through most of its existence. Which is pretty damn cool. Kink Spook Non-binary artist King Spook features a rather large sampling size of various pieces depicting vor, or belly stuffing, or even impreg. Looking at their art, which is very difficult to show you without the whole video getting flagged, might I add, I would almost describe it as realistic terror vor. It's truly horrific stuff, which I guess you could say they are talented in what they are doing, if that is indeed the uh, intention. But while we're on the topic, Vor. Yep, it's about time we do a deep dive into Vor, or as much as YouTube will allow. Vorophilia, or just Vor, is a fetish in which one wishes to be eaten or eat another person. It should be noted that Vor fantasies are separate from sexual cannibalism because the living victim is normally swallowed whole. And depending on the variation, sometimes the guy or gal being swallowed is obviously super scared, while other times they almost seem like they are comfortable and happy with being swallowed whole. According to Wikipedia, quote, usually vorophilic fantasies involve a consumer, sometimes called a predator or pred, ingesting one or multiple victims, sometimes called prey, in some way. Since vorophilic fantasies cannot usually be acted out in reality, they are often expressed in stories or drawings shared on the internet. There are several variations to this fantasy, often changing the way the victim is ingested. Typically, when the victim is consumed orally, most of the time it's portrayed as soft vor. The victim is swallowed whole and enters the stomach of the victim, then either is kept there safely or gets digested inside. If the victim is kept safe, also known as endovor, the victim can eventually be let out by regurgitation, whereas if digestion happens, the victim is killed, but may be magically reformed. On the other hand, there's a less commonly seen hardvor, which consists of the victim being chewed and torn apart by the consumer, followed by a more gruesome depiction of digestion. This combination always ends in the victim's death. The sizes of the consumer and or victim can vary as well. Macro slash microvore consists of either a shrunken victim or a giant consumer, possibly a combination of both. Same size or a larger victim vor is more common, and oftentimes the enlarged belly of the consumer is described or shown with great care. Aside from typical oral vor, there are plenty of subcategories. There is analvor, consisting of the victim being ingested through the anus instead of the mouth and into the stomach. Unbirth is the ingestion of the victim through the uh, and then you have cockvor, in which the victim is sucked in through the uh, the ding dong, which may be depicted as erect and excessively large and delivered to the scrumud or where they may be transformed into semen. Breastvor consists of the victim being sucked into the breasts, where they may be transformed into breast milk. Besides these main ones listed, there are many other subcategories that may be less commonly seen, but they all more or less amount to the victim being ingested through a consumer's orifice of some kind." Unquote. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Vor is a very uh, fascinating, interesting, intriguing, thought-provoking, puzzling fetish, uh, to say the least. But it must be asked, where does this thing come from? Why do people enjoy this so much? Why are there so many people getting their rocks off to this strange and unrealistic scenario? Well... To be honest, no one really knows the full answer because it seems like there are many answers to this question. So I checked around and found some people who are into vor answer the question of why they enjoy this type of art so much. One such answer comes from Reddit user Sucky Memberavan. 
Quote, For many people, it's a sexual thing, but for a minority of war fans, including myself, don't have any sexual interest. I've been into it since I was pretty young, like seven-ish. This answer is gonna require a bit of background information. In the Vor community, there's a bit of a divide between people who prefer the creature being eaten, prey, being digested, and others who prefer to see the prey be spat out or unharmed. I personally fall into the latter category. Yeah, I know it's physically impossible, but whatever. Scientific accuracy is for dinosaurs. The thing about Vor that appeals to me is the closeness and intimacy between the two parties involved. I mean, it's literally letting someone inside you. In a weird and abstract way, it's really cute. Think of it as like cuddling taken to the extreme. For reasons I'd prefer not to go into, I was a really lonely kid, so the idea of this kind of intense intimacy really appeals to me. It's bizarre, I know, but that's human psychology for you. I'm probably explaining it terribly, to be honest." Unquote. Going off of that, I noticed several other answers, sexual or not, seem to be about getting extra connected with someone or becoming one with another in an intimate way that is frankly kind of horrifying. I could keep going down this rabbit hole for a while and I'm sure more elements from it will be showing up across this iceberg, but I think you get the basic idea of it, even if I really can't show the more specific offshoots of this fetish. I guess at the end of the day, it's at least a pretty safe fetish because it's so unrealistic you won't, you know, be seeing someone into Vor trying to act out their fetish in real life. I mean, I guess they could try, but uh, they certainly won't get very far trying to swallow someone whole, unlike other fetishes based more in reality, like those of assaulting others, for example. <laughs> Uh, but all the same, it is still really unbelievably fucking weird. And I am judging all of you for being little tiny freaks who like to be swallowed whole. And, uh, have a good day, I guess. Keeney. First started posting in 2008, Keeney was an artist who unfortunately passed away in 2020 from cancer with her death being met with overwhelming mourning from the art community at large. She's known for the crying in the puddle of tears meme as seen here, and her artwork is absolutely gorgeous, with some of my favorite pieces from her being Starred Coffee, Sunset, Contemplation, Jellyfish, Night Goddess, and her final piece before she passed away, Birdcage, rest in peace. Ridiculous Cake, also known as Secret Goomba Man 12345 on DA and most commonly known for their MLP art, Cake is a very well-known artist in the weight gain slash inflation community and many of their videos slash animations on YouTube have reached almost 1 million views, which you can see a bit of in the background here. Though Cake has found himself in a fair bit of controversy from time to time, a common rebuttal against him is his weird sexualizing of the blueberry scene from Willy Wonka, a thanks to the character in question, as well as the actress being underage. That's certainly not the only controversy he's been involved with either, as he's been accused of stalking and even drawing not safe for work art of a minor on Twitter, though there really isn't much in the way of actual evidence for this claim to my knowledge. He's a popular figure in this community on nearly every social media platform he's on, including DeviantArt. As for his art, uh, it's not for me, chief. But hey, if you like that stuff, fair enough, I suppose. Ponder Sprocket. Ponder, real name Brooke Eakins, is an art community YouTuber and considered part of the ranting community. She's most noted for her videos debunking the accusations against fellow YouTuber Spockter Theory, which leads into Spockter Theory slash Spockter Theory accusations. In 2018, YouTuber and deviant art ranter Spockter was accused of engaging in sexually explicit behavior with minors, among other things, by fellow YouTubers slash ranters, Pentagrin and Stories. However, anyone who took more than a passing glance 
could see the holes and logical leaps needed to make the claim. However, in yet another great fumbling of cancel culture, Spockter would lose subs in the hundreds along with his YouTube slash DeviantArt being bombarded in hate. That's where people never learn to wait and just see actual evidence. It's almost like people are just waiting for a villain to attack, regardless of what the truth is. Some going as far as to even wish death on him. YouTubers Ponder Sprocket and PK Russell came out with videos shooting down all the claims as well as Spockter himself addressing the claims as well. I go into more detail, but the long and short of it is, there was no meat to any of the accusations. As for Spockter theory as a whole, I'd be lying if I said I really ever watched him or a people in his group at all. But from my research and giving a glance over some of his stuff, it seems like he used to be a lot like older channels based around criticizing and ranting about DeviantArt related stuff, where he was rather harsh. And then after the whole accusation situation, he softened up a lot and started critiquing art and others in general in a more constructive manner. Deviant Art Cringe. Another controversial YouTuber, DA Cringe as the name suggests, highlights generally bad or weird art from online platforms, mainly Deviant Art. He ended up earning a lot of flack for his rather lazy commentary and offering no actual criticism and instead just kind of mocking little kids mostly. The channel later rebranded to Cyber Rampage and changed to a gaming channel. Though I'm unsure if that was done due to the backlash or if he just got bored at some point, but either way, his views had a sharp decline, like less than a thousand views per video type of decline. And he hasn't uploaded a new video in two years, so... It's safe to say the channel is dead and he's moved on to greener pastures. Bun Bear. Much like Rune Chan, Bun has been on DeviantArt since the early days, dating all the way back to 2009. Much of her art revolves around presenting a slice of life series revolving around her various OCs. She eventually moved counts to Z Bun Bear, where she posts new comics to this very day. Digressing NHQ. If you're at all familiar with famous YouTube channel Game Theory, then this name might ring a bell to you. Digressing NHQ, real name Ronnie Edwards, was an editor for MatPat on the channel. But more than that, Ronnie was a big part of the team for the channel at the time, appearing in a few videos themselves, as well as having his own series on the channel named Digressing and Sidequesting. Digressing and Sidequesting had the same tight editing as the main channel videos, and covered such topics as the history of Let's Plays, the fight against lag in MMO combat systems, mechanics and smaller details in games, and in general the series was a fun and informative look at lesser looked at but still super interesting aspects of video games as a medium, historically, and mechanically. In other words, the series was kind of a banger. His deviant art, while small, was still known by fans with it mainly being used for uh, commenting on fan art or posting behind the scenes stuff. Unfortunately, Ronnie would take his own life on July 4th of 2018, with fans across the web and especially DeviantArt utterly heartbroken, with MatPat himself also making a video entitled Losing the Battle, where he discusses the news and sadness he feels towards his editor, his co-worker, and his friend, cutting his own life so short. Many people to this day go to both Ronnie's own YouTube channel as well as his DA page, to pay their respects to a creator so many loved and looked up to. Bonus Entry Mike Matei DeviantArt You know the guy who made a 6 hour video on AVGN just had to include this bonus entry. So Mike Matei, longtime friend to James Rolfe, the creator of the famous internet series The Angry Video Game Nerd, is a man of many hats. He's a gamer, he's the AVGN series co-creator, he's the guy playing most of the extra characters found throughout the series, he owns at least a 10 inch ruler, and of all the many other things, he also used to be well known for as the artist who made the thumbnails slash title cards of the Avian series. Now, these range from, well, not the best, shall we say, to genuinely very detailed and great looking, and he definitely has a style and certain a charm in the way that he makes these things. Well, back in the day, he used to post all these drawings on his own personal DeviantArt account, 
simply named Mike Matei. I remember as a huge AVGN fan, this was one of the first accounts I followed back in the day, and I thought it was so cool that I could more personally interact with one of the series' important creators. That being said, while you can still visit the account to this day, sadly all the art, both the AVGN thumbnails as well as his original non-AVGN stuff, has been wiped clean, save for except this one where Mighty Number no. 9 is using Mega Man's head as a bowling ball, which, um, didn't age well, to say the least. There's actually a journal post on his page where he addresses why he took down all the stuff. Quote, Some of you probably realized I took all my stuff off DeviantArt. I may use this account to upload some of my stuff sometime later, but for now, I feel it's kind of pointless posting anything here. So, for the time being, this account is abandoned, until I find some use for it. If you want to keep up with me and what's going on, you can visit Cinemassacre. Unquote. This seems like a really strange reason for destroying one's own archive of drawings, just because they don't really use it much anymore. But, oh well. Bonus Entry Video Game Forum Discussions Ah, back to the land of deviant art forums. One of the most popular areas in the forums back in the day was the video game section. I have so many memories lurking and occasionally even writing something there myself. The most popular types of posts were We Frankos, which is kind of funny looking back, question threads, which were usually when someone would ask, like, everyone on the forum, Yo, what's your favorite JRPG and why? What's the worst game you ever played? What's the best boss you ever fucking fought? What's the hardest one? Etc, etc. And this was kind of used as a means of connecting with others and finding a like-minded friends through the forums. Which a lot of the areas of the forums were used for, to be honest. There are even some forum areas that were used specifically for trying to fish out possible boyfriends and girlfriends, but uh, We'll get to that later. But then, you had the real meat and cheese of these forums. The hot take threads. Where someone would write something, usually creating a whole ass essay about the game, or the genre, or the gaming thing that they take issue with. And then people would argue, and argue, and argue, and yeah, I think you get the point. Some of the hot topics and issues of the time that I remember are as follows. Firstly, you had Sonic Game Drama, and let me tell you, just about every single type of topic that you could talk about with Sonic was talked about in those forums. Though, in particular, some of the more popular Sonic-related game drama would include any discussion on Sonic 06, if Sonic was ever going to get a good game again, or if Sonic was ever good at all. This, as you might imagine, was a hotly debated issue, and I even remember that I made a thread myself about the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog 4 at the time, which we hadn't actually seen anything about yet, but everyone knew that it was called Project Needle Mouse, and that it seemed like it was going to be a return to form, to the classics after what many people considered to be a major misstep with Sonic 06 and the like. Now, I don't remember exactly how I put it, but I remember thinking that this sounded like a bad idea, as I wanted to continue getting new Sonic games. I wanted to see Sonic games get bigger, not scale back, and so I asked why everyone thinks it's such a good idea to go backwards instead of forwards. To which I then got absolutely dunked on. I got called a dumb fanboy who doesn't understand the appeal of Sonic. I was told I was one of the reasons this fandom and this franchise has gone down the shitter and all sorts of other various such insults. Bear in mind, I was about 14 or 15 at this time, and I kind of remember thinking at that point that, well, if this many people think I'm being dumb, maybe I am. And so, I sort of slinked back into my lurking mode again. A bit beat up, I must admit, after the thorough thrashing that I received. The game that we ended up getting was Sonic the Hedgehog 4, one of the worst pieces of shit Sega has ever published. <laughs> Who's the dumbass now? Don't you know that I never miss? Even as a 14 year old kid, I knew that shit was doomed from the start. <laughs> I win! <laughs> Now, uh, where was I? Oh, yes. 
the forum full of people who were wrong. Another hotly contested issue was whether Final Fantasy VII was in fact a good game or not. I can't tell you how many arguments went something like this. Man, I sure do love Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII is overrated garbage with an emo protagonist. Play Final Fantasy VI instead. Bro, I love Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VI. What are you on about? What a fence rider. Final Fantasy VII is terrible. Stop giving that shit game credit. Fuck Final Fantasy VI. Final Fantasy VII is the only good one. And so on and so on. I swear so many people argued about this exact same issue that as someone who had only played Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core at that time, since I didn't have ready access to emulation and the like, but wanted to play the others, I felt like Final Fantasy VII was getting a lot of unnecessary hate just because it was popular. Especially since I love both of those games so much and they were so instrumental into getting me into the genre of JRPG alongside Fantasy Star 4, of course, like any true king would. This whole hate train really confounded me. I'll even admit, because so much of the Final Fantasy VII hate was coming from Final Fantasy VI fans, it kind of put me off playing that one for a while since I always knew it as the one that those jerks liked. However, Final Fantasy VI is also a great game, one of the best in the series in fact, and I'm willing to admit I'm a bit ashamed I let people on DeviantArt forums of all places put me off playing that Kino. But hey, it happens to the best of us. Learn the lesson to not let fandoms ruin your enjoyment of the actual media themselves. Another big issue was people screaming at each other about which video game console was the best and why, and which one was the worst and why, and yeah, it played out exactly how you think it did. I could go on and on, but I think that you get the point. Despite many of my examples being tinged a bit negatively, I'd be lying if I didn't note how much fun it was reading through others' thoughts on games I had never even heard of, let alone played yet, as well as the general discourse whether I disagreed or not. It was still very interesting to see as it is now. XX Chi Chi XX A fairly large artist in the Dragon Ball fandom, Chi Chi has gained quite a bit of traction for fans of the ship Goku X Vegeta, with Yaoi being the primary content she creates as well as scenarios involving impreg between the two, because, I mean, it is DeviantArt after all. That being said, they also make safe-for-work art and general DBZ-related artwork, and they have the style of the show-slash-manga down to a T, so they are, regardless, quite talented. Theophilia. Theophilia, or lover of God one might call them, is an artist who creates these beautiful pieces, these Catholic saints and other various pieces of art showcasing Catholicism, Christian slash Catholic symbolism, and super detailed pieces. Their artwork looks like those you would find on a ornate stained glass window. Their page is popular among both those who are religious and non-religious for their objective skill and eye-catching style. ANP Creations slash Black Saga AMP, real name Alan slash Jonah, is the creator of an original comic called Black Saga. Taking inspiration from Full Metal Alchemist, Black Saga is set in 2040, following the implementation of lawlessness in the United States. A bioweapon named Ethan braves this hellscape. However, updates have halted as of 2022 due to personal strife in the creator's life. Zootopia Abortion Comic Yes. It is time we talk about this. This is probably one of the most infamous and well-talked about entries in recent time. So, let's dive right into it. So the Zootopia abortion comic is actually entitled I Will Survive and was created by DA user Borba. The comic is about Judy and Nick, the two main characters of the Disney film Zootopia, a, a bunny rabbit and fox respectively, and yeah, I'm gonna assume that you've seen that film already. But the two of them are in a relationship here. Judy takes a pregnancy test and finds out that she's pregnant. So she wakes up Nick to tell him the news, that she's pregnant. And at first Nick doesn't believe her, but he does realize she's telling the truth and before she's able to continue her thought, he wraps her up in his arms and tells her this is the happiest day of his life, that he loves her so much, etc. But then Judy puts a stop to this excitement when she says that this wasn't meant to be. Nick assumes that she means that 
they are different species at first. But then Judy elaborates. The problem is, is that she doesn't want this child. Nick can't believe what he's hearing. And then he starts asking her why she's saying this. And he asks her to explain why she doesn't want their baby. Judy says that there is no baby yet, that this is just the first month of pregnancy. To which Nick retorts that she decided that this is going to be the last though. So then Judy explains that she thought that there is no way that they could have a baby. And now that she is pregnant, she's afraid that their child might be some kind of freak of nature. And that a baby from Nick might be too big for her to give birth to, which, uh... Ugh, what a fucking weird image to leave printed in my brain. Anyway, so Nick is hurt that she doesn't want to try, and that she doesn't want to have any children with him. She then notes that there's more to it though, that she also doesn't want it because it will interfere with her career as a police officer, especially since she's getting ready to be promoted to lieutenant, and that she has dreams, and that she's a symbol, and that she doesn't want to throw all that away. Nick is disgusted by this, saying that he thought he knew her, but apparently he does not. She says that he does, and that she does everything for her career, and that he knew this going into the relationship. And yeah, this is all sounding a lot like one of those dumb, terribly written and contrivance-ridden soap operas that have been going on for like a hundred years or something. But it's about Zootopia characters, which is kind of funny. But then we get to this big meme shot. Nick says that yes, he does know, and that it seems that she would even kill their baby for her career, to which this ultra-dramatically drawn shot is showcased. Judy slapping Nick with all her might. This exchange is what made this comic so popular. Because it's already rather silly to see Zootopia characters having a melodramatic conversation about something as serious as abortion. But then people started adding in their own text to this, the most famous of which being where the whole conversation is changed to be about the local Arby's. Well anyway, Nick tells her that she's an inspiration to so many, that she's shined a light on people and society, and that he's begging her to let her baby live, to give it a chance, to make a change as well, to have the gift of life, so her light may continue through them. Judy considers the idea, but ultimately decides that she's not going to have the baby, saying that it's my body, my rules. So with that, Nick leaves her, telling her that it would have been better if she never told him at all about the premeditated sin that she was about to commit. And he tells her to don't worry, that he will survive the end. So yeah, that's the comic, and it's certainly something. I'm not really in the mood to talk about fucking abortion and all that sort of shit. That's kind of a can of worms I'm gonna try to avoid, my chief. But, that being said though, what's kind of interesting about this comic is, beyond all the dramatics and everything, this comic single-handedly lifted the user Borba's DeviantArt page to have over 3 million views, and became one of the most controversial comics in the Zootopia fandom, and far beyond it, going into general meme culture and the like. However, some of you may not be aware that it actually has two sequels that takes things to a whole extra level. In short, there was a sequel to this comic entitled Born to be Alive, where Nick decides to come back to Judy after some extended period of time but she's already replaced him with a new partner, a new female fox, which Nick has an absolute breakdown over because she's not a lesbian, but I guess she is now. And it's all very soap opera-y and silly to say the least. This being a clear case of fan fiction writing where the core characters are almost entirely gone, replaced with the author's narration and essentially their own set of characters wearing the same shapes as the characters that you are aware of. But then it gets even crazier with the final sequel to this story where Nick is like taking these kids on a tour through Zootopia as like a fucking animal scout or something, I don't know. And Judy is now the mayor of the city. The two meet up and after catching up, the two seem to be on good terms, letting bygones be bygones. She also meets his son as well. Judy then lamented that there are radical groups, both prey and preds, who are I guess like Nazis or some shit, and they want to overthrow the government. Then next sees the fox woman from before, uh, Judy was with, and uh, they are married now, and they have two adopted kids and whatever. 
more apologies are exchanged and they say their final goodbyes, yada yada yada. Anyway, this comic ends with Judy getting shot in the head JFK style. Yep, uh, before it's thing revealed that she was actually shot with a paintball full of cherry jam. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, moving right along then. Tori the Wolfie. So for our final entry this tier, we have one of the most bizarre rabbit holes I've come across yet. Tori the Wolfie, real name Sam Brandon Yon Stevens, is one of those users who doesn't just have an ED page dedicated to their antics. They have quite a few in which they are featured. They are a locale through and through, and they have a lot of connections to a lot of other uh, locales as well. Tori the Wolfie, in short, has been harassing people for years. Ever since they first made their account, they have been ban evading for years with, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, over 38 different confirmed accounts through their name. But honestly, it's way more than that, and I don't think anywhere has officially documented and kept up with them all, especially in more recent years. Now, I'm going to break down some of this DA drama, but bear in mind that most of my info is coming from ED themselves. But with that said, Tori's drama all started with user Stella Akirath witnessing Tori harassing user Feza Ketsune over a DeviantArt stamp that they deemed to be hate speech. The censored username here is Tori for context. Quote, remove your anti-otherkin stamp, it's hate speech. Also stop being emo you wuss. Done eat so much salt bro, it's bad for your health. You wanna die little bitch. Nah man, I'm already dead and in hell. Oh by the way, come back to me once you have proper insults from me. This is just sad, XD, unquote. And now for this extra conversation, the first person talking is Feza Ketsune, and then the second person is Tori, and then the conversation goes down from there. I'll try and have some kind of little thing on screen to make it easier. Quote, uh, no, why should I? It's an opinion. Opinions are like assholes. Everyone has them, but not everyone will like them. As for being emo, eh, it's kind of part of who I am. Sorry, not happening. I am otherkin. You will remove the stamps. I can easily have you erased. Fucking merda puta. You said fucking twice in a row, dude. That grammar, though. I'm the one talking, you white bitch, not you. I'll be watching you. Remember, other kin and Therian are the same thing, kinda, like Christian bitches and Catholic pedos. Not exactly the same, but whatever floats your boat, put what you want on your page, like every other human. Did you just call me human, pedazo de merda? Christians deserve to be killed for being against LGBT. They nothing but fat putas, unquote. By the way, I know we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier with the furry thing, but other kin and Therians are basically people that are kind of furry adjacent, but they think that they're spiritually an animal. So that's the context for that. And the stamp, again, was a stamp against Therians and other kin because uh, Feza thought that they were cringe or whatever. But this whole argument went on for quite a while and eventually Stella would end up writing this journal in response to Tori's threats to both harm both of them as well as himself. Quote, listen, do you want to know why people aren't believing your claims? That's because you are harassing other people, telling users, including myself, you want to die? Telling people to deal with it whenever you were harassing them non-stop. And now, you're saying you're going to, mmm, yourself because people are bullying you? No, that's not true at all. First of all, you harassed Frieza Ketsune the day of you joined DeviantArt, demanding the girl to remove her hate speech anti-otherkin stamp. Then you started threatening her, then moved on to giving her relationship advice? Again, all ordering her to do what you wanted. And now that people have started calling you out for your bullshit, you're using the I has autism leave me alone card, which pisses me off to no fucking end. First of all, if you had autism, you wouldn't be harassing others you wouldn't be ordering people around because autism people that I've met are nice as fuck. So you're making people with autism look bad, you sick fuck. 
now you're pulling the I'm going to mmm mm, myself because of bullying. No, you won't, because if you did, you'd be dead by now to be blunt. You wouldn't be saying that you would mmm yourself and posting other status posts to harass other users. Alright, so you want to say you were nice to people, eh? I'm sorry, but no, you're not being nice. If anything, you're being a hypocrite and a fucking five-year-old spoiled brat because you didn't get what you wanted with Frieza Ketsune. So now you're attacking other users to get them to do your bidding, unquote. Uh, it does go on a little bit longer, but I think you get the point. The thing is though, Tori didn't just attack these people. In fact, from the day he first joined the site, they had done near nothing but yell and whine and scream at other users. Then, when they got banned for harassment and death threats, they would just make a new account and start it all over again, which prompted people to begin to troll them, with this being a good example of what the typical interaction with him on his page would look like. Again, for context, Tori is the account Leo the Wolfie at this point. Quote, Hello daddy, how was your shitty day today? Please remember that you do not need to take care of your ass. Just fap away to your attention, senpai. I hope you like your ED page as well. Daddy, have a shitty day. You know I'm going to kill your entire family, right? Remove it and I may let you live. Or I can just sue you for slander. ED is a legal slander. What a nicely worded death threat there, buddy. Plus, I didn't made the ED page in the first place. I'm just a messenger, smiley face. Give me the person who made it. I will leave you alone if you do, unquote. The more he caused trouble, the more communities and users he harassed, the more attention he got and the more it became open season to fire back at him. But eventually he found himself an even bigger bout of drama involving the DA user and YouTuber at the time, the Fandom Menace 98. See, back in July of 2016, the Fandom Menace 98 started a petition to put fetish artwork on DA on the Mature Filter. The idea here being that new people that come to the site are not bombarded by the sheer amount of fetish content on the website, or those that simply do not wish to see fetish art at all can have the option to hide it with this Mature Filter. This caused quite the war, with many fetish artists hating the suggestion for obvious reasons. While many did agree with this change, and over 1,000 people ended up signing the petition to have fetish art hidden. Well, Tori really did not like this idea and wanted to stop this petition and the Fandom Menace 98 any way that he could. And so he decided to upload and send the Fandom Menace 98 a ton of fetish porn, particularly of the fecal matter variety, among many other unspeakable things. Tori didn't stop there though, as they would eventually falsely copyright claim Menace's videos. Man, what is it with cringe people from DA doing this type of stuff? Well anyway, the Fandom Menace decided to quit his petition because he was getting so sick and tired of being harassed by Tori. So he ended up closing his petition for good because Tori was just that persistent and scary to him. But it doesn't stop there either. Remember that guy Deviant Cridge we discussed earlier? Well I guess Tori wasn't a fan of that guy making fun of fetish art and the like. And so Tori somehow hacked Deviant Cringe's YouTube account deleted his Gmail account and the like, and a lot of people for obvious reasons got pretty pissed off at him for this. And even if DeviantArt Cringe was eventually able to get his channel back and email back, this showed that Tori had no boundaries, no limits to what they would say or do to someone that they dislike. However, all these things, while certainly awful and truly pathetic behavior, is honestly kind of nothing compared to what comes next. Fair warning, this is about to get leagues far worse. So randomly one night, Tori decides to invite his loyal fans and haters alike into one of his Google Hangout conversations, which had happened a few times in the past and often gave trolls the chance to interact with him directly. Everything was going as you might expect, until suddenly Tori turned on his camera and started to pleasure himself before his audience, including stroking the South Pole and shoving a chain up his own ass, among other things. Now bear in mind that this was already messed up as is, 
But then you must add into context that Tori at the time was a minor, and thus he had just streamed you know what to his trolls. But I'm so sorry to say that this isn't even the worst part of this Google Hangout meeting. What happened next is Tori brought his pet dog out on stream and began to partake in acts of bestiality. And I will spare you the gruesome details. But those who witnessed the event were utterly shook to their core. Eventually this event came out and was shared around. With Tori now going from a DeviantArt user harasser to an internet stalker of sorts, a hacker, to finally an animal abuser. People were appalled and got his accounts banned again. But of course, Tori, or should I say his real name, Sam, always just came back. Through the use of VPNs, he was able to never truly be banned from any space. Tori is an awful human being, and one of the most infamous DA users for obvious reasons. They would later come out as trans, and, well, nothing really changed. They pretty much just stirred up the same shit that they did, and the same type of drama they did back then. However, I'm not exactly sure what they are up to these days. I tried to look into it, but it came up short. Usually Kiwi Farms would be a good resource for finding more info on such insidious figures as these. But the only thread I was able to find was one that was locked due to, at the time, it being started in 2016 and Tori was a minor at that time. No one at Kiwi Farms is interested in documenting a child, which is more than fair enough. But for that reason, we really don't know where they're at now. They could be dead for all we know, but one could only hope that they are away from the internet and away from animals. But that, unfortunately, isn't realistic. There isn't always a happy ending or satisfying conclusion to these types of tales. Truth be told, Tori could still be to this day harassing others, as well as hurting animals, or worse. I suppose there is a sort of bliss in the ignorance of truth, but I find that ignorance only ever gives me blisters. Come, now that we've wandered through the main corridor, it's time we went down the hall. It's a scantily lit place, a kind of ongoing little maze of halls and dusty pieces of art adorning its walls. It's away from the glamour and glitz and popularity, a home for those more familiar here, looking for some more deep cut history or lesser known artists and tales from the deviants that have come to make their mark in this place. This is the beginning of the deviant rabbit hole, and sure to be a lot of fun. So let's get going. Caw Hypnosis. Starting off on a particularly strange note, this is kind of a break off from the normal hypnosis fetish community. That is, generally speaking, a fetish around people being hypnotized to do uh, well, I guess whatever the hypnotizers want them to do. But this one centers around Ka from the Disney film The Jungle Book, and how he's able to hypnotize characters in the film with his gaze. And yeah, there are hundreds of pieces of art of characters being hypnotized by Ka, usually in rather revealing positions. Which is, um, pretty random and rather uh, peculiar, you know, you might say. But it does once again present itself as a possible origin point for where people with a hypnosis fetish in general might have first gotten the idea in their head for said fetish. It again coming from something they watched from a young age. Obstinate Melon. Melon is a user well over 1 million page views with their claim to fame being their comic book version of Final Fantasy VII. To be clear, Melon has taken on the grueling task of covering the entirety of the Final Fantasy VII story in comic book form, all the way from Crisis Core to Advent Children, with 440 pages to their name thus far, and the project having been worked on since 2010. I took a quick glance over some of it, and I must say that the art style is quite charming, but even more charming is the tongue-in-cheek writing with the story following the events of the games, 
but with a twist of comedy. Sephiroth? Uh, um. Hello. I see you've opened the door. Well done. Did you know about this? This doesn't show the way to the promised land at all. It shows something far worse. <laughs> It is the wisdom of the ancients, can't you see? Not really. Please explain. It means I am becoming one with the planet. That is not a satisfactory answer. That is why you are all fools. You've never even thought of becoming one with the planet. All the spirit energy, all the wisdom, the knowledge. I will meld with it. I will become one with it. Sephiroth, what is this conversation? Like, seriously, what the fuck? If you cannot see, then you are blind. The way lies here. Stop with this planetary gatekeeping and just tell me the answer- The answer is death. But do not fear. It is through death that new spirit energy is born. You will live on as part of me, part of the whole. I want you inside of me, Sung. Nobody had better write a fanfic about this, okay? Great stuff. The comic has slowed down a fair bit though, but all the same, I definitely say it's worth a read. Especially if you're a giant Final Fantasy VII fan like I am. Nazak. Nazak is a fairly controversial artist on the site. He is most well known for his anime inspired series debunking numerous myths regarding Islam and the Muslim faith as a whole, but much of his profile is dedicated to Islam in general and what it means to be a member of that faith. His anime inspired style mixed with the Islam themes and perspective makes this account very eye-catching both for uh, positive and negative reasons. Obviously when religion is involved you always have people debating from every which side possible, but the larger form of controversy isn't actually from the general Islam topics but more so his recent work going into the Israel-Palestine debate with uh, a pretty hard anti-Israel stance. Again, I don't plan on talking about issues that require more time to discuss than an iceberg topic, but obviously this has gotten the page even more attention and only spurred more debate on this near 1 million page view count account. Chantelin. Taiwanese artist Chantelin is one of the many giants on the platform. Having been on the site for well over 13 years, their gallery at first glance seems to just be a standard anime until you're greeted with a plethora of uh, an ungodly amount, truly, of impreg art. Certainly not the most well known, but definitely known enough to be the first results in any Google search for Impreg, which is helped by her doing art for well-known series like that of Black Butler, Tiger X Bunny, etc. Comment slash view bots. Like most platforms, DeviantArt is prone to bots being used for a variety of reasons. The most common use of bots being to artificially inflate view counts for the chance of being favored by the algorithm or impressing others with your fake view count, or both, I suppose. There are also general scam bots, catfishing bots, and crypto bots. Again, same as pretty much everywhere else. Warrior Cats Fandom Oh man, is this one ever a rabbit hole. Warrior Cats is a series of books by author Aaron Hunter, with a large presence on DeviantArt with ships, fan arts, fan fiction, and general fandom antics. And even though this is less of a DeviantArt thing and more a YouTube thing, I think it should also be noted that there is a huge amateur animation scene for Warrior Cats and it's been around since forever, basically. The book series itself began back in 2003 and has had new entries ever since then, with over 50 books in the series thus far, multiple sagas, a manga series, you name it. The series itself is about the adventures and drama of multiple clans of feral cats. Cats that have their own unique religions, wars, prophecies, powers, etc. There is apparently an expansive universe of world building, lore, and ever growing and dying cast of characters. All of which being cats. Sounds like a crazy fucking time. But regardless, the Warrior Cats fandom is huge, with content being made around it constantly. 
including OC cats and countless groups dedicated to role-playing as the different clans from the book series. I do remember coming across these folks a bit back in the day and thought the idea of a series about cats with powers fighting religious battles with each other sounded fucking sick, but I just never really took the plunge into it and still have yet to ever do it, especially as it's, well, so many books long at this point. But I've always found this fan base and this strangely dedicated and sometimes very dark Watership Down vibes fan base that comes from this book series to be a, a pretty cool side of DeviantArt and very interesting from the outside looking in. Dance Dance World Revolution. The Dance Dance meme is an animation meme featuring a character dancing with the color scheme of any given country which you can see here. This is mainly connected to the Hitalia fandom and got started when a DA user, Yume, posted the new well-known gif of APH America dancing to the song Positive Vibes, but being used for many other Hitalia characters following this. Toon E Guy. Time for some good old fashioned, super toxic, mega crazy, dumbass, petty internet drama. Toonie Guy's main claim to fame is his hatred for CGI animated films, particularly those from Disney as he believes it is killing 2D animation. Now I am an avid enjoyer and lover of 2D animation, way more than 3D myself. But sadly, there are people like this, like Toonie Guy, that take everything way too fucking far. Toonie Guy coined a conspiracy theory that Disney only specializes in 2D animation, yet the company is abolishing it out of existence. Why they're doing this? I don't know, but that's the theory. He's gone as far as harassing or sending death threats to Disney, animators, writers, directors, producers, etc because he's convinced of this conspiracy. This of course extends beyond the official Disney people and into general internet arguments as he attacks, harasses, and gets into heated arguments about 2D versus 3D animation, and generally acts like a huge dumbass. He also doesn't like new 2D anime shows either, uh, by the way, because they don't look like 80s or 90s cartoons or films. And this dude is still very active to this day, still doing this same exact song and dance because, uh, I guess he's got nothing better to do at the moment. It's a shame because I do agree that there is something magical about uh, Disney's 2D animated films that just never got quite captured in their more recent works. And Disney as a company is a company that I genuinely very much hate most of the time, especially what they're doing with all these live action remakes of all these classic films, kind of shitting on their past work. So I can kind of get the mindset behind someone like Toonie Guy, but there's a big difference between a normal uh, conversation about animation and bad company practices and not agreeing with an artistic direction and what have you, and being an annoying dweeb online who harasses random people over it because he's got nothing better to do. El Horo slash Pregnancy Captions An unusual genre of content regularly shared on DA is pictures of actual expecting mothers, usually pretty far along at that, with captions put on top of them. Now, captions pictures are sort of something that has been connected with this site for some time. And there is quite a few subgenres of this type of post. That being said, these ones connected with pregnant women usually have captions related to Vor pasted on top of them. You know, that way they can fantasize that these pregnant women are actually women that ate somebody whole. Because, uh, well, yeah. A pretty prominent user known for doing this interesting activity is one named El Horo or El Joro. I, I don't know. But he's not the first or even only one to do this. Many find these pictures to be little more than strange fetish fodder though, and more of an invasion and violation of privacy to take pictures of pregnant women and immediately make it fetish material, when the picture was never meant to be fetish material, and these said women never consented to these pictures being used in this way. But that certainly hasn't stopped quite a large fan base from doing it regularly anyway. Bonus entry, fart captions. This is just like the other one, but 
four fart fetish people. Usually it's just a picture of a woman bending over in some kind of risque position with captions alluding to her ripping ass and either punishing someone or being embarrassed by it or something like that. Sometimes it's even accompanied by a cartoony green cloud. Very charming, I know. Incest captions. I cannot show anything surrounding this for, uh, well, obvious reasons, but there has, and more than likely always will be, a lot of pictures of naked women and men on this site. And so these captions are usually put under a picture of said naked man or woman with a sort of role-playing context of it being someone's family member who took the picture. Disturbing, I know, but this shit actually gets even stranger. Bonus entry, abuse slash torture captions. This is exactly what you think it is. It's pictures of people usually either tied up or in a revealing position or knocked out with captions about what terrible fate is in store for them, with the captions usually putting you as the role of the abuser who successfully downed the victim. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you what type of fetishes that this feeds into, particularly ones where part of the roleplay is that the women are underaged. I'll leave it at that for now, but needless to say, this is quite the dark rabbit hole that only gets worse the further you go down it. Blufflepuff. Stepping away from cursed stuff for a moment, another relic of 2010 fandom and the My Little Pony fandom in general is Blufflepuff, an OC created by user MixerMike622, and with a sudden boom of attention and eyes on Fluff, a Tumblr ass blog and even a YouTube channel would be started featuring the OC. In particular, this video, the character bouncing to the song Pink Fluffy Unicorns Dancing on Rainbows, got quite a lot of views and attention. In other words, they were an OC so popular on DA that they expanded beyond it with a channel that has over 1 million subscribers. And while we're on the topic of My Little Pony stuff, Mortatwai. So this is one of those entries that really extended far beyond DeviantArt and into, again, general internet lore and meme culture. Mortatwai is the absurd pairing of Mordecai from the regular show and Twilight Sparker from MLP. Its origin is traced back to DA user Cartoons Lover 16 creating a group for the pairing and in 2012 user Blue Dog 444 posting the now iconic image of Mordecai and Twilight singing uh, Airplanes by singer B.O.B. The ship would reach meme status when TikTok user at Apple Crumwill posted a clip of the cover of the song over the art gartering mass attention. This along with growing interest in both regular show and MLP would cause the image to go viral all over Twitter and in late 2022 and eventually hashtag redraw Mortatwai was started with many artists redrawing the piece or creating new art entirely. It became pretty popular to cover this song as well and there's also fan animations and comics all made around basically this one image or even just the idea of these two characters being together. I suppose you might say it's a picture worth at least a thousand words, if not closer to a few hundred thousand by this point. Bonus entry, me kissing Fluttershy slash in real life MLP edits, as suggested by Alice slash Doggy NGT. So a rather interesting and actually fairly common type of image on DA, is that of in-real-life edits. That being pictures of uh, guys kissing or LARPing as being in a relationship with another character, and this particular case being MLP characters, such as this picture entitled Me Kissing Fluttershy by user MetalGriffin69 with this description. Quote, I invited my special some pony Fluttershy over. We both sneaked into my mom's room and I took a picture of myself kissing her. Fluttershy is my girlfriend. When I started kissing her, she blushed and then she wanted to cuddle with me. A 14 year old boy, which is me, has fallen in love with a pony named Fluttershy. Deal with it! 
unquote. This same user also had this piece entitled Me in Bed with Fluttershy, but this passionate pony-loving man was far from the only one to make these types of images. With pictures of guys taking ponies to prom, lying in bed, them in a uh, rather suggestive poses, or them just hanging out being a weird little Photoshop genre all in of itself. Now again, as I noted, this is not exclusive to MLP, and I think that you'll find that there are many pictures of guys with their waifus all over DeviantArt, be they furry waifus, anime waifus, video game character waifus, etc. All of them obviously living the best lives of their waifus. But then, there are some that decided that image edits just weren't quite enough. That they needed to be closer to their cartoon waifu in a way that was more tangible, real. Which brings us to our next entry, the Sally Acorn doll. Now, I once made a video about weird Sally Acorn related internet stories, but you really can talk about DeviantArt related stuff without this one eventually coming up. This image, along with the accompanying ones, have made their rounds on the internet, usually to the absolute horror of nearly everyone with how disturbing the doll looks, and how it appears that there are real bones holding this monstrosity together. The doll was actually created, and thus these photos were posted by DA user Grenadine. Now, I remember that the accompanying story, the uh, creepy pasta, if you will, behind these pictures, is that this man killed his ex-girlfriend and then boiled the flesh from her bones, to then Frankenstein them back together into this abomination. It's a scary story, but of course, completely fake. No, the real story behind this doll and the bones is far more mundane, even if it is still kind of creepy. These bones are actually made out of wood and seem to be handcrafted by Grenadine himself. Grenadine actually documented his progress in making this doll in all its core components showcasing in particular the jaws and teeth of the doll. Now, you might be wondering what this thing was made for. Why would this man make this creepy life-size version of Sally Acorn? If you are asking this question, then um, you clearly haven't been paying attention to the general theme of this iceberg. As I dive deeper into this man's photos of the doll, you can start to see a bit of a pattern here with the shot framing and the way the doll is posed. Oh, and look at that! The doll even has breasts that he made himself as well. He does note that creating this thing in his spare time has gotten him to learn a lot of new skills and allowed his creativity to flourish a bit. So hey, at least that's a bit of a positive. And look, this man seems to be a bit of a creative eccentric anyway. I mean, just look at this custom briefcase laptop he made and he even has a picture of his girlfriend as the wallpaper. Now that is what I call wholesome. Twilight Alicorn Controversy Alright, last MLP thing for a while. This one refers to a plot twist in the animated television show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, specifically in the season 3 finale, in which the character Twilight Sparkle transforms into an alicorn, that is a mixture of a unicorn and a pegasus. This caused a giant shit show with fans divided on if they liked or hated this creative decision. For some context, in the show's lore, alicorns are kind of like deities. They're usually royalty and are usually far more powerful than the average pony and from what I understand, are also immortal. So on one hand, some found this to be an interesting plot twist that could lead to interesting plot developments, while others thought that this gave the already powerful Twilight too much power and shook the balance of the main cast of characters, and might even make future conflicts far more trivial and could lead to Twilight becoming a bit of a Mary Sue type character, as far as power scaling goes anyway. I've never seen the show, so I have no idea who ended up being right on this debate. But either way, over on DeviantArt, it was a fucking pony battleground with groups being created for both of these sides. For both those who hated this choice 
and for those who trusted the creators of the show's general direction. Magic 2005 An artist who has now deleted most of their stuff, Magic is a Simpson artist who was active on DA around 2006 but didn't post art until 2012. The art they did post was mainly focused on the women of Springfield. Magic would post art revolving around Lisa Simpson mainly. The user officially retired from art in 2019, with all but 10 of his pieces being deleted for unknown reasons. Theories range from his art being removed for TOS violations to him simply deleting it himself for personal reasons. Leela Alicorn slash Laser Princess Leela Alicorn joined both DeviantArt and Tumblr back in 2015. Leela was transgender, a fact that would often come into conflict with her family, who didn't accept her for her gender identity. This would get so heated that her family would end up sending her to a Christian-based conversion therapy group with the intention of convincing her to reject her gender identity. As a means of coping, she would share her art on both Tumblr and DeviantArt, their art style being heavily influenced by animes like Dragon Ball and One Piece. Even with everything stacked against them, Leela's online personality and persona was that of a vibrant and bubbly person, eager to spread positivity, be it through comments responding to their art or posts on their Tumblr sending love and support to others. Sadly, this all came to a head when Leela's parents found out that they had been expressing an interest in boys and forbade them from engaging in any social media, as well as pulling her out of school effectively, shutting her off from everyone, including all those that supported them. This would be the final straw for her as she decided to take her own life writing a final note via her DeviantArt page, with many mourning the 17-year-old's tragic end, and drawing lots of art, usually with the words rest and power, of being present within the works. Suzer. Suzer, while seemingly unknown today, is the person behind the most famous creepypasta character ever, Jeff the Killer. It should be noted he created the character of Jeff and not the actual current story nor the iconic image of Jeff, but just simply the character. His rendition differs greatly from what Jeff is seen as today, with notable differences being that Jeff's last name is Hodek here, and his manner of becoming disfigured also differs quite a bit as well. Archive comments from around 2017 show Suzer was indifferent to the creepypasta community as he feels Jeff was just a slasher type character and he really didn't enjoy the horror community kind of taking it and doing what they want with it. But uh, while we're on that topic, bonus entry, creepypastas. You know, I just had to talk about this one. Well, many of you might have noted this back in my creepypasta iceberg series. If you're unaware, a ton of the most popular creepypastas written have come from DeviantArt rather than that of the Creepypasta wiki. Mainly because Jeff the Killer's slasher type characters were always the ones that got the most popular, at least amongst teens, and the Creepypasta wiki eventually had a policy against these types of stories since they were kind of overrunning the wiki at some point. Thus, DeviantArt became the main hub for this flavor of Creepypasta, including those like Tiki Toby, Nina the Killer, and Jason the Toymaker. Many Creepypasta OCs and Creepypasta related art also came from DeviantArt, and again, let me tell ya, when Creepypastas were at their all-time high in popularity, DeviantArt had a wave of Creepypasta character fan art seemingly everywhere, with many young artists coming up with their own Creepypasta characters, fanfics, OCs, and of course, Lots and lots of shipping wars. Kimboli 12 slash Chippendale tracing accusations. This very recent controversy on DeviantArt revolves around the Chippendale Rescue Rangers film. The film uses many characters from an unnameable amount of shows slash movies and games, uh, be them Disney or not with one such example being the ugly Sonic design from the original trailers for the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Twitter user Nimpadubs pointed out that in the background of a scene 
next to various well-known props of various characters in plastic bags, a render of Sora's hair is seen. But the thing about this render is that it was actually a stolen vector from DeviantArt user Kimboli12, as seen here for reference. This seems pretty random since there are plenty of official renders and pieces of art of Sora that could have been used or traced over, I suppose. Why use a random DeviantArt user's artwork for this? I really couldn't tell ya, but I suppose it was probably a mistake, and they probably thought that this art was official? I suppose that is kind of a really roundabout accidental compliment, but uh, still a fuck up all the same. Project Cloverkit. In 2015, DA user Cloverkit was featured on a Tumblr blog highlighting bad OCs and fan art, as seen here. It's a Warrior Cats OC, and many found this to be in bad taste since Cloverkit was pretty young, and clearly still learning and just having fun. This resulted in the Warrior Cats fandom outpouring support for a budding young artist with the hashtag Project Cloverkit being used to draw fan art of their OC. But before you go thinking that this was a totally sweet act of kindness from a fan base, there was of course even more drama that stemmed from this, with many people eventually growing jealous that this random kid's OC was getting so much attention just for being featured on a bad art blog, and others saw this as rewarding bad art. So Cloverkit was receiving just as much harassment and criticism until Cloverkit themselves asked people to stop. Which is a shame since they really did nothing wrong other than just post art and never asked to be caught up in any of this dumbass internet pissing contests. But uh, such is the internet. Yaoi World. Many artists have become known for drawing BL or Boys Love, or as it's better known as, Yaoi. But a pioneer on DeviantArt for other Yaoi artists is Yaoi World. Having done well-known ships such as Spiderpool, Goretta, Sebastiel, etc. Many fandoms may not know her, but her art is quite influential in this sphere, and many might have seen their art before even if they never knew who made the art. They are also still extremely popular and active on DeviantArt to this very day. Andrea Silva 60 Italian artist Andrea Silva is an immensely talented historian most well known for his World War I series showcasing various factions from the Great War, with several pieces showing the various weapons, attire, etc. of each faction. D Major Boss D Major, real name Dundi, was a small time writer on DeviantArt, active around 2011 to 2013, with over 115 short stories on his account. Sadly though, at age 28, Dundee was diagnosed with cancer, and in 2013, his friend James took the DA to break the news to his base of fans. Quote, Hello, my name is James. I'm a friend of D Major, and he wanted me to inform all of you on his current condition. We have been friends since he was in first, and I was in second grade. Our friendship has been through some major moments, Goku versus Frieza argument, and like most friendships, we have had fun times. Now, with the onset of his illness, he has asked me to post this message to you all. Quando Omni Plunkus Morti. The following is in his own words. Recently, I was admitted to the hospital for the reason of having conducting a problem that was bigger than the cancer. I effectively caused myself to have it to where the doctor wanted to focus on my treatment than on the cancer. I spent well over a week inside the hospital, as most of you may know. Currently, I am back at home and it feels good. Then sadly, a few weeks later, James would come back to write one final update. Quote, Hello once again. This is James, and I have some sad news to report. Those of you who do not know, Monday, May 6, 2013, in the early morning, God called our humble wordsmith home, Dundi, the major boss, lost his battle with cancer. I don't know the details of the funeral arrangements, but as I learn more information, I will post it here 
on his account and my account. I feel privileged that I was one of the chosen few he called friend. Like most friendships, we had our moments. Some good, some bad. But all in all, we were close friends. No, we were brothers. And I thank God that he allowed Dundee to be part of my life. Talon Omalsi, unquote. Viewing his writing now shows a man who spent his last moments doing what he loved, and is a reminder of how short life is, and how you should never take it for granted. Do what you love, and never stop. A dangerous DNX slash dangerous. August 4th, 2000 marks the first submission ever on DeviantArt by user Dangerous. Unfortunately, Neither Danger or his work have ever been archived, making it lost media. Is what I would say if it weren't for user the British Artist 2003, being the Chad that they are, having recently re-uploaded the first piece ever uploaded to DeviantArt by the legendary user Dangerous, preserving internet history for us all, which you can see here. Again, as you might remember, the beginning of the website was all about GUI design work and stuff, so this lines up with that uh, pretty well. Pro ship slash anti ship community. While commonly associated with DeviantArt and Tumblr, the pro ship slash anti war can be traced back to DeviantArt. Pretty much someone who is a pro ship person may have character pairings that can be seen by some as a problematic due to age gaps, dynamics, a character being abusive, etc. While an anti opposes said pairing due to aforementioned problematic elements and usually has an issue with the person creating content around said ship. The movements have spawned into numerous subgroups. However, it can't be denied the scope of which these warring factions duke it out has changed greatly. It should also be noted that while some of this comes down to very specific types of pairings, especially ones that would be um, perhaps Pilifrek in nature, a lot of this also stems from general shipping wars. Like one example being from the Harry Potter fandom, where one person says Harry Potter should be with Hermione, and the other one thinks that they should be with Jenny. And while at the core, these two factions just disagree on whose these fictional characters should be with, it can turn into a strange morality war, where one side argues why it would be weird or morally bad for Harry Potter to be with one over the other. And thus, if you like said pairing, then that makes you a bad person that agrees with these types of things by extension. There's also those that only care if the ship is incest or straight up to you for the sense that's just kind of weird and don't really care about the abusive relationships and what have you since it's just fanfic stuff at that point while others care about literally everything and really do not like relationships or ships that seem to imply or advocate bad relationship stuff which can also get into personal things and further debates and yeah, it can get rather heated and crazy very fast. But it is very important to remember that all this stuff is still just fictional and that none of this really actually fucking matters even the slightest bit at the end of the day. But that won't stop people from screaming about it anyway, I suppose. Mothman64 Having amassed well over 1 million page views and having been active since 2009, to this very day, Mothman is a deviant art OG in every sense of the word. So what kind of stuff does this OG create? Inflation slash weight gain fetish art. <laughs> yeah, no comment. Princess Elizabeth 013. Princess Elizabeth 013 is infamous for her behavior and track record of harassment in the Sonic the Hedgehog community. She also appears to be very homophobic, insulting people left and right. Oh, and like any smart tart on the internet, gives out her personal information on the internet, such as, but not limited to, her full public address, throwing fits when people draw her OCs, and reporting them under the claim that they stole her character. 
and doxing user on DeviantArt, Jinx Drowned. There's a lot of lore and backstory to this, as you might imagine. She also made a video rant about the user which backfired, resulting in massive backlash and even when the rant was removed, mirrors of it still exist. Today I will be ranting about this attention perk named Jinx Drowned. To Jinx's crappy white knights. Why do you respect an art thief and a cyberbully who stole from Walt Disney Pictures? Stole from me, Stephanie Meyer, and Summit Entertainment alongside Marvel Comics, Hasbro. She also stole from Naoko Takuchi, the creator of Sailor Moon. And she also stole from Geek Entertainment, currently known as Cookie Jar TV. She also stole from DreamWorks SKG, now known as Dream. As you may know, that little attention prick is screwed up, even though she has been raised by her parents, which are actually homosexuals. And guess what, Jinx? Your parents are big, fat, stupid, and you're also a bitch as well, Jinx. You are nothing but a troll, an art thief, and a cyberbully combined into one. Also, you lost after a fictional character created by Ken Penders, who used to work at Archie Comics. You're also one of the reasons why I'm being cyberbullied, Jinx. It is you who should be cyberbullied. Not me. You're the troll, not me. You're making everyone else look like the bad guy, even me. Even though you're the bad guy, no one else is. Plus, you used your crappy white knights against us all, including me. I'm an angel, you're the demon. I'm the hero, you're the villain. I'm not a creep, you're the creep, and you're also a weirdo, and you're also a troll and a sonic fat. Guess what, you little faggot? Scourge will never date you or your character, Discord will never date your character Cassie, and the Dazzlings will never let you join their clique because you're a cyberbully and a brat. You had to fuck up everything, didn't you, you little attention whore? You're nothing but a little brat, you stupid bitch. I hope you and your white knights die in a fire, or better yet, burn in hell when Judgment Day arrives when God comes and takes us home. Now, that is what all of this is in short. But let me pull back just a little bit, because the deeper I looked, the more this particular story got crazier. Elizabeth actually became pretty well known on Encyclopedia Dramatica due to her initially creating a page for her arch enemy, Jinx Drowned, who seems to have their own history of online drama to be fair, but typically these types of people back in the day would post on Encyclopedia Dramatica about an enemy of theirs and forget that ED has no actual stake or side in any of this and is now going to direct their crosshairs at them as well. That's some real mutual destruction shit going on there in other words. She also just in general acted like a spoiled brat and fed into the growing base of people that were there to get reactions out of her at some point. Now sadly a lot of this stuff is lost to time there's pieces of it here and there on Encyclopedia Dramatica and from other people's videos and whatnot, but basically she was just kind of a really loud ass person that was causing a lot of silly, stupid internet drama. But I have heard that she has chilled out a lot since then, and that the worst of her antics came from when she was younger, a dumb teen just doing dumb, stupid stuff and has since seemed to have moved on beyond it. Which I of course always applaud because even when you act like a total crazy person on the internet, so long as you didn't do anything truly unforgivable, I think there is always a chance for redemption. Mainly by just getting off the internet and taking a long ass break. Which they seem to have done, so a good on them. But still, the ghosts of what was once a crazy DeviantArt user still very much exists as relics of the past to this day. Malzor. Chilean artist Malzor's art style immediately pops out as it's fairly evident that they were a fan of Dragon Ball and other 90s anime. But among other things, they seem to be a pretty popular fetish artist, mainly focusing on Vor and other belly-related kinks featuring their various OCs and characters like those from Dragon Ball, Hunter x Hunter, and Teen Titans, etc. Metro Designs Ryan Grant Long, or his online handle Metro, is a fairly small digital artist with a large catalog of art featuring various historical figures who were believed, or at least some theorized to be, homosexual. And thus his art often pairs them together in what I suppose 
one could call historical yaoi shipping fan art. Bonus entry, Anria 2002, as suggested by Hex Maniac Hannah. Anria 2002 is a rather infamous Naruto fan and DeviantArt user, with over 4 million page views on their account. However, their main claim to fame is that she would come to scam a ton of people out of commissions, as in she had commissions opened, had people pay her for her art, and then she would just never actually make the art. This, as you might imagine, would eventually come to bite her back in the ass though, as many started reporting and making it known about her scam. Her once again popular page becoming a breeding ground for anger, as she was a clear example of an artist scammer. And while her page is mostly abandoned these days, if you were to look at her pay, you would see that her profile status says refunding, and that there are plenty of posts on her page about refunding people their money. And you might be under the impression that she did eventually refund everybody and then take her leave from the internet as she should with her last post being from March 25th of 2018. However, this is actually not the case, as DA user Soccer Akil notes in this comment written on December 6th of 2022 about this issue. Quote, This is infuriating. It's been a decade. So many people have still yet to be refunded. She's inactive and apparently has even stopped answering her own friend who was helping her. Her kids are grown. She has a husband who works too. I came across her new Facebook page and last time that was updated was on October 30th of 2022 and went to check more on her pictures. Now, I'd say by now I give up waiting for the art but the refund I'd still fight for it. Not just because hard earned money but in her own Facebook shows, she had money to eat lobster, big ones in fact, she had money to buy Animal Crossing, and on another post, she seems to be getting a tattoo or her hair done, in which, let me highlight, getting your hair done and maintaining it is a bit of money, money that could be added to the refund budget if there's any still. I'm saying this because she is constantly seen with red hair or highlights. I don't know, I might be adding more salt to the wound, but it is very annoying that refunds are not being done in order and or being promised and never sent. Her kids are grown now, shown in her Facebook. She seems to be having an okay life and it's been a decade now. Why aren't most of her commissioner being refunded yet? She's a scam. It's very sad. I used to admire her." Unquote. Yes, it would seem like most scams of this type any goodwill that the artist originally had or tried to maintain by refunding people was eventually thrown out the window along with their morality as they took the money and ran. B. Jekker Garuken Swedish furry artist B. Jekker is one of the OGs of the platform, having been around since 2011. They are known for both their original comic series Vamp in Nothfjör, I don't know if I pronounced that right, I'm sorry, Saga, which they described as a historical fantasy comic set in uh, the 10th century Scandinavia, but plot centered around a looming civil war, as well as an Undertale reversal AU, uh, that is an AU where things are uh, reversed, and this one being where the monsters are humans and the main character is a monster instead. Rika Kitty, yet another OG of the platform and yet another primarily impreg fetish centered account, though they also make general Disney fan art as well. Quile's Art, Quile's Art is a bizarre mixture of social commentary and porn. First and foremost, the artist does art mainly revolving around uh, the ills of society, or at least the ones that they take issue with, many of which get shared around places like Facebook a fair bit apparently. Some of it is what you might call boomer tier low hanging fruit, while others are just a bit more controversial or perhaps may ring true for others. I can't really showcase their art since even if the nudity is mostly censored or obfuscated by stuff in the artwork, 
it does still kind of cross the line for what I think I can get away with showing on YouTube. That being said, much of his art revolves around religion as a means of control, which is certainly a topic that is beyond the scope of an iceberg centered around an art hosting website. But let's just say he makes the kind of art that you just know a terrible bad faith argument about religion and politics is going to be found underneath. Some of their art is also just straight up nudity with a slight political edge as well, which can come off as uh, quite grotesque in certain contexts. I suppose their art is fine on a technical level, but it is just mostly nihilistic edgy stuff at the end of the day, and it's just not my cup of tea personally. Olympic Dames. Amassing over 2 million pay views and well over 8.5k watchers, Olympic Dames boasts the title of one of the most popular pregnancy kink artists on the platform, and one of the oldest artists on the platform too, having joined back in 2004. You know, I'm starting to notice a bit of a interesting theme going on this tier. Speculative Biology slash Evolution Community Speculative Biology slash Evolution is the practice of envisioning the characteristics of certain animals had they evolved differently, or had they been in a different environment. And of course, with DA being an art platform, an entire subculture around imagining all the ways nature can vary is an unsurprising addition, ranging from creating entirely new species to a haunting look at humans had they lived on Mars. The speculative community is a very creative and interesting subset of the site, especially since before this was even a thing on DeviantArt, there were actually several books with pictures in the past that had been created around this topic, including the 1981 book After Man, A Zoology of the Future, or the 1988 book the New Dinosaurs, and Alternate Evolution, all of which are pretty damn cool and again, full of interesting ideas on where animal evolution could theoretically go. This is definitely one of those sub-communities that, while I only recently learned about them over the last year or so, definitely caught my interest and I think are super duper cool. Pepper Spot Sunshine slash Jello Apocalypse Accusations Immensely popular YouTuber, animator, Yellow Apocalypse is a guy who needs little to no introduction, with his series So This Is Basically and Welcome To being quite popular at the time. And he even made a Welcome To DeviantArt video like 11 years ago talking about a few of the things that we've been talking about today. But uh... Uh, not this particular thing. In 2020, Jello would tweet at someone with many of the comments alluding to past rumors regarding him having a secret fart fetish account. These would immediately spread like wildfire as more and more people found an account under the name of Pepper Spot Sunshine that bears some similarities to Jello's style of art featuring fart fetish art of various characters. It should be noted that as of now, these are still rumors and nothing has been confirmed outright. But it does look pretty suspicious, and as Jello has gotten into more controversy over the years, it has become a bit of a meme to joke about his supposed fart fetish account. Nads6969 Nads is arguably one of the most well-known and hated art tracers on the platform, with a record going back 10 years, with 11 DMCA notices filed against her. She's gotten into some real legal trouble for her theft. See, Nads6969 is a bit of a lol cow with an ED article and everything to boot, as well as a deviant cringe video at that. There is apparently at least 40 different people Nads6969 had stolen art from over the years, and when called out for her actions, she usually either defaults to, well, I don't like calling it tracing, it's just the way I work, making excuses like she's depressed or going through stuff, which is kind of funny because that would mean she's been depressed and going through stuff for fucking 10 years, or just hiding all negative comments sent her way. Truly silly, goofy, goober behavior. Her account did eventually get banned for her behavior though online as well as her alt, 
and she seems to have abandoned her Twitter and all other forms of social media after she was thoroughly caught and there really was no escape at that point. There is also a Tumblr blog titled A Shrine to the Queen Mother of Tracers which documents all the works she traced over and stole from others over the years. Nedley Clan, a very prominent member of the Warrior Cats fandom who made quite a lot of fan art around the series. Ned tragically passed away in 2022 after a long battle with cancer. Her artwork and animations received tens and thousands of views daily, with fans pouring in support, be them old or new. Even to this day, people still visit her page to pay their respects. Lily Sukia. This user primarily creates Avatar The Last Airbender fan art. They are also quite popular for their very striking and detailed art focusing around East Asia, from various dynasties of China to Edo era of Japan, and they split between North and South Korea through the tribes of Vietnam, the hairstyles of East Asia predating westernization, and even a look at the languages of the region and their evolution, as well as a general look at historical fashion. All these things makes Lily Sukia's page quite an interesting look if you're interested in these topics. The Big Claudia Amendment. So this entry was originally about this Italian war artist who goes by the online handle of Big Claudia and was basically me saying, ooh, gross, yet another vor artist for about 30 seconds or so, and then moving on. What this entry is now dedicated to is the strange spiral of drama this user caused to my channel a couple of months ago. To be brief, sometime after the part of this iceberg where Big Claudia was featured in, she had entered my Discord server and jumped into the voice chat and was upset I had, according to her, had gotten lore about her vor or C wrong, or that it wasn't quite up to date. I frankly didn't care since I said almost nothing about her or her OC besides the fact that they exist and they were a self-insert of sorts. Which from what I gathered they did not enjoy me saying that they were a self-insert because they uh, had argued that they were not a self-insert or something like that. Honestly from what they had argued it sounded kind of like semantics. They then provided me this page where they had all their up-to-date information on their characters and themselves, which they seemed to be implying they wanted me to include in a amendment to this video, which to me came off as rather strange a request and seemed to be the sort of thing someone desperately wanting attention would ask for, especially considering there are many entries on this iceberg by which I go into long spiels for near 20 or 30 minutes over the interesting drama and sorts of a individual or community. But they were just one of the many that got a very small section, since I have to be picky and choosy over which entries I put more time into than others. Otherwise, we run the risk of this all becoming rather redundant. There is, after all, only so many times I can talk about a Vor artist before it all starts to become, well, rather the same. So this already made me rather suspicious of her intentions. But also, due to the type of art that she produces, and how it often involves characters who are minors being Vored, or characters from kids' cartoons in particular being Vored, I didn't feel comfortable having her hang around in my Discord server. So after the conversation I had with her, I made the choice to kick her from said server, since I asked them if they intended on staying here now that I've gotten the info from them about their OC. And they said yes, which again I didn't feel comfortable with. Big Claudia didn't like the fact that I kicked her from the Discord server, however, and their response was to falsely copyright strike that video featuring her in it, in an attempt to try and get revenge mess up my income, and I guess generally speaking because they are an immature individual. I of course immediately counterclaimed and made this information public to everyone on all my socials, since I was sure many would be confused where that part of the iceberg had gone, as well as to publicly make clear that I wasn't about playing this sort of silly game, especially over Vor OC lore or being butthurt over being kicked out of a Discord server. Since again, even if I disagree and do not enjoy the type of content that they produce, I would never try and mess with their livelihood, which it seems they were perfectly willing to do with me. Many of her followers did come to her defense during this, with many of them claiming that I had lied about Big Claudia in the video, 
or slandered her, to which I asked for an example of, and none of which could provide me with a single example. Big Claudia also seemed to get very upset that I made this issue public, despite the fact that they publicly copyright striked my channel. Again, they didn't copyright claim it and have the video get taken down, they copyright struck it, which if I have three of those on my channel at one time, my channel is gone. It also limits what I can do temporarily on the platform during the time a copyright strike is in action, to which I pointed out to them, and they then turned the debate over if I had used her copyrighted material without her consent, which then soon broke down into them admitting that she didn't have any legal grounds to actually copyright strike me, and that nearly none of them actually understood what copyright even was, since they were associating copyright with OC lore. But ultimately, that it didn't matter, because I was just a big meanie who deserved this, and that there was no other way for me to get them to listen to them. So, in other words, they were having a big hissy fit because they weren't getting their way, and so they decided to have an even bigger hissy fit over not getting their way, in the hopes of me paying attention to them. Well, I certainly did, and then they seemed to not enjoy it so very much when I did. Big Claudia themselves also began speaking up and eventually turning the conversation to this big gaslight, trying to say that my audience is mainly made up of minors, and that I'm exposing them to explicit content by showing her content, despite number one, her claiming that her content is not explicit, two, the fact that statistically this is also untrue, as you can see here, but furthermore, if she really cared about such things, then she would never make fetish material based around children's cartoons, because that is always how minors discover this sort of content, through the mistake of greasy individuals turning what is children's media into their own disgusting material, and then uploading it online for all to see. If you want to have that conversation, we can have it, but this is yet again another angle her and her followers tried to use on me in the hopes of saving face and was so clearly a disgusting, backhanded, snaky move on their part. You know you're in the right when you constantly keep changing the reason for why you did something. So desperately trying to find the moral justification for your bad actions. Big Claudia then, in what is without a doubt one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen someone do online, used her alt on Twitter and pretended that it was being run by a lawyer she hired, and said they were looking into legal action over this, as if I wasn't going to notice immediately that this was clearly her ult, and that no lawyer worth their weight in salt would ever pursue something like this. Number one, because we live in different parts of the world, her in Italy and me in America, but also because she has no legal action for this copyright strike. And she knows this, but I guess she wanted to make it seem like she did, and tried to spook me by saying that she had a lawyer she already hired, but didn't even take the time to make a new Twitter alt for that. Tis all very, very silly, and I really can't make this shit up. But all the same, I called her and her lawyer's bluff, and come two weeks later, after being given ample time to pursue legal action, my video was then put back up the copyright strike removed, and Big Claudia taking a big fat L. So I decided to add this section in since no one else has ever tried to do this to my channel before, especially not over something so petty at that, and I want to make sure to warn others about this individual. There is apparently a lot of extra drama and disgusting shit that this person has been involved in, according to other people that have since reached out to me about them, and it seems that if nothing else they have a history of extremely disturbing and bad behavior, as well as trying to mess with people who disagree with them, shall we say. However, I will not be getting into all that here since I don't wish to waste any more of my or your time on them or the insipid dullards who tried to go to back for her. But all the same, I would say as a general note to be weary about doing business with this person or associating with them since it's clear they were willing to go to for the nuclear option over very petty issues. They caused me a bit of a headache for a moment there, but unlike their filthy art, I'm not so easily swallowed whole. But all the same, I certainly wouldn't wish their brand of insanity on anyone else in the future.
Dr. Worm. Hey look, another Vore content creator. This one being more recent but very popular addition to the scene. Worm has made a name for themselves as an amateur animator and Vore artist extraordinaire. And uh, speaking of, Vore fan comics. Probably no one on this iceberg can claim to have as varied a resume of Vore stuff as Vore fan comics. What separates them from the rest of the Vore artists is that they'll do seemingly anything and everything Vore related. Want to see a mailbox Voring a person? Want to see breasts Voring a person? A giantess? Etc. If you can think it up, they've probably drawn it. Or they'll probably uh, draw it for you for the right price. NNN4462. Though an artist, NNN's more known for the sheer number of pieces she's commissioned of her persona. Seemingly almost every major vor and pregnancy and belly inflation artist has done art of her persona, with like 90% of them being mentioned on this iceberg. I guess you could say that she's really expanded the reach of her OC. <laughs> Are you getting tired of me talking about Vor yet? <laughs> oh, well, that's uh, that's unfortunate for you. Chibi Rose. Chibi is another art tracer and one that's also racked up quite an impressive record against her with nearly a decade of tracing under her belt and a video by the always annoying to listen to Daft Pina, explaining slowly the drama that she got herself into. This whole thing being far more dramatic because, well, it's in the Sonic fanbase. LWG Artist Slash Stump Humpers. Prepare yourself for this one, because believe it or not, we're about to take a dive yet further into the peculiarity of internet fetishes. An acrotomophile, or Stump Humper, LWG has created hundreds of pieces of art of women who are amputees. For a bit more detail, acrotomophilia is a paraphilia in which an individual expresses strong sexual interest in amputees. From what I've read on this topic, acrotomophiles' reasons for this attraction may be tied to the amputee's stump perhaps being seen as a phallic object which can be used for sexual pleasure. I'm not really sure how, but maybe I'm just not creative enough for the answer to that question. The more obvious and more perhaps creepy reason for acrotomophiles to enjoy the idea of amputees is the notion of dominating the amputee. Notably, if they are literally a no-limbs person, or at least very few limbs person, and thus have total control over them, and may also enjoy the idea of taking care of them possibly as well. Though very much disturbing with and without context, the anatomy and attention to detail in LWG's art is quite nice, I suppose. The amputee fetish community on DeviantArt is quite large and branches off into just an absurd amount of other fetishes, making for very uncanny results. Doogie McCoy Doogie, real name Douglas, was never the most popular artist, nor was he particularly well known in the community. But his profile was what DeviantArt embodied best, just sharing your art and happily encouraging others. As stated by a tribute from a close friend, quote, He was a lovely and funny man, and he drew lovely and funny people along with lovely and funny animals, all very much alive and colorful. He'd save up to go to cons and diligently show his most recent work, of which there was always plenty. A cartoonist he admired was Sergio Argonez, Scott Shaw, and Stan Sakai. He even went so far as to ask for advice." Unquote. Said friend goes on to recall when working an event and a cartoonist was desperately needed with Doogie happily helping. Quote, After the event, there was milling and much signing of autographs. I was scribbling my name on program books, comics, IOUs, and confessions of sex crimes when Doogie politely made his way 
up to say thanks for his inclusion in the game. He muttered something about how he hoped he hadn't embarrassed himself, since he wasn't in the same league as the others. I told him, nobody thought that. Up there, you were just one of the six good cartoonists. Just then, as if to prove my point, something happened. Something small, but it's a moment I'll never forget, and I'd bet my house Doogie never did either. There was yet another kid standing there with a program book and a pen, and Doogie assumed he wanted my signature. He stepped back and waved the kid towards me, but the kid turned to Doogie and said the most wonderful thing. He said, no, I don't want his autograph, I want yours. Doogie would unfortunately pass away in 2013. Taco Child slash Age Regress Community. DA user Taco Child is an age regressor, that being someone who draws art depicting either themselves or others OCs slash personas as babies. Now, this is tied to a much larger genre on DA, in general that connects with several other communities, such as ABDLs or adult baby diaper lovers, which I suppose are pretty similar to age regressors, but I've heard in some cases that age regressors take it a bit more seriously than ABDLs, but either way, ABDLs are also known for posting pictures of themselves and their OCs in diapers, be they babies or adults. And both groups ultimately LARP around as a baby in a diaper. There is also a pretty similar but still furry variation of this community known as diaper furs. Now, the reason one might enjoy drawing, wearing, or generally being associated with diapers in this way can range rather wildly, with some in said community using it as a sort of coping mechanism from past trauma, especially with those that might have happened to them from a very young age, or just coping in general. Some find comfort in returning to this innocent time, especially when it might have been taken away from them early in life. On the other hand, there are also plenty to find immense sexual pleasure from the act, ranging from the general idea of wearing diapers, to the whole, well, crapping and pissing yourself angle of it, to the possible humiliation fetish angle of posting oneself in baby attire, to finally, and perhaps most disturbingly, those that find babies, uh, well, I think you get where I'm gonna go with that. While obviously not everyone who engages with or creates this type of art and media is of this ilk, I'd be lying if I didn't say it rings some alarm bells in my brain when I see it. Particularly with some of the stories I've heard of people being groomed in this community. In particular, adults talking to minors and convincing them it's a good idea to wear the diapers and all that other stuff. But, uh... That topic, I believe, is best saved for later. But regardless, the artwork for this particular topic is plentiful, and there are thousands of pieces dedicated to this subculture, fetish, community, whatever you want to call it. Simply Lemmy. On December 9th, 2009, the 100 millionth piece of art was posted onto DeviantArt by user Simply Lemmy. And to celebrate, staff awarded them a lifetime core membership. And yeah, that's pretty cool. Voracious Moga. Now deactivated, Moga is one of the most well-renowned Vor artists on the platform, purely for the level of detail he throws into every piece. His speciality seems to be having the prey, so to speak, visibly outlined with the pred's stomach, making for some very uncanny results. The Evangelion-themed stuff really, really kills my soul to see, if I'm being totally honest. But, evidently, Vorphiles eat this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> get it. <laughs> anyway, he had tens of thousands of watchers before shutting his account down and moving to a website called Ikas, as well as having a pretty successful Patreon. I'd never heard of this site till now, so I decided to take a little skulk around the place, mainly because it looked really old school. And, well, it seems Ikas or Ikas Portal is a website for hosting art and the like, in a similar fashion to DeviantArt but in a much more old-school layout that does seem rather cozy, having been around since 2005. Well, 
I would say that, but I'll be honest, when I looked at the main categories of the site, that being Vor, General Porn, Vor Roleplay, Vorcraft, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't quite think this community is for me. In fact, while at the top it says for artists and writers of all kinds, I'm pretty sure this is just for Vor artists and writers of all kinds. I wish I mean, fair enough I suppose. Nothing wrong with having your own little community website. Even if I personally find Vor as a whole to be pretty weird, pretty strange, pretty, uh, cringe, and, uh, just a wee bit gross. Um, I feel like this iceberg has really forced me to face this art in every sense of the word. I've seen so much Vor art at this point, of various art styles, and look, if you're into that stuff, fair play. I'm glad that you enjoy it. But I must say, the concept of a person swallowing another person whole is not something that I would have figured so, so many, 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 many people are dedicated to. But here we are. Now, having seen hundreds of pieces of war art, I can proudly say that, uh, I don't get it still. But hey, more power to ya, I suppose. Ranter community. The ranting community includes numerous subsets of YouTubers who do general commentary on drama, art, and general stuff relating to DeviantArt. I've already talked about a few of those ranters in this iceberg already, but one that I kind of dropped the ball on and should have talked about a little earlier by now is Bonus Entry, Solar Sands. Originally, he was best known for his browsing DeviantArt, and in a nutshell series of videos. Solar Sands became well known for looking at and showcasing bad art, critiquing art, and just generally speaking, he became one of, if not the most popular content creator of this kind through this content. Now these days he's doing much more higher effort and well-produced video essays, but still on the topic of art. So it's clear that he does have a passion for this topic and just kind of pivoted into some more interesting topics these days. I've never personally seen much of his stuff, but he is definitely an important member of this community and the history of DeviantArt and how it's discussed online as a whole. Bonus entry, Jack Stoney. Definitely a far lesser known member of the DA Ranter community, Jack was once making similar content to that of Solar Sands, a browsing DA, ripping into art, critiquing OCs, etc. However, eventually he fell out of that type of content. Oh, and also I suppose it would be kind of prudent to point out that uh, before his channel went by Jack Stoney, which I assume is just his actual name, he used to go by Jack Coon. And it seems almost all of his videos were deleted long ago. I'll be honest, I was there back when this stuff was going down because I did watch a fair bit of Jack Stoney stuff right before he kind of stopped making content. But it's been a few years by now, so I don't remember all the details of his eventual uh, purging of his content, but I do kind of remember Jack basically just not feeling good about shitting on others' content anymore, and he tried rebranding his channel a few times and a bunch of other stuff, and then he just kind of ended up deleting everything and starting fresh a few years later, after several videos of him kind of being very honest about his depression and a lot of other addictions and issues that he had in general. These days, however, if you go to the Jack Stoney channel, you'll notice that he's now producing music. Still with that iconic, uh, raccoon icon. And it seems like now he's doing much better for himself, so a good on him. Crystals1986 Crystals1986 is known to both the MLP and Homestuck fandoms due to his unique art style and seemingly fetishistic descriptions he'd use for captions. The most notable features of his art were the long, almost inhumanly long fingers of the characters and the use of healing crystals, which definitely give these pieces a very strange vibe. It's believed by some that the user suffered from Marfan syndrome and used art as a means of venting about his condition. Though as far as I could tell, this was never fully confirmed. Marfan syndrome being an inherited disorder, by the way, that affects connective tissue. 
The fibers that support and anchor your organs and other structures in the body. Marfrin syndrome most commonly affects the heart, eyes, blood vessels, and skeleton, and often people with this condition are tall and thin with unusually long arms, legs, and fingers and toes. Their other claim to fame being this uh, fan troll, Handia, with her becoming a bit of a meme for obvious reasons. Prison Suit Rabbit Man. Hey look, it's another popular fetish artist. This one having been on DA for over 17 years and has over 16 million page views, that's fucking massive. And uh, they make super big, fat, big belly, round ball men and women art. Lely Gaia. Lely Gaia, sometimes referred to as Truth Lely Gaia, is a rather notorious art thief for love for the Song of the Hedgehog series. Uh, one character in particular, that being Shadow the Hedgehog, who she is well known for shipping herself with. Sadly, most of her art and accompanying YouTube channel have been wiped clean from the web, but she did cause enough of a fuss to get a small ED page, it would appear, for her past antics. Biting Pair of Salamanca the Biting Pair of Salamanca was posted to DeviantArt on February 27th of 2006 by user Ursula Vernon, which went on to become an April Fool's event in 2017, with people able to get Biting Pair badges and a ton of art collaborating to make, well, this piece of art into various pieces and memes and stuff around the Biting Pair. Now, you might be wondering, why do this of all things? This, uh, this, this picture of a, of a pear with a mouth, why did it become so popular uh, that they got a whole April Fool's Day event around it 11 years later? And, uh, well, it's cause it's the Biting Pair of Salamanca, of course. No, but seriously, I think it's because this pair, this picture, this legendary piece became very well known as a meme with the caption, LOL WHAT, that was kind of used as a, a reaction image for quite a long time back in the early internet. $20,000 Furry Commission YouTuber Izzy Z covered the whole fiasco in much greater detail, but that said, the basic rundown of this rather crazy story is a DeviantArt user by the name of Caravan bid $20,000 or over $20,000 for an original adoptable uh, of this creature. Yeah, remember how I said before that it was mostly younger users that bought into this whole adoptable thing? Well, I should have noted that that is still true, except for furries, who randomly always seem to have cash to spare for art for their furry OCs, general commissions, furry porn commissions, their expensive fursuits, etc. Kind of become a meme over the years, actually, that furries just seem to have an endless supply of money to spend on their furry-related content. Though it's not much of a mystery to me, a lot of furries work everywhere in the tech industry, and that shit gives you a lot of cheddar, as it turns out. Oh, but I digress. As it turns out, this purchase might have come from less of a user like Carafan just having a ton of money to spare, and more so from an actual state of mania due to user Carafan overdosing on medication that they were on at the time. The art they paid for sadly eventually came out rushed through the caravan, just wanting it to all be done and over with, while the community at large stood back in shock at what just fucking happened. And many of them were also very angry, they thought it took away from the legitimacy of adoptables, and some people thought that they should like deny the $20,000 because it just is this crazy? The person was on medication. There is a lot of debate back and forth about the whole thing. And again, it has since become a meme in both the art and furry and general community at this point. Oi Velo. Okay, so this one is, uh, strange beyond belief. Involves an internet troll slash crazy person and deviantart llamas. So, let's jump into it. So, from what I've gathered, the story goes like this. DA user Zeon the Second favorited one of DeviantArt users Ovelo's pieces of art to show that, uh, you know, he liked it. It's something lots of people do, you know, you can favorite other people's art. I'm sure Zeon the Second probably 
didn't think anything of it. But little did he know, favoriting Orvillo's art would be a grave mistake on his part. As what transpired next is Ovello would then come to his page and ask him to please give her a llama badge if he likes her artwork, or her photography more accurately, which Zeon thought was kind of funny and he asked her why, and her response was for him to not steal her art anymore if he's not going to give her a llama, which let me remind you, he didn't steal her art, he just favorited her art, liked it, etc. This would result in Orvello sending Zeon message after message after message, DM after DM, and a constant back and forth over the idea of favoriting something being the same as stealing, and how much she wants a llama badge from him, etc. Which again, let me remind you, a llama badge is something you can literally give out to everyone for free for basically nothing. But it also means that there's really no reason to get hung up on someone not fucking giving you one. It's, it, it's nothing, it's pixels. And I suspect as any rational fellow would at this point, Xeon began to find this whole situation rather humorous and silly. But eventually he got tired of the trivial game and just blocked her, simple as that. But the problem was, Orvella was rather persistent shall we say. And thus, she made an alt account to harass Zeon some more over this fucking llama badge. And so, he just blocked that one too. And then she made another one. And then he, you know, blocked that one. And then the next one. And 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 this crazy bitch made over a hundred alt accounts for a fucking llama badge! She also went out of her way to harass anyone who dared to help Zeon to try and reason with her. It was truly an endless game. However, in the end, her main account was eventually banned and from what I understand, she eventually just gave up after a while. But nonetheless, this is truly one of the most wild cases of someone not understanding how the site works, being entitled, having way too much time on their hands, and being completely unreasonable and insane. A truly remarkable combination, if I do say so myself, if it weren't so very pathetic. Anne's cat Morak? I don't know how to uh, read this one, but I'm going to refer to them as Cat from now on. While most of her antics took place on Tumblr, she still maintains a presence on DeviantArt, thus this entry. Another lolcal with an ED page to boot, she's most noted for being a, what many you might refer to as, a far-right radical MLP artist whose long ramblings have earned her much criticism. Her views are rather confounding, but also rather typical of this sort, from Holocaust denial to hating various groups of people, including but not limited to LGBT people, atheists, or people of other religions generally speaking besides Christianity, often referring to them as Christophobes, people who generally disagree with her, including other Christians who don't believe in everything the same way that she does, Jewish people, broadly speaking, etc. Due to her rather confrontational nature, she became quite an easy target to troll, as you might imagine. And thus, a lot of internet shenanigans both on her DA page as well as her Tumblr went down, with many baiting her into acting a fool, trolling her generally speaking, and catching her in lies as the rabbit hole only seemed to go deeper, as she was also rather narcissistic, with a massive victim complex to boot. A bad combination, truly. Oh, and also, I guess she likes the older generations of My Little Pony cartoon? The, uh, as the fanbase calls it, Gen 3 show, and seems to have a dislike for the Gen 4 show, which is the one that, like, everyone knows about and got popular and seems to be at war with the brony fandom over the whole thing, often creating art of Gen 3 ponies with a long text box about how they were actually better than Gen 4, and especially better than Gen 5, and how there's a bunch of myths and 
stuff about him being actually the best, and yeah. Cat is one of those people that give Christians a bad name, and while it seems people have since gotten bored of her, and from what I could tell, she might have calmed down a little bit since then, I've looked through their more recent stuff, and they definitely are still complaining about My Little Pony stuff, and still create art, animations, and write posts about said topic. But no one really seems to be interacting or paying attention to her anymore, so, perhaps after all the dust settled, there was nothing left for anyone to care about. Dark Lord Henry. Dark Lord Henry, or their current username, Hailstorm Productions, is, to put it quite simply, an infamous groomer and general boy outfit. One such example of this is when Henry began dating a 13-year-old girl when he was 17, about to turn 18. Said 13 year old went by the username of Goopy Kitten, though usually you will see Dark Lord Henry refer to her simply as Goopy. This included him drawing art of their uh, persona and him doing things, as well as the age difference being something as shown here that he very much focused on and fetishized. Now, according to him, this 13 year old who went by Goopy lied about their age and they eventually broke up shortly after. Which might sound fair, you know, he should have been more diligent, but maybe it was a mistake, you know? But uh, then right after they broke up, he proceeded to harass the girl who was now without a shadow of a doubt, he knows is 13 and make creepy videos of him killing them and their current partner at that time, as seen here. He then started to go crazy on his DeviantArt account, making this event art since people knew who he was and what he did at this point, playing the victim, stating that he wasn't a pedo, and then later complaining that his mom found out about his internet shenanigans and that she's harassing him for being himself. Now, uh, what do you mean by this? Writing posts about the age consent in their state, how females can't be pedos. Oh, uh, did I mention that Henry is a transgender man, a biologically female? Hmm, interesting. Uh, what did he mean by this? They've made multiple posts on DeviantArt and Discord about this topic, uh, continue to get more radical about pedophilia, create fetish art of Loud House characters who are kids, and also start integrating a real-life person into said fetish art by the name of Carno. Hmm, now what did he mean by this? And generally has been, and still is, a menace that should be avoided, and frankly, should be thrown in jail, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm sure someone this deranged is only going to continue to get worse and worse as time goes on. Certainly, someone to keep an eye on. Nick Keith slash Adventure Man. And for our final entry this tier, we have yet another locale of sorts, but this one at least is not so evil or insufferable, and it's more so just kind of interesting. Chances are you've either never heard of Nick, or you're subscribed to YouTuber The Grease Wizard, who has covered Nick quite a few times with many updates coming from his Lolcal Watch series. Either way though, Nick is an amateur animator, who's risen to a fair amount of infamy due to his striking similarities both appearance and personality-wise to the infamous Chris Chan. 
Much like Chris, Nick has crafted an original series called Adventure Man, made from other people's work. Adventure Man is the bizarre love child of various American dad assets and Yu-Gi-Oh and follows the titular Adventure Man, a recolor of Steve Smith from American Dad and his many adventures. Family, we finally found out that our show has been renewed for two more seasons. And the show is back on again. Oh, thank heavens. I thought this show is going to end over some nasty dramas that happened a few years ago. I know, right? But hey, let's have some lamb chops for dinner, shall we? Lamb chops? No thanks. I'd rather eat duck for dinner. But bunnies don't eat ducks, because ducks are bigger than you. Yeah, but I'm bigger than the little ducks. So I can eat a little ducks for dinner. Jasper, it doesn't matter what size they are. You can't just eat ducks for dinner because you're just a stupid little bunny. Oh yes I can, because I want a duck for dinner. Feed me some ducks, bitch. No, 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 no. Now, I would give you some kind of plot summary or description of what generally goes on in this series, but uh, there's a bit of a problem with that in that uh, there is no plot to speak of at all. It's no joke, no, no messing around. There is absolutely no plot going on in this series. Each episode is just pure chaotic leaps to run the story along and are all near impossible to follow. Adventure Man, as of writing, has five seasons, along with a movie and even a reboot. Also recently, it seems that he started yet another new animated series, as in within the last five months or so, entitled Gangstersaurus vs. Terrorsaurus, which seems to have assets from the Land Before Time movies and other random stuff as seen here. Mr. Munchichin, I shall place you under arrest for stealing their fortunes. Do you hear me, Munchichin? Can you help me resist the nurses? Stop interfering my big business! Mr. Munchichin, I shall ask you once again. I'm placing you under arrest for shooting me in the face. Here's something for you to eat, Captain! Hey, hey! Now, speaking personally, there is something very fascinating about seeing the works of someone like Nick. And I mean that genuinely. It is chaotic, strange, bizarre, and has its own version of reality and logic working behind it. And while conventionally, yes, it is terrible, it's really bad, there's something about it that makes me hope he continues to make it. Nick also has had a pretty big DeviantArt page in the past, but he has since deleted it for unknown reasons. And that DeviantArt page went by Hexagon Diesel Bartz, which has since been archived. Here are some select pieces by Nick, including Evil Dinosaur, Max and Ruby in Prison of Hell, Mickey Mouse Friends Yu-Gi-Oh, and of course, who could forget, T. Thomas Magical Railroad. Man, this is starting to look strangely familiar to something. No small summary can do the absolute insanity of Nick Justice. He has an active Kiwi Farms thread, and again, Grease Wizard follows him pretty actively and has made several videos going into far more detail than I am here. But please do remember that as far as I or anyone else knows, Nick is just a guy creating stuff. It's very bizarre stuff, but I always advocate keeping to oneself and watching the show unfold without getting involved or harassing Nick. Let the man cook for God's sake. darkness has now begun to envelop us. What was once a hallway of familiars 
An endless tunnel of halls has turned into a wall backing us in. Walls upon walls upon walls, littered with paintings, twisted depictions, grimacing faces, and stories of those who have sunk into this trap. Those who lie here sleep, forgotten, for one reason or another, except for those who dare to wander into the dark, unknown, like you and I, those that might even find comfort in such a place. However, in this shadowy abyss, cutting through the haze of utter terror, is but a lone staircase in the middle of the room, leading down into some far stranger place. Though the steps may be made of porcelain, down there is a dark restoration ill-fit of its grandeur. Well, all the same, dear traveler, it would appear there is only one way to go from here, and that is down. Clowns be clowning slash Lyra Luce. To start this tier, we have a rather disturbing story. DA and Reddit user Lyra Luce, I believe is how you pronounce it, took to r slash creepy encounters to recount a rather disturbing page she found on DeviantArt, which reads as follows. Quote, About four years ago, one of my longtime friends on DeviantArt sent me an urgent message, telling me to check out a profile of a user I'll call Clowns Be Clowning to protect his identity. The creepy thing about this DeviantArt profile was that it was basically a shrine to me. It had details about my life on it that only people who knew me personally or had been following the journals on my various websites would be aware of. I read through the guy's personal journal on the profile section of his page, and let's just say there was some disturbing stuff posted on it. There were hundreds of pictures of me, where he got them, I had no idea, as I only let close friends view my pictures on my personal Facebook page. And underneath the pictures, he would list creepy things like, I'm always watching you, and I want to wear your skin. He would also post links to my writing, art, and music websites, and tell people to watch me because I'm an angel, was perfect, and everyone should be like me. I was basically a religion to this guy, that he was even going so far as to try and convert people to. It was one of the strangest things I have ever encountered, and I was terrified when I read everything though. I told my mom about the DeviantArt user, and she told me that we should report it to the police, so we went to the station to give an official statement. The police turned out to be pretty useless, stating that we should take our issue to the website administrators, basically the DeviantArt staff, and have them resolve the issue from their end. So I contacted one of the admins on DeviantArt, who was so freaked out by the profile they literally responded to my message the next day, telling me that they had deleted the profile as soon as they saw it. Anyone who uses DeviantArt is aware that the stuff usually takes a week or so to get back to you about an issue. So that just gives you an idea of what a freak this user was. The staff member told me to also report the user to the police, which I said that I had with no results. So they took the extra step and banned the user's IP, and even checked to see if he had made any shadow accounts on the site. They deleted everything related to this guy, but I still have a printout of what I took to the police, which I keep filed with the police report. I don't know who that guy was, but I hope that I will never have to find a creepy page like that on DeviantArt, or any other site for that matter, ever again." Unquote. Now, this does sound really creepy, but do bear in mind that there is no actual evidence of such a page existing, and since it was supposedly all deleted, this story really cannot be proven. There is also a question of how the friend found out about this page, as I would have assumed that the friend was the person doing this since they found it before the person who was supposedly being stalked did. It would help if there was kind of any sort of screenshot or any sort of evidence to go with the story, but as it stands, if true, it sounds like quite the creepy tale. 
but if not, it's just an internet creepypasta, essentially. So, who knows? Firing of Jark. For unknown reasons, Jark or Scott, again one of the founders of DeviantArt, was fired in 2015, with the decision being met with mixed reactions by the community. Jark even shared a poll on his personal DA page afterward asking if he started a new site, if people would join, and 89% voted yes, purely off of his appeal alone. Judging by the insane amount of communities and groups dedicated to this guy, Jark has certainly left a lasting impact on DeviantArt in more ways than one. Deviant Cemetery. This rather somber group is dedicated to DA users who sadly passed away, where they are documented, remembered, and mourned by those close to them. The group has been around since May 24th of 2010 and has its eternally resting users documented in alphabetical order. While a very noble and even touching gesture, there is a very heavy feeling that comes with looking at the avatars, names, and causes of deaths of so many, especially so many young artists whose lives were tragically cut short through one means or another. The comment section is also full of those who are reflecting on the lives and deaths of their friends here. From old age to cancer, to natural disasters, to even, unfortunately, the page is updated regularly and is a harrowing reminder of one's mortality. May they all rest in peace. Sonic X Amy 09. Real name Jenny, user Sonic X Amy 09, as the name suggests, is in the Sonic fandom, having been active since 2009. She has a long-running comic series called Sonic Got Amy Pregnant. Said comic follows Sonic juggling parenthood along with his many qualms with Amy Rose. It's one of those types of fan comics, you know the ones where they're all kind of living in a domestic, sort of normal sort of lifestyle. Though strangely enough, Sonic is characterized in this comic as a bit of a deadbeat dad half of the time, and most of the humor comes from poking fun at Sega's many horrible choices with the Sonic IP, as well as Sonic's lackluster recent games. Well, recent games at the time, I should say, since as of 2014, she hasn't made any new entries in her comic series, and actually I couldn't find any evidence of her online at all since 2014 actually. Hopefully she's okay, but all the same, her comic definitely made the rounds. And in my research for this entry, I even found that a fanfiction over on fanfiction.net from 2013 entitled Son Amy Love Story by user Swift Art Star notes that she asked for permission from Sonic X Amy 09 to use her Son Amy baby characters for this fanfic, meaning that the characters were at least popular enough for someone to write a fanfiction involving them. And that's gotta count for something, right? Fridge Poet Project. Started by poet and writer Catherine McKennett, the Fridge Poet Project is a poetry movement using the style of Fridge Madniks to spell out poetry. A simple gimmick on the surface, the concept ended up inspiring a multitude of people, many of which sharing their stories in the very familiar imagery of fridge magnets. This style was very much intentional, as it's meant to create a sense of nostalgia, which also fits thematically because many of the poems made using this have themes of love and childhood innocence, growing up and experiencing life as this evergreen beginning, the start of something beautiful. It's optimism incarnate. The DA page for the project hosts hundreds of these, all sharing stories and experiences. One user wrote, they say a touch of madness glimmers there behind her eyes, sparking storms that sing of light and haunting lullabies. Another wrote, you haven't sung a song, my dear, in oh so very long. Come, let the music kiss our lips, let it make you strong. Sadly, Catherine herself would pass away in 2019 from stage four colon cancer, but her legacy of creating a fun format for people to express themselves and talk about their pasts, and in general inspiring many, 
is the legacy that she leaves behind. Excelion, a very popular artist in the a uh, crotophilia community with over 6 million page views. Ixilion boosts a very vivid array of various anime girls in casts or having multiple limbs amputated and more. And I will say that again, the drawings are technically fine. And hey, amputees gotta have love too, right? But this page definitely feels like it's fetishizing the tragedy aspect of this and comments under some of these drawings are um very unnerving to say the least quote the doctor in this hospital will find further medical issues in the upper thotatic and the cervical spine and possibly her jaw another wrote that's cruel no chance of changing the catheters Genie probably prepared some plumbing. Like I've said before, you guys do you, I don't really care. But at the same time, I do find this particular fetish and the implications behind it to be quite creepy, I must be frank. Arkham Insanity slash Spanking Rabbit Hole. Yet another strange rabbit hole, Arkham Insanity and similar artists have a rather extreme fetish for spanking. I'm unsure of what all I can actually show on YouTube in regards to this fetish, but Arkham Insanity themselves have tons of art depicting characters being spanked. And that's honestly kind of whatever. I mean, so what? They're being spanked, it's a fetish, fine. However, the thing that I took note of more than the actual spanking pictures are the general themes of child punishment and abuse on the page as well as unfortunately this being a central theme in other pages centered around spanking. There is a lot of art of child characters being abused by older characters, of being humiliated, of being spanked, of being forced into wearing things and then humiliating them more after the spanking and generally getting hurt. There's also on Arkham and Sandy's page in particular, a comic about a guy who was once an adult who got rebirthed, whatever the fuck that means, so to speak, as a six year old, and then of course, spanked by a busty woman. Frankly, it all makes me extremely uncomfortable, especially because it's clear by the comments and the way that all of this is drawn that the people drawing and enjoying this content are getting off to depictions of child characters getting abused, adult characters dominating younger characters, and even themes of incest and general way within these depictions. It's fucking sickening. Even if it's not real, and it's all just drawings, mind you, so no actual children are being hurt. So that is a clear difference, right? Something about these pages still just churns my stomach and just generally feels rather ominous. I suppose I should note that a normal spanking fetish is probably just fine. You do you. It's specifically the child abuse stuff made within this context that is one of the darker and sadly more popular fetishes on the website. Where the fetish I believe is no longer the spanking but rather the abuse of children. Truly one of the most disgusting fetishes on the site. But on a lighter note, one of the other more popular fetishes are bonus entry, foot fetish. This probably should have come up by now to be honest since it's also one of the most popular fetishes on the site and a far more innocuous one even if I personally don't really get it either. But yeah, in case you didn't know, there is a lot of people that love drawing realistic feet and find them very attractive. There is always a style to how these feet are depicted as well. Like, the wrinkles of the feet are always drawn in a particular way that never really looks quite right to me and always seems to be clashing with the cartoony art style of whatever character that they're drawing. There isn't really much more to this fetish though, and I suppose all things considered, like I said, is a pretty basic one. And it is also often connected with the tickle fetish, which is exactly what it sounds like, 
of people who enjoy tickling people's feet and ribs and what have you. They just find it generally attractive, I guess. Darian Shields. Fanfic writer Darian is a more low-key member of the community, having only 900 watchers and around 300k page views. The primary subject of their fanfictions are fetish-based, a pregnancy fetish to be precise, though many have pointed out that he is actually a pretty decent writer, and you could almost mistake his fanfics for being something, well, just kind of normal, if it weren't for the highly detailed descriptions of pregnancy somewhere deep within the recesses of the fanfictions. Anime James Fetish Drama Slash Grooming Accusations Alright, talk about quite the fucking rabbit hole. Buckle in, boys, this is gonna get weird really quickly. Anime James, or James William Barkley III, is a YouTuber, or a former YouTuber, I should say, animator, artist, DA user, voice actor, musician, etc. He is a man of many talents and many interests. He has over 10 years worth of content, some of which centered around his own series and OCs, and yet much more of which centered around Sonic the Hedgehog and My Little Pony stuff. His most recognizable works being that of a mass collab brony music video parody of Michael Jackson's Beat It, his Sonic characters versus MLP characters videos, and the Marvel musical, I guess. M.A. James was a popular guy, and his channel would end up earning over a million subscribers. However, in 2014, controversy would arise as Tumblr and DeviantArt accounts were discovered matching his art style, featuring art of various underage characters, and even some people that James knew in real life who were also underage, farting, amongst other things. That comic, based on the person that he knew, was called Haley Flower, and according to James, was based on a real friend accidentally farting on his face when he was younger, which I guess is where the whole fetish began. The other page he had was one called Sonic Girls, which according to the Tumblr page's description says, the four main females of the Sonic universe live under one roof and do a bunch of girly things. New comic every Wednesday. Ho ho ho, and girly things indeed did they do. So what were these girly things? Well, these girly things just so happen to be farting on one another, shitting their pants, giving laxative to each other so that they could shit in their pants accidentally, and uh, talking about boys while farting and shitting your pants. Are you uh, <laughs> uh, beginning to see a bit of a theme here? A possible central narrative to these comics yet? Many fans were rather disgusted by this discovery. And while at first James tried to deny having a fart fetish and delete the Sonic Girls Tumblr page and what have you, he would then shortly after this discovery go on to create another DeviantArt page called Weirdo Animated James, dedicated to what else but fart fetish art. James would then go on to claim that, quote, he'd been drawing eproctophilia art, that's fart fetish art, before he realized it and was aware of how weird it was, unquote. But ultimately, it was a passion of his. And it certainly didn't end there, as according to the Wikitubia, or the YouTuber Wiki, quote, Around 2014, James began an online relationship with an artist named Michaela, also known as Toxic Soul 77 after talking with each other on Skype. However, at the time, Michaela was 17, while James was 21, with rumors spreading that he could have groomed her. Many people would go on to call him a vanilla for that rumor for this. James had attempted to defuse the drama by saying that the age of consent in New York, where he lives, is 17, but people still criticized his relationship. On December 29th, 2015, James then announced on Twitter that Michaela broke up with him following the drama. Then, on August 19th, 2019, the voice actress for Penny from C Students, one of James' series, Awkward Marina, posted a document on Twitter saying that she had left C students since the show had many sexually explicit material and James had wanted to date her. 
even suggesting that he would fly out to her location. She was also 17 at the time. When she left, James became furious and allegedly encouraged his fan base to harass her. Years later, he admitted he failed to recognize the imbalance of the relationship and wish that he hadn't done so." Unquote. All of this controversy would eventually lead to animated James' retirement, uploading a video in 2018 to his channel announcing the retirement from his channel due to mental health reasons. Then, later in 2022, he would make a twit longer after his four-year hiatus basically apologizing for his actions and how he treated others and that he plans on getting therapy. What's more is he also believes that he deserves all the criticism and hate that he received and believes that he still does. Many people ended up supporting his stance and wishing him the best of luck in possibly getting the help that he might need. There is much more drama connected with Animated James, updates, Brony Kong related drama, and info surrounding Animated James in general. But I think that you get the point by now. Closed Species Tangentially connected to adoptables, Closed Species are an original creation that the creator sells the rights to. Unlike OCs, you're buying the right to make an OC. That's the same species as the one the creator made. Say for example, I made a Closed Species that's an owl with uh, blades for feathers and a uh, big red eyes and breathes fire and what have you. Well, if you buy it from me, you now have that species and no one else can draw pictures of that species except for you because you paid for it. In theory, of course. Closed species are more run on a trust system rather than copyright. But a species is too broad of an idea to be protected by copyright, so it's not like you can even claim ownership anyway. It's kind of a silly idea to me personally, and reeks of that old my OC don't steal type of culture that all takes all of this a bit too seriously for my blood. But hey, lots of people find this stuff fun to make and to buy, so at least they're getting something out of it. Inktober Controversy Inktober is an annual artist event held on DA and Twitter where artists draw using, uh, well, ink. There is some variants of this, like some people actually have themes for each day of the month and what have you. This, however, halted in 2018 when artist Alfonso Dunn accused Jake Parker of plagiarizing his book and the concept of Inktober. Now, this didn't come out of nowhere because Alfonso only did this because Jane Parker tried to copyright the event since they were the one that started the whole Inktober challenge all the way back in 2009 as an internet thing. He believed that since he was the creator of Inktober and felt responsible for anything that comes from it, that he should protect his property by choosing to copyright Inktober. This kind of split many who participated in the event in half. Some saw Parker as holding Inktober hostage, while others simply saw him as rightfully protecting his intellectual property. Despite the controversy, the majority of artists still participated in the event that same year. That's when shortly after, Alfonso Dunn accused Parker of plagiarizing his book, Pen and Ink Drawing, of which was shown in a now private video. Anyway, that's the controversy, and it further split people, with many choosing to make new events for October, to still have fun with an event and stay away from the bad blood of Inktober and its controversy, while some still do participate in Inktober and hold their own events for it, etc, etc. Christian Sonic Fan Art This entry pertains to a bizarre subgenre of fan art, that emerged on DA featuring Sonic characters in Christian themes and settings. But it is slightly debatable if these are legitimate or trolling. From what I remember, these started out as legitimate, since there is actually a lot of fan art that centers around a character finding faith or hope or redemption in Jesus Christ, and they are usually pretty innocently made. Sonic is certainly not the only franchise to have this, it's just Sonic is the franchise that everyone pays attention to when something goes on, but I'm sure you would find many Super Mario Christian fan art, Legend of Zelda Christian fan art, Final Fantasy, etc, etc. 
but back in the day, these were some of the easiest targets for arguments and trolling on DeviantArt, and so art would later be made that was essentially made as bait. Nonetheless, it is one of the more niche fan art themes from back in the day, and pretty innocuous. Bonus Entry Sesame Street Fan 2003 Sometimes a random new entry for one of these icebergs can just kind of fall into your lap. And this was definitely the case with this user. Sesame Street Fan 2003 is one such user we came across when my Discord server was randomly discussing death battle matchups, you know, from that death battle channel, or rather random death battle matchups that we found on Google Images that were clearly fake and that we found kind of funny and we had kind of funny arguments about who we thought would win and lose, etc, etc. It was then that our local Oversoul found that many of the fan images came from one user on DeviantArt named Sesame Street Fan 2003, who not only made a ton of these, but had a rather strange page overall. For one, their account was only a year old, but they had over 150,000 page views, which is quite unusual. More unusual though was that there was over 6,000 pieces of art that they had made. Well, I say art, but most of them are just various memes, often repeated at nauseum, such as the aforementioned death battle images, a folder dedicated to their hatred of Caillou, you know, the cartoon character, one dedicated to their love for Teen Titans Go, and their hatred towards My Little Pony, despite some of the risque MLP art that they have favorited in groups that they are in, so that's a bit funny. Also, a dedicated folder to Elmo vs. Doomsday Death Battle thumbnails for some mysterious reason, as well as a folder of over 150 memes of various characters laughing at the children's cartoon character Nihao Kai Lan, crying because I guess they really, really fucking hate this cartoon character for some reason that's, I think, beyond my comprehension. They also have a list of 20 rules before engaging with their page or content period in both a friend and an enemy list. Which, I'll be honest, I do remember people back in the day having enemy list or shit list or troll list or something back in the day, but it's been a while since I've seen a nice, classic, genuine enemy list on DeviantArt. The vitriol and concentrated venom to be able to do that and keep it consistently on your DeviantArt page is something that I never tire of seeing. And this user seems to have clearly stirred up some trouble, because they seem to actively be fighting other users and groups on DA, and engaging in silly internet drama, generally speaking. Which is why they probably have so many pay views, as well as enemies, I would assume. I suppose this is what they wish to do with their time, so it's really whatever. Want to make 150 memes about characters laughing at some other random children's cartoon character? You do you! Pop off, I guess. But still, Sesame Street Fan 2003 is a good example of a type of page that I've seen since the beginning of DeviantArt. A page full of anti-groups, anti-art, memes, crossover art, and generally groups of people that they hate. You might as well call them a drama artist or an anti-user. But all the same, it's always been a strange genre of page that I've come across so many times in my past on DeviantArt that seeing such a recent example reminds me that some things truly never change, I suppose. Arvalis. This user is a very popular artist on DeviantArt, most well known for their pieces depicting Pokemon in this super realistic fashion. Arv is a very talented artist, and he's also active in other fandoms like Monster Hunter and Godzilla. Hatalia S, or Hatalia Ass, I don't know, one of the two I assume. Given the Italia series is about personified countries slash historical events, many artists choose to depict certain events with a very infamous example being user Hatalia S. From the Holocaust to the Unit 731, to the Blitzkrieg, their art, while actually quite nice looking, 
can come off to many is quite distasteful, as it is depicting these horrific events through the depictions of Hatalia characters. Ping the Hungry Fox Having left DA, Ping is a very well-known furry vor artist with many pieces featuring his persona named Ping. The Fun Police Now gone, this user is mostly known for their original webcomic called Um or UM and various belly inflation art. While their reason is unknown for their departure, an archive exists on their page. And while his DA is gone, he still has a Twitter and is rather active if you wish to partake in his stuff. Flittermilk. This is another inflation artist with a particular love for cow-themed people. So like people with giant udders, sets of like 80 or so breasts, etc. I uh, cannot show you almost anything from their gallery uh, due to this, but they are quite popular in that fetish to say the least. Nazi groups. Ah, it's now time to take a plunge into politics on DeviantArt. I'm sure you are all dying for this part. Well, like any place online, there are indeed Nazis on this site, like unironic ones, as well as groups dedicated to them and the ideology. These users and pages are, for obvious reasons, attract a lot of negative attention, though there are also a lot of roleplay groups and some people who are just kind of edgy trolls that are trying to bait arguments from people online. Others are also, strangely enough, Nazi fetishists. That is, people who draw porn or fetish art, but include Nazis within the mix. Sometimes it's just kind of a normal fetish art with a Nazi just randomly being involved, and other times it's clearly centered around, uh, well, Nazis at a concentration camp sort of angle if you catch my drift. Pretty wild and sick shit. Bonus Entry, Nazi Furs An extremely strange niche of the furry fandom are Nazi Furs, or Nazi Furries. It's exactly what you think it is, and there's a good heaping of art and furries dressed up like it to go along with it. Now, according to wikifur.com, the Nazi Fur community first came about on a live journal community back in March of 2005. Quote, the community became the first unified group of furs specifically interested in the history of Nazi Germany and the Third Reich. According to the community's founder, Banelhart, of the intended purpose of the community was to be an umbrella community encompassing the varied interests of individual furs within the specific topic. This was intended to include, but not be limited to, reenacting uniform fetish, military history and tactics, and anthropomorphic art set during World War II. As of January 2017, the community had 337 posts, 2,034 comments, and 105 members. The Nazi Furs Live Journal community states that they seek to further the understanding of Hitler's Germany through study and discussion, and will actually refuse registration to any applicants or affiliated with any hate groups. Users who post anything containing anti-Semitism, racial hatred, or ethnic cleansing unless done in an obviously humorous, sarcastic, or satiric light will be banned." Unquote. Now, while that sounds like there isn't anything serious about these Nazi furs, that it's all just kind of a big LARP, it seems like that was either never the case, or people would later definitely not get the memo on that said LARP, and were instead literally Nazi furries with no sense of irony and instead full-on hatred. Yep, they really believe in the furry master race, apparently. All the same though, these are certainly an interesting subculture of both furry and, um, national socialist fandoms, I guess. Be they dead-ass serious or just kind of pretending. Bonus Entry, Communist Groups Same as the Nazi groups, there are a ton of communist groups on DeviantArt. In fact, there's not only more of them, but they are also far more popular than the Nazi ones. There is, of course, a lot of art for and against communism, as you might imagine on the website, and even groups like Soviet Equestria 
where it's all art related to My Little Pony characters or My Little Pony OCs in communist attire and what have you. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, there is also Nazi and commie bronies. And also, also, yes, there is also communist furries. Like, actually a lot of them, to be perfectly honest, and it's a lot less ironic. Which is true across the board, really, and for some reason seems to be more commonly accepted online, even though both communism and national socialism were equally evil, and both led to millions of innocent people being tortured and killed, starved or otherwise, as well as just general despair. And while I do see many people who are quick to point out all the Nazi groups, perhaps rightfully so because they're cringe and bad, I don't really see as many people pointing out all the communist groups which I think are equally cringe and bad. But yeah, all these people are fucking crazy and love LARPing or philosophically siding with history's most evil losers. So uh, yeah, pretty cringe overall I must say. Bonus entry, the politics forum. Okay, one last one pertaining to politics for a bit. But yeah, in the DA forums, there is a politics section, and as you might imagine, it's a tumultuous place, full to the brim of people on all sides of the spectrum, discussing current world events, debating their sides, or yelling at one another for one reason or another. It's also, unsurprisingly, one of the most active parts of the forum, even to this day. Which is actually saying something since the forums are certainly a shell of what they used to be back in the day. But this section lives on while other parts like the entertainment section of the forums with gaming, movies, music, and books languishing in complete near silence by comparison. Kaforia. Kaforia is a Vor artist who's been around since the early 2000s with his art being most known for the choppy style that sort of looks like generic cutouts or stock weird PNG art of characters. Now, that's where it would normally end. Just another Vor artist who really cares at this point. But this fellow has quite a history of drama and content worth mentioning. For one, this guy has made hundreds of short animations depicting various characters being Vored though a favorite of his seems to be Sonic characters. Most of these animations were once on his YouTube channel until it was eventually taken down for reasons that I'll get into momentarily. However, there does exist an archive of them, so why don't we take a little peek at a couple of them real quick, such as this little masterpiece entitled Macro Amy Beach. Probably nothing. Or how about the family classic, Amy's Misunderstanding?
Some of you who used to watch cringe compilations back in the day might recognize the art style of these animations as they were often shared around in these cringe comps as well as just generally speaking were shared for their fascinating subject matter, shall we say. For as many animations as he's made, after watching quite a few of them, they're all very formulaic and pretty much always end with someone being bored for one reason or another, with no resolution as to what the hell happens after. If they spit them up, if they shit them out, or they just keep them in there forever or something. They also look remarkably the same, like in the 16 years this man has been making content, these animations have not improved or changed at all. That may be partly by design, but all the same it's worth noting, since usually in that time, some kind of improvement or at least change, an evolution of any kind, would happen to most people's art styles. But this is clearly not the case with the Kephora's art. And of course, on top of these animations, he has also made thousands of pieces of art across these 16 years on the DeviantArt platform, of which he is still extremely active on to this day. But what about why these animations got taken off of YouTube? Well, by 2018, Kephora reached over 162,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, and even received his silver play button reward, but faced numerous problems regarding the new community guidelines of YouTube, and ended up getting his account terminated due to this, probably in some part due to them kind of being Elsagate-esque. Even if these were made far before Elsagate was ever even a thing, they did accidentally line up with the whole short, repetitive, badly animated shorts with blatant fetish content, with copyright characters no less, that just lined up perfectly with content of that ilk. In fact, in my research, I saw many, many, many accounts of people who discovered his videos as children, who were just innocently watching online videos and animations regarding Sonic the Hedgehog when one of his videos would come up. And it seemed to kind of freak a lot of them out when they were first exposed to them and the vor fetish as a whole. Truly tragic how many children's pure and simple innocence was taken away from them because of these fucking Vore Sonic animations. He would then move on to Daily Motion for a time to upload his animations, before then moving on to Odyssey, where he is still pretty active to this day. Kephora would also end up getting an Encyclopedia Dramatica page, as well as a Kiwi Farms thread. As for as low effort as his stuff is, he made a real name for himself online and many became interested in documenting him or mocking him over his fetish material. Overall, a very peculiar yet prolific artiste of, uh, his sort. Amuria. Amuria, aka Jennifer, is probably one of the biggest pioneers of DA, but also a user who got screwed over pretty badly due to petty early internet drama. She's most known for being the originator of the Moe girl style, or at least in the fan sense, with very saturated bright colors and a shiny look achieved through the generous use of the Photoshop Dodge tool. Viewing her page now shows that she has amassed over 21,000 followers and 1. million page views, despite being inactive since 2008. Her art seems to be heavily inspired by key visual novels as well, like that of Clannad. Sadly, her downfall occurred when another prominent artist, just Fly a Kite began calling out Amuria by saying that she didn't deserve the daily deviation because she had a generic art style, with the original journal stating this along with the rant unfortunately being lost to time now. More and more people started noticing that a lot of her characters had the same blank expression and rather stiff poses. There were also a few other older artists with very similar shading styles to Amuria's, such as Ryo Oki, Vanilla Sticks, and Senra, to name a few. This gave rise to a theory that these artists were in fact the same person, and that Amuria was lying about her age. There was also an incident where another user, 
Shin Man Chan claimed to be Maria's cousin, though that this claim was never actually confirmed, mind you, went on her page and asked her house college, which to the community was further proof that Maria was lying about her age. Though again, there was no actual proof that any of this was true and wasn't just simply the acts of trolls. Honestly, the whole thing seems like sour grapes from some bitch who got upset over someone whose art style that they didn't gel with, getting the Daily Deviation Award. It's a shame because there is a charm to Amiria's artwork, and it would have been cool to see where she went as the years went on and her art style evolved. And personally, I don't really see anything wrong with her art style anyway. I think some people were just being straight up pretentious. But unfortunately, she was bullied off of the site for no real good reason at all. Thus, her page stands as her legacy on the site, with many visiting it and seeing just how unfairly judged and harassed this clearly talented woman was. Shinprod22 Shinprod22 is a user who's active in numerous fandoms, but most know him for the Simpsons fandom, with many of their works tackling Homer and Marge dealing with the loss of Bart, Maggie being a stillborn, or Homer and Marge being teens and realizing they're pregnant. There is also a lot more, I guess what you'd call normal Simpsons fan art as well, but that being said, the Bart being dead story concept had a ton of different pieces dedicated to it, as you can probably see here on screen. While it's a bit off topic for this iceberg, it kind of reminds me of those old fanfiction categories, uh, specifically the hurt and comfort category, which if you go to nearly any fanfiction website, you are sure to see somewhere. Uh, that being a fanfiction where something awful happens to the cast or a specific character, and then the rest of the story is about said characters then comforting each other finding closure, dealing with their trauma, etc. Now, if you want a little personal antidote, I remember years and years ago, back on one of my old DeviantArt accounts, I made a fanfiction about Star Fox, in which it was Christmas time and everyone was having a good time, but Fox McCloud was not. Because of the few memories he still had of his father, Christmas was one of the ones he cherished the most and was one of the last good memories he had before his father went on that fabled mission, where he would never return. And the story is about him kind of coming to grips with that, and Crystal being there to help him, as well as Falco. And then they all have a happy Christmas, etc, etc. It was a fanfiction full of grammatical errors and just general errors and bad writing in general, but hey, somebody at one point said that it made them cry on DeviantArt, and uh, that's gotta count for something, right? At any rate, many of Pra's works would fall into this camp of fanfiction, and no matter which fandom you're in, you are guaranteed to come across this stuff eventually. It's even a favorite among certain fandoms, though it being about The Simpsons is certainly a bit of a strange choice to me. But hey, they are clearly very passionate about the series and the family's relationships, so yeah. Country Humans Country Humans is a fandom of sorts that sprouted around anthropomorphized versions of countries. Think Hitalia, but uh, not anime guys. There is a ton, and I do mean a ton of art of this concept, as well as memes, of course. This also kind of reminds me of Country Balls, which is the same thing, but uh, they're balls. The balls seem to be even more popular than the humans, actually, in my research, but they are both basically the same thing as far as the whole concept of behind characterizing a country as a character of sorts. Many a historical meme have been centered around these things, some more uh, risque than others, since often everyone's favorite part of history to discuss is World War II. Thus, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia are often depicted in these memes. And while many of the memes are just kind of used for normal affair and what have you, there are also some that have taken to using it as a means of denying the Holocaust amongst other historical atrocities. So it's all got a bit of an edge to it. But overall, this concept of anthropomorphizing countries has proven to be quite popular and garners quite the dedicated kind of fandom. The DA certainly had plenty of then and now. 
brush a ban, DA has rules in place that they barely moderate at all. They say porn is not allowed, and uh, yeah, clearly no one is enforcing that rule. Well, this would eventually lead to Russia banning this site outright. Partly because they are very ban happy anyway because of their strict government, but also because there is a lot of pro-drug, pro-Nazi, pro-anti-government stuff, and of course, CP. Or stuff that at the very least, blah, for that would very much enjoy, even if it's not technically, legally, CP. And on that note, pornography is banned on DeviantArt. As I know before, and just a general fun fact, according to DeviantArt TOS, pornography of any kind can result in an account ban. But anyone who spent any amount of time on the site can tell you that this rule is not enforced very well. It's actually unknown why this rule goes so unenforced. Maybe it's just because it's more profitable to look the other way. Maybe it's gone on so long that they wouldn't even know how to go about stopping it at this point. Maybe the people on the website or the admins really like that content and this is just a legal formality of sorts. Or maybe all these things are a combination of these things are true, as well as the people who run the site are just kind of lazy bums. But who knows? Gift card scam. A common scam hackers will do is send you a note claiming you want a free points gift card and would include a link that usually steals your information, if clicked on. DA, however, has never sold points via gift cards, but that hasn't stopped others from falling victim to the scam, unfortunately. Art stolen by major retailers. DA has gotten flack over major clothing stores, stealing designs from artists and selling them on shirts, with a big example being the creator behind the troll face having the troll face sold on t-shirts and DA refusing to take action. There are more examples of this, but yeah, not much more to note besides it's a thing that happens and it's pretty shitty. Merlogic 1 Merlogic 1, or more commonly called the Wonder Bread Guy, is a user who rose to infamy in 2016 to 2017 by commissioning thousands of dollars worth of art pieces involving busty white women buying Wonder Bread. As you can see here by these pieces, it's uh, <clears throat> very strange to say the least. Many of you are probably asking, why? Is this some sort of fetish centered around Wonder Bread? Is it all an elaborate joke? Who exactly is this guy and what does he pay for and want all this art of this extremely specific thing? Well, while some of you might have heard of this Wonder Bread obsession, I wonder how many of you have also heard that this guy also really enjoys stuff about deforestation, with one drawing showing two women with Wonder Bread sandwiches taking a selfie in front of a theme park called Sandwich Land with signs about deforestation. There's also several commissions he's had done with women with chainsaws having just cut down a whole forest of trees. It's usually a blonde woman as well. So what gives? Is this some sort of political statement? Is there something deeper to this strange obsession? Well, people have actually asked him as much, with one example being in 2018 when Tumblr user Joyful Attic claimed to have spoken to Merlogic One and wrote, quote, he absolutely was not just a normal guy with a weird kink. This shit was his life pretty much. He had lots of talk about consumerism, slavery and capitalism and why they were all good things, almost to the point of religion to him. He tried talking to me about his commission of a comic of, I believe, Asami cutting down a rainforest and industrializing it, in like weird undertone of loving sandwiches. Everything he talked about in this aspect came down to sandwiches with him." Unquote. They then go on to say, quote, On a more dark and serious subject, he has been fired from his job and possibly disowned from his family for this kind of stuff. He talked about assaulting, sexually assaulting, and insulting the race or sexuality of his co-workers. People caught on that he was kind of fucked up and emailed his boss over this stuff and got him fired. I got to watch as he complained about it and the entire forum that he was on talking about it blew up for a good solid two hours over how fucked up this guy is for thinking he did nothing wrong. 
and him insulting everyone. It was absolutely bonkers. Please do not give Merlogic commissions. His money isn't worth being associated with this man. Overall, he is a very disgusting person, and while it's fun to point and laugh, he really is not someone who should be given the time of day." Unquote. Now to be fair, I'm unsure if any of that information has been confirmed fully, but if true, then it certainly gives a little more insight into this strange obsession. Kinda. Later, he would also conduct an AMA on Reddit and his now defunct DA page, in which he spoke vaguely about his obsession and why this stuff seems to attract him, stating, quote, My first job I had was at a job called Bounty Farm, which was funded and supervised by an organization referred to as Petaluma People Services Center. I met my now ex-girlfriend at this place. When I was finally ready to go to her old apartment in Ronherd Park, and she let me touch her tits while we watched Howl's Moving Castle, they reminded me of Wonder Bread, since I was trying to pinpoint what the texture of breasts reminded me of the most, and Wonder Bread came to the closest." Unquote. So yeah, make of that what you will. Also, as one more random piece of trivia, Murr once commissioned the famed or rather infamous artist Shadman to draw porn for him, but he refused Murr's offer. Ari Banks slash Eclipse Saga. Before the reveal of DeviantArt Eclipse, user Ari Banks and friends decided to use an ARG to hint at the updated site layout before the official reveal. Now, for the few of you who don't know what an ARG is, an ARG, alternate reality game, is what it stands for, in a sense, is an interactive narrative story that plays out with viewers' input. It's a genre of storytelling that's quite popular over here on YouTube and in marketing campaigns. Anyway, Ari and Co. created the Eclipse Saga, a comic that had to be solved via viewers noticing clues slash details that could lead to codes and keys hinting at a greater plot at play. For example, a puzzle involved people viewing 10 statues in the story, teal, green, rose, copper, etc., and viewing each statue through an alternate means to find the key and the secret within. The purple statue, Ghoul, or G-H-U-U-L, involved users needing to find a secret chat room, named after an island mentioned in the comic. From there, a bot would leak clues, but some were red herrings, so users had to pay attention to determine which were fake and which were real. Ari's journals contain cryptic hints as to the correct clues, chat room passwords, and the times the chat bot would give out clues. The ARG was met with overwhelming praise, and while Eclipse is seen as a very poor update, the comic and ARG are still remembered very fondly. The Lost DeviantArt Story Reddit user Tariko Pasta Sauce took to r slash lost media to find a supposed lost short story he had read on the website of DeviantArt some time ago. He claimed it was called The Family, with six parts to it. According to the Reddit post, he says, quote, The story focused on a man who works for a California magazine company, and his car breaks down in a small town where the sheriff takes him in. His house has a real old feel, and his little girl around 10 years old had an older feel in the way she acted and talked. And the main character finds out that the sheriff has an age-altering device that's used to keep peace within the town and for monetary gain. Eventually, the MC takes the device and uses it on the sheriff to try and stop him. But that backfires when the sheriff's wife changes him back and turns her daughter and the MC into toddlers, basically just to demoralize them with a bath. And then their punishment is to be stuck as babies who can't do anything to retaliate. A user named AR Stories is believed to have been the author, but when contacted, the user has no memory of such a story. Certainly a strange sounding tale, but nothing outside the realm of normal DeviantArt affair, I suppose. Fetish flair and all. But it seems that there has been no updates to this lost media case, so it remains a mystery. Copy pasta comments. Spend long enough on DA and you're bound to run into a comment or string of comments with some spooky chain letter message attached to it. Something that was pretty common pretty much everywhere back in the day. 
from forums to emails, etc. Obviously, many of the people commenting these are generally little kids who don't know any better, but it's very humorous to see just comment chain after comment chain talking about sharing this or else some spooky girl is going to get you at 3 a.m. or you'll get lucky in the next seven days or your whole family will perish in the next 48 hours or something. Lizzie Winkle Yin Yin Benzula, better known as Lizzie Winkle, was a 15-year-old Roblox model maker, loved by the fandom at large with many still holding her in high regard. However, unfortunately, on November 29th of 2019, Lizzie Winkle lost her battle to cancer, and her death was made public by her sister on Twitter. May she rest in peace. For no good reason. Talk about an infamous lolcow. For no good reason, real name Anthony Aguilar, is a reviled member of the Brony community and host for the Brony D&D. His biggest claim to fame is his ongoing feud with the YouTuber Lily Orchard, who is their own rabbit hole of bad opinions, controversy, and what have you, but maybe we'll get to them some other time. But regardless, Anthony and Lily Orchard arguing with one another to me is just basically two jackasses both yelling and screaming at one another, both desperately trying to sound like the smartest person in the room. But regardless, Anthony is well known for attacking simply anyone who even slightly disagrees with him, or criticizes him in any way imaginable. And if recent accusations are to be believed, has groomed numerous minors. There are a few videos talking about his various controversies, at the time, he was also considered very argumentative, and what many people would consider extremely toxic. Another controversy he found himself in was in 2018, when fellow brony tune critic Y2K was outed as a serial groomer and self-admitted pedophile, with thousands of disturbing DMs being leaked showing years upon years of sexting slash grooming various minors. For no good reason, or Anthony was very much aware that this had been going on for years before Critic was exposed publicly. With the Skype call being leaked confirming Anthony as well as many others who knew Critic was a danger to children, but they did nothing about it because they knew it would make them look bad. And frankly, they might have been trying to protect one of their own, for all we know. He along with the rest of their friend group once again fumbled the bag when Critic's grooming was made public by not getting the police involved, but instead telling Critic to just get off the internet before things start to get legal, when it should have gotten legal a long time ago, showcasing that Anthony and his friend group are either spineless cowards or have dark secrets that they don't want getting out and are simply protecting one of their own. But I suppose I repeat myself a bit there either way. Beyond this, Anthony has found himself in an absurd amount of controversies, most stemming from him just accusing people of heinous shit daily for the sake of drama and easy clicks, some of the lowest form of content on the site, and a very dangerous game to play overall. These are some of my least favorite types of YouTubers. They just make up fucking claims about people with no evidence whatsoever, possibly ruining lives for internet clout, and maybe a bit of money. Which again is ironic since he actually did know someone who was a legitimate pedophile and did nothing about it, showcasing his hypocrisy and stupidity. His motivation for this remains unclear. Sometimes he says he just likes poking at people for a laugh. Sometimes he says he just wants to enforce quality control within the community. And sometimes he feels people have wronged him in a way that justifies him acting out this way. These days, the Brody fandom consider him an outcast, destined to be forgotten. Molly Hale is my friend. Oh my goodness, you guys are not ready for the absurd amount of information you're about to learn about this individual. They are by far one of the weirdest rabbit holes and lolcows on DeviantArt. And frankly, I found myself overwhelmed by it all when I first started researching this. To start, I think it's best that I read their profile's bio 
on their DeviantArt page. Quote, I am 0% boy alpha. I am 0% man child. I am 0% idiot. I am 0% locale. I am 0% liar. I am 0% I am 0% nostalgia tard. I am 0% spammer. I am 0% sicko. I am 0% kid littler. And I am 0% thief. I am clean, excellent, good, honest, innocent, truthful, nice, outgoing, smart, sweet, straight, and drug-free, and I am safe and careful on the internet. I am an only child living in my house, and all my personal info is secret, and I am proud of my artwork that I ever make, ever made, and will ever make, and credit goes to the sites I borrow pics from, and that's the truth." Unquote. Now, imagine how big of an undertaking I knew I had on my hands once I read this opening to this extensive ED article. Quote, Imagine someone who makes Alex Jones seem intelligent. Imagine someone who makes Chris Chan look like he has his shit together. Imagine someone who has a nostalgia boner so big that it makes Doug Walker blush. That someone is Eric Tasman Mokrakiek. I have no idea how to pronounce that, by the way, sorry. Unquote. Now to put it simply, Molly Hale, or Eric, posts bizarre and almost unreadable edits of children's show characters with either super specific, strange, or very disturbing captions. He's deluded himself into believing cartoon characters are real, and even that he owns a radio station by the name of Classics. If you go to the DA page, you'll see nearly 5,000 images of well, this variety, which I'll have playing in the background as we discuss this further. Because while that's a basic rundown of the guy, let's uh, dig a bit deeper, shall we? Big shout out to Kiwi Farms user PsychoNerd054 for condensing a lot, and I do mean a lot, of internet history into a digestible post. Quote, Eric Mokriak is a geeky 38-year-old man who has some rather weird tastes. Like, really, really weird tastes. Particularly, he has weird obsessions with children from obscure cartoons from the 80s and 90s and game shows. Eric likes to make a bunch of YouTube videos and DeviantArt pictures that are made primarily of stock images, most of which are about little kids from very obscure cartoons, doing all kinds of weird shenanigans. He does this so much to the point where it's fucking creepy. Besides the videos and pictures, he makes a lot of scat fetish fanfiction, which includes said characters. Art and videos. Now normally I don't do this, but I legitimately have nothing to say for this part of the thread, other than I am actually pretty amazed how much his art reveals about himself. I'm not kidding. The shit this guy makes is so crazy that any kind of commentary I could make simply wouldn't enhance how batshit insane it is. In this part, the thread literally writes itself. By the way, it appears this guy closed his YouTube account, but luckily, YouTuber user Junior Fang Returns mirrored almost all the videos he's made." Unquote. In case you're wondering, I did happen to take a peek over Junior Fang Returns' um, uploads, which now he seems to be going under the name of Jake Cook. But nonetheless, from what I gathered, it's a lot of rants that are kind of tossed together. Uh, Eric seemed to be a fan of doing this, and he also did a review of the Superman 64 video game and had an intro that was very much inspired or rather ripped off from Armake21, who was an OG video game reviewer from back in the day that I'll eventually do an Internet Fables on. But I digress. Here's a small clip from that Superman 64 review so you can get a taste for Eric's voice and I guess uh, his style of video. In 1999, people, Titus, a company that has a very shitty reputation for making games on 
pretty much various consoles, decides to make a Superman game for the N64. Doesn't that sound awesome? No, it doesn't! Why do I say that? Because it's one of the worst fucking games I've ever played, and it's a good thing that I did not play this game in my fucking childhood. That's right, people. I'm talking about the abysmal Superman 64. If I ever buy a cartridge from you, I am seriously going to annihilate the fucking cartridge, whether it be via knives, via burning the fucking cartridge, or getting a goddamn shotgun and using it as a fucking target. I don't care what I use. That game... The fucking producers of the game should be fucking ashamed of themselves for making this pile of shit. The goddamn procrastinators. They spent maybe a week on it by the looks of this. If I ever find the head person of Titus, or what was Titus, I am going to go at their fucking house in the middle of the night, and kill them in their fucking sleep. The person of Titus needs to be taught a fucking lesson, and that is not license shitty fucking games. I know, people, it's a Superman game. And what do you expect from a Superman game? You expect shitty quality, but not this bad. You know what I'm going to give this game, people. A FUCKING ZERO OUT OF TEN! Now as for the art, several specific examples are shown here, which again I think you can pretty well see are very random, nonsensical, and kind of accidentally funny at times. As mentioned, he also makes fanfictions of various kinds, but the most prevalent of these fanfictions are scat fetish ones. That's, uh, shit fetish ones, in case you forgot. Here is an excerpt from one of them. Quote, Bad case of the chocolate pears. Molly was having a very bad case of the chocolate pears. She tried her hardest to stop doing chocolate pears in her pants. I can't stop doing hoo-poo in my pants, said Molly. Molly marched around her room. Suddenly, a chocolate pear dropped into her pants. Molly marched to her little bench and sat down. She squashed her chocolate pear. Molly threw her squashed chocolate pear in the toilet, wiped herself, and changed her underwear and got redressed. The drum from the tailspin bumper came from her butt. Excuse me, said Molly. At least I don't get spanked for that, said Molly, unquote. Oh, and uh, here's another excerpt from a Sonic Sat AM fanfiction of his. Quote, Tails was sent to bed early by Sally, with Ted Horn's spankings to his rear end. Young man, I hope those hard spankings have taught you a lesson in using that kind of language, shouted Sally angrily. Yes, Sally, I understand, said Tails sadly. I hope you're sorry, said Sally. I am, said Tails sadly. Okay, you're grounded tomorrow. All day in your room, said Sally. Okay, said Tails. Sally put all her of Tails' toys in the closet. No more swearing, okay? said Sally. Okay, said Tails. Dulcie was there. She had a bad case of the chocolate wagons. Dulcie wore clothes. I can't stop doing poo-poo in my pants, said Dulcie. <laughs> Dulcie tried eating dragonberries, but it did not work. Dulcie still had a bad case of the chocolate wagons. What a fucking weird way to say shit. The chocolate wagons. Very creative, must say. Tails just had his meals and fell asleep after his dinner. He did not have dessert. Sally came home to check on Tails. I hope you know now that swear words are not okay to use, said Sally. I learned my lesson, said Tails. What's wrong with Dulcie, asked Tails. She has a bad case of the chocolate wagons, said Sally. What's a chocolate wagon, asked Tails. That's how dragons go number two, dear, said Sally. They look just like a toy wagon and they pull like a radio flyer, said Tails. Right, only soft, warm, solid, and brown, <laughs> said Sally, unquote. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no comment required, I think. Now, I'd like to share one more video clip from Eric's channel that seems to have been saved. Eric's infamous Mash Game Hollywood Squares with Lyrics, where we get to hear him sing and make up lyrics to the intro song from the old game show, Match Game Hollywood Squares. Yes, this is true. It's true. Yes, I is. I'm not full of jumpy dust. The time will not fight the crust. Jason from the carrot when he stands at his school. He stands by his desk in school each day. He's, he plays with the blocks. Another toy. He plays with the right eyes and goes out to the playground. Yes, he stands on his desk. His big sister Kim eats a lot of candy bars. Just like that in a flash. Yeah, Mitch needs lots of ice cream. Fidella is his favorite. And Jason is only six years old. Man, what was with locales back in the day and like making up songs to go with uh, game shows? Actually, what is with game shows and these sorts of people in general. That, that, that seems to be a weird connection. Uh, comment down below if you got a theory. I, I don't have any at the moment. The Kiwi Farms post goes on to say, quote, classics. Finally, Eric here believes that he owns some fictional broadcasting service known simply as classics. At least from what I've found out. This proposed network that he's been dreaming up all of his life is supposed to show nothing but game shows. Not much is known about this particular broadcast, mainly because Eric never really explains the concept of it coherently. Thankfully, a much older post made by at SuperCauly on the Closing Logos group thread did allow for some pointers. Unfortunately though, half of the stuff she discussed has been deleted or taken down. So the best I could do is essentially base this off of what was described and said post. Said program would have broadcasted such gems as Ash Ketchum Feud, Digimon, Ty's Date, The Emmy Show, and You Can't Do That at Walmart, unquote. Now, from what I've gathered, Eric has been doing this stuff since around 2004. He apparently started his online shenanigans on the Closing Logo Group, a close-knit group who are passionate about logos and logo types where he would spam the site with his MS Paint masterpieces, with animated children plastered on top of them. Speaking of that, he seems to really love these two characters from the cartoon Dragon Tales, and of course this little girl that he has for his avatar fucking everywhere. Whatever the fuck she's from, it, it's apparently from a cartoon or something called Sullivan Families, which I have never heard of before. And often, they are used to come to his defense, such as these uh, testimony pictures. You will be free and have your freedom forever, Eric. I will defend you and your freedom. Don't listen to them, Eric. You are not a pedophile at all. I am your friend, even though I am only six years old. You are not a pedophile at all, Eric. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Needless to say, it's easy to see why many people theorize that Eric might actually think the cartoon characters are real. Which brings me to a personal story Eric himself shared years ago about his friendship with a real life six year old he met when he at that time was 17, which I think I will now read in full. Quote, on May 1998, there was one girl that I loved very much. She was six and her name was Kimberly. She was sitting next to me at Wayne's birthday party in 1998. She became my friend on the afternoon of May 29th at 4.45 p.m. I decided to write a song about her in 1999, and it is track 10 off Friends Walking Piano Cake. And in the summer of 1998, Kimberly turned seven. I still loved her. 
In July, I went to the planetarium and I saw her pretty blue eyes after I dropped off my lunch. The carnival was on August 12th. I was getting ready for the carnival. I gave her a hug on the day of August 12th, 1998. And on December 18th of 1998, she was in the audience. I said hello to her and she was still my friend, my buddy, my pal, my companion, my acquaintance, my amigo. On March 10th, 1999, she was sitting next to me at bowling. She got a lot of love in me, Kimberly. She was happy to see me, and she's still my friend, my buddy, my pal, my companion, my acquaintance, my amigo. On May 24th, 1999, she was at the bowling party. She was excited to see me, and I was excited to see her. And she was so happy, and we played, and I won. And we had pizza and the ice cream cake. On the Friday of the first week of summer school in 1999, Kimberly and I were at Allier State Park. It was so much fun, and she was happy. On Monday, Kimberly said hello. We went to Atlantic City, but she wasn't there. I was disappointed that she didn't show up. Then, on the waterworks trip, I played in the pool. So did Kimberly. She was eight by then. On December 17th of 1999, Kimberly was happy to see me, and I was very proud of Kimberly. And on June 14th of 2000, I introduced my mom to her, and on the waterworks trip, I came back. Kimberly was there. And on March 7th of 2001, Kimberly was at the bowling party, and she was cheering her brothers on. And on June 13th, Kimberly was watching the show. And on August 9th, 2001, Kimberly was at the water park, and I had lunch with her, and I had a lot of fun. And at the carnival, I talked to Kimberly. And that's the story of Kimberly, unquote. Very, very uncomfortable, especially the fact that he remembers all the dates and the way he describes everything. Just, it's very, it gives me an uneasy feeling, the whole thing. Comes off as stalkerish, almost, to say the least. Oh, and by the way, in case you hadn't uh, taken notice from the text on screen, everything this man writes has every single word capitalized. Except sometimes in his fan fictions for some reason. Which in the long scheme of things isn't that weird compared to the actual contents of said text. But it still makes reading anything by this man a terrible chore. As well as his general grammar and the way that he writes, it's just not all there. There's several other strange things he seems fixated on. Like these pictures where characters want to sit on the floor in the backs of cars. I love sitting on the floor in the back of the cars and talking. I enjoy sitting on the floor in the back of cars and talking and eating french fries. Sitting on the floor in the back of cars and talking is what I do best. I love sitting on the floor in the back of cars. Me too. It's fun to sit on the floor in the back of cars. Sitting on the floor in the back of cars is fun to do. I love doing and I have since I was four. Hey butthead, let's, let's sit on the floor in the back of cars. Uh, okay. <laughs> Which there has been no explanation for as to why he's so fixated on this one thing. He's made around a hundred different pictures depicting basically this exact same thing. There are also several of this exact same type of image where it says, I am a Toys R Us kid. Do you remember me? Do you remember who I am? Do you remember my name? I'm not sure if this is in reference to something, but all I can say is, is that there is a ton of these that have been made and they are all extremely ominous. But then again, quite a few things this guy makes are in general quite ominous when taken in uh, the full depth of everything that he's saying, creating, and doing. I could go on for a while longer, but I think you've more than gotten the point of this strange fecal matter enjoyer, backseat sitter, cartoon kid loving, extremely disturbed individual who clearly has some mental issues and a very eccentric fetish filled imagination. Let us hope that he sticks to cartoon characters and stays far far away from actual children in the future. Maternity Through Time Many communities will hold events and by far one of the most successful was Maternity Through Time, an event held by Impregnation to draw uh, pregnancy-themed art of various time periods, be it Ancient Rome, 
Viking times, the future, etc. And not much more to this one than that though, I suppose. Tails gets trolled slash Laserbot. This one definitely should have been on this iceberg a lot sooner, like tier 1 or 2 type of stuff. But better late than never, right? Tails Gets Trolled refers to an original comic shared on DA by user Laserbot called, well, Tails Gets Trolled, in which, as the name suggests, showcases Tails getting trolled. The comic is pretty similar to the Zootopia abortion comic, funnily enough, and that one panel went mega viral as a meme, causing an uptick in popularity, although quite a few of its pages from the comic had a very similar memehood granted. We're all well aware of the now iconic image of Tails with an absolutely shocked expression, as well as the other extremely expressive pictures that while not maybe drawn in the best technical light, the emotion really comes through. Now, there has been a fair bit of debate over the years that if the comic was made ironically or not, with many arguing that Laserbot truly wanted to make a genuine comic, but saw how parts of it became memes and just sort of rolled with the joke, while others argue that it was always the point to be intentionally bad. I personally above the mind that it was a genuine comic effort, you can kind of tell by the way it's written, the way it's drawn, it just feels like a genuine effort that evolved through time. There's a certain charm to genuine passion projects such as these that I think is extremely difficult to mask. But no matter which way you slice it, Tales Gets Trolled is an absolutely hilarious comic, both for its art, but also often for its very edgy and at times crazy dialogue. If you know, you know. But if you don't, I highly recommend that you give it a try. There's also several good videos on YouTube that chronicle some of the events of the story, and the various dramas and whatnot associate with the comic and its creator, including a great one by Cybershell. It's quite a trip that, believe it or not, have some panels later on that go pretty fucking hard. Jsonic 1977 as far as locales go, J-Sonic is probably the most bizarre we'll encounter this tier. But sadly, he will not be the most disgusting this tier. And trust me, when I say that, you're gonna learn to really fear this fact. As the name would imply, J-Sonic, real name Jason Creever, is a Sonic fan, and one who's risen to a fair amount of infamy recently. Of course, when hearing Sonic and Locals together, one expects them to be like Chris Chan, which is a fair assessment, but Jason is on a whole different breed of deranged. He himself claims he was in a coma at the age of 18, and in this coma, Sonic the Hedgehog visited him in a dream, resulting in Sonic becoming a savior of sorts to him upon coming out of the coma. This has made Jason absolutely obsessed with Sonic in every way imaginable. And before you go thinking, oh, so he plays the games, watches the shows, reads the comics, buys the merch, and acts like a general crazy person about Sonic. What's new for a Sonic fan, right? But remember that I said in every way, including sexually. As of 2020, he is a self-admitted plushophile. Plushophilia being the sexual attraction slash desire for sexual intercourse with a plush toy. And the object, or plush in this case, of his desire is a plush Sonic the Hedgehog. This alone is enough to raise some eyebrows, but the Sonic plush in question Jason has been having sex with for well over 20 years. Let me just repeat that. He has been having sex with a Sonic plush for over 20 years. The exact same plush, which he proudly talks about never cleaning either, mind you, so one could only imagine the state that is in. Except you don't have to imagine because I'm about to show you a picture of it. Viewer discretion is advised. Yup, yup, yup. Soak it all in. Cod knows that that plush certainly has. There are more pictures of this plush in various other compromising positions, but I'll save you the trouble. This on its own is disgusting enough. Putrid. 
beyond imaginably ghastly. But around 2019 or so, screenshots surfaced on Kiwi Farms showcasing JSONic sexting with minors on Telegram and even sending them CP. He would be exposed again on Twitter in late 2019 when a decoy by the name of Kanix had acquired proof that JSONic was attempting to groom them with the decoy stating numerous times that they were under 18. Truly a vile, disgusting man overall. Andrew Dobson, more known by his online pseudonyms Tom Preston or Catty N, Dobson has cemented himself as not only a hated member of DeviantArt, but the web as a whole. He's also a pretty funny locale with many infamous incidents under his belt. Under his catty N persona, he share his own inflation art, you know, as you do on DeviantArt, but he wouldn't do much in the way of getting himself any relevance until sharing his debut autobiographical comic entitled So You're a Cartoonist, which ended up garnering him a modest following. Many of these comics featured what people might call hashtag relatable artist problems, I guess. But more often than not, it wasn't necessarily hashtag relatable things and more so extremely personal, spiteful, venomous sort of thoughts that was constantly flowing through Dobson's mind. Like his character often getting pissed at how nobody approaches him to buy his books, showcasing a bit of entitlement in his attitude as well as a lot of comics featuring straw men for him to smugly dismantle. Issues would arise as his comics would eventually be discovered by 4chan, and thus a torrent of criticism would be launched his way. Many took issue with the very virtue signaling angle he took with his comics, and heavy use of straw men as I noted before. Of his critics, to paint himself as a victim or the smug know-it-all, that he has the answers to every argument for. This devolved into him leaving very long, very drawn out comments to anyone saying anything negative about him, which were riddled with ad hominem attacks and sarcasm. Soon he'd outright house, delete, and even block all negative comments entirely, which as one would expect, only showcased to 4chan, they found a new target slash locale. It also showcased he wasn't able to take any angle or measure of criticism and, well, given everything else, made him a very easy target to hate and mock. Though his caricature and persona seemed like the smug know-it-all that had the answers to everything, in truth he was a very sensitive man who is bitter and angry at everyone around him, believes he is entitled to more than what he has, and sees anyone who criticizes him as someone to be silenced. Dobson's inability to accept criticism has resulted in a multitude of explosive reactions with entire blogs and YouTube channels dedicated to cataloging that, along with the many instances of his blatant hypocrisy. I go into more, and honestly his story might be worth discussing more in detail another time, in another, like, his own video perhaps, but his history and infamy has been something of an internet legend, with a Kiwi Farms thread 1,252 pages long at the time of the writing of this script. So his history is clearly too long to fully cover here today, but I think you've got a little bit of a taste, even if there are some far more specific and at times far more funny instances that are connected to him. Nick Bait. And for our final entry this tier, we are finally at the most disgusting this tier has to offer. Oftentimes, when discussing low cows, the term horror cow comes up eventually. That is to say, someone who is no longer funny, or maybe never truly was funny, and instead of being an endless pit of people laughing, it is instead an endless pit of a human being of horrors. There is no silliness to be had, only abject terror at the actions that they commit. Horror cows, due to their very nature, are often reported to the police. And the documentation on them sort of changes from look at all these silly things they did to instead gathering evidence for all the terrible things that they are doing and have done. The term horror cow, however, doesn't even come close 
describing Nick Bait as he's quite possibly one of the most demented, revolting, and degenerate users to ever grace DeviantArt. Nick has been active on quite a few platforms, on both DeviantArt and YouTube to Twitter, and in all, he has made a name for himself. However, when it comes to actually talking about the scope of Nick's story, there is actually just way too much to cover here. So we'll just focus on the most notable events and his brief stints on DeviantArt. He first joined DA under the name Hagarumon. Nick would create a comic called Coffee Crew along with a very strange and bizarre sexual writing with many unfortunately highlighting another thing Nick is infamous for. Nick has absolutely no sense of hygiene as he's admitted to going weeks or even months without showering and his teeth are practically falling out. He's also a self-admitted caporifoliac and seems to really have a thing for assholes as well and he has an extreme sexual desire to consume feces. There is an absurd amount of documentation around Nick's fetish as he's pretty much made it a key part of his identity along with the thousands of DMs from him showcasing this disturbing devotion to his fetish. He also stalked a woman for years upon years, which again, it's a little too complicated to get into, but amongst all the other things, he also is an internet stalker. However, if you can believe it or not, all these things, while disgusting, weird, and evil, do not come even close to the most infamous thing Nick has ever done. In April of 2015, Nick was arrested for the rape of his seven-year-old sister. Nick had been sexually abusing his young sister for years and even bragged about it in numerous leaked chat logs where he gleefully talked about how he forcefully engaged in oral intercourse with her among other absolutely stomach-churning acts of pure, abject evil. However, he immediately denied everything when all this became public, taking to Twitter to claim innocence despite overwhelming evidence and an active group of people online dedicated to helping and making sure this man went behind bars. And thankfully, he would do just that as he was sentenced to 40 years in jail, with him even attempting to appeal his case, but being denied every time, thankfully. That's the broad strokes of Nick's story, but if you'd like more info of all the gritty details about this festering boil of a human being, and those who were able to take him down, then I highly recommend Cecil McFly's video covering his whole story. It's a great watch, that even despite the truly dark contents, at least ends on a semi-happy note, in that he will never be able to harm a child again. Now we are truly and completely lost. The walls shifting and contracting, ever changing are these halls. A labyrinth of art, of minds and souls. The layout is now perfectly keeping us prisoner. Well, if we meant to leave, of course. But you and I aren't looking to leave, are we? No, you wanna see the darkest depths of this place see what lays at its innermost center. That morbid curiosity is just too strong, eh? Well, I'm not one to judge, and we've already come so far. We might as well see it to its natural conclusion. So with that, let's explore further on. Our journey is almost at its end. Manda T. To start this tier off, first we have quite the bizarre character. Real name Amanda Turkoll, and now seemingly named Amari Strawberry93 on their most current account, and they were also once called Lady Alt69 back in the day, Mandatee is an active member in the self 
ship community. While not exactly noteworthy in just that, she's most infamous for the extent to which she takes it, and the extremely specific character she's fallen head over heels over. Have you guys ever heard of this little game series called Spyro the Dragon? It's uh, pretty fucking cool, pretty based, if I'm uh, being uh, perfectly honest. But that's really besides the point. Because you see, in Spyro the Dragon, specifically Spyro the Dragon 1, the original, there were these boss characters that you encounter across your journey. And the last one that you happen to face before you would end up going to the final home world to fight the game's main villain, Nasty Nork, you would end up having to face off against this boss character named Jacques, who, um, looks like this. He's this weird green goblin jack-in-the-box guy who throws boxes at you. And I'm sure that your natural reaction, regardless of your uh, specifications, uh, your, your sex or whatever, is that uh, this guy right here is pretty smoking hot. And if that is a thought that uh, went through your mind, well, Amanda just so happens to agree with you and is in fact deeply in love with Jacques. Yes, you heard that correctly. This person is sexually attracted to a Spyro the Dragon character that fucking almost nobody remembers. This jack-in-the-box goblin looking ass guy has completely ravaged the mind of this DA user in ways that can be seen in quite uh, vivid and some may say disturbing detail. Uh, I would be one of those people. It, it, it's quite disturbing. Now back in the day, this individual would draw pictures of themselves paired up with their little green jack-in-the-box fella. Pictures of themselves in sexy poses or outright being naked and uh, porn of Jacques and herself in various poses and situations. Back in the day, this was what her introduction to her DA page once said. Quote, I am 19 years old, just graduated high school from 2011. I want to get somewhere with my art, but to a lot of people think it's a competition out there. I am in a sexual love relationship with a French jack-in-the-box from Spiral the Dragon named Jacques. I'm guessing I'll add my porn on here. Hmm, I guess I will, lol, XD. Just a fucked up fangirl on the loose, unquote. In another quote, they explain why exactly they love Jacques so very much. Quote, why do I love Jacques? Well, he's unique as hell. He's got a look that. He really has a sexy feel of color. He's like the most badass jack off the box he is. He brought me back into playing Spyro again all because of one picture on DA. I don't have a boyfriend yet, but it depends since I'm actually blooming as a prettier flower. His environment is all colors and beauty, though the graphics is messed up from back in the day, but I still love it. So far, so good." Unquote. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope that was illuminating to you all. But see, here's the thing. I've shown you a few pictures of them and their lover, but I'm afraid I couldn't even begin to show you the absolute fucking depths of this woman's content. There is so much porn of her and Jacques, like unbelievable amount of it. And even worse, there is a ton of pictures of this extremely interesting individual Buck ass naked with everything exposed. I uh I have no words for the horrors I have had to see for this iceberg. But uh I suppose this is where I'm at in my life at this point, so uh be thankful that this is my weight to carry, so that you don't have to. But at any rate, this individual for all these reasons and more eventually did catch the attention of several trolls and ED in particular. And Manda certainly did not take the uh, newfound criticism and mockery very well. Quote, What I think of trolls and bullies online. They say I bully people because one group of girls are skinny. 
well, I'm just jealous of them getting more attention at the time. Now, Chris Chan, I wished him death because people tell me I am him, and it lowers my self-esteem a lot, and now I got more problems at home in real life. I might now talk to you guys again, and god damn it, I have an addiction to the internet I'm so sick of. Anyways, what the subject I'd like to talk of are the trolls and bullies. Gosh, you can't believe it. Trolls and bullies are disgusting creatures that never gives a fuck about what's on the other side of the screen. All they think is that the person they harass and bully are bots with mmm. If the person caused suicide due to this, I think we need a law to keep out emotionally unstable people. If I had a kid going to junior high school, I would not allow my child to go online at school and go through the same boat as me and Christian did. Since I feel I cannot stand people's idea of being human, to them it's to be rude and careless towards people and their feelings. This is why we have shootings most of the time. People with mental problems get bullied and nothing gets done and no discipline. We need to bring beating kids back so we can straighten their goddamn attitude before it's too late. Beating with a regular belt is fine, and I don't give a damn if you think it's inhumane. I think people need to stop having their kids being snotty and become future trolls and bullies. The free speech thing, I don't think I like all of you, so I'd shut up about intelligence because it's a major issue for society and bullies. Bullies and trolls are not smart either, because all they do is lull at someone's mentality and think it feels good. Okay, let's look at their weaknesses. Computers. Take that away and see how they feel about it when it comes to a, a person breaking and stealing it. They be all crybaby about it. If you do troll or bully, would you like your laptop or desktop taken or broken? If no, that is your weakness right there. Anyways, that is my thoughts for today, and hopefully things will get better." Unquote. They would then end up going bonkers on the ED article made about them, and would go on several rants and tirades on both DA and their fur affinity page which resulted in many of their closest friends and fanbase that they surprisingly had built up over time coming to their defense, until even they began to tell them that they should just ignore all of this, which they, uh, didn't end up doing. This would go so far that YouTuber and famous online critic of the time, Blackbuster Critic, would make a reaction video to their content, making fun of them and their general behavior. In response, this is what they had to say about it. Quote, Well, hello, DA. What has been happening lately is, hmm, let me say, people have been linking me to this bitchy, hmm, who is on YouTube now twice. I have the right to complain of this. Since it's getting on my nerves, and sorry to say it like a racist, but making re reaction videos like that, making him a swagger, eh, that's a mmm, shit, I'm sorry. Don't complain to me on that, since you all call me and the others like me mmms, and it hurts. You love seeing the results of pain? Well, how about a best friend slash lover slash family member being cut with a knife and see how it feels to see your buddies suffer from pure pain? Want me out of the internet for good? Try and find ways to kick me out quickly, impatient fucks. You're smart enough, right? If you don't listen, I guess I'll report as trolling spam and such, I don't know. Also, by the way, here's a little message about me, in which you all don't give a shit anyways because you love others in pain and having so much fun making someone possible for yeah, so don't call me uh mm, over something I cannot fucking help. Being myself, not like most of the American population of being douchebags and whiny little brats like the popular girls. All they mostly do is catfight. Guys, in my view, catfight too. So keep it shut over the stupidest shit. 
like boyfriend girlfriend reservations, cell phones, game systems, money in a very low amount, an example, an American quarter 25 cents, and other such. Calling someone a mmm is like calling a black man a mmm, an Asian a mmm, people from the Middle East mmm, etc, etc. So, would you like it if I also call you a slut, a fat ass, a fuck, d bitch, idiot, and so on? Then don't call me a hmm, and I'll try and keep that side of my feelings in as much as possible. Unless you keep pushing me over the limit. This is thanks from the natural attention whore, unquote. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. I could go on a while longer with their past, but I think you pretty much get the point by now. That being said, these days it seems that they are, uh, still doing the exact same thing that they were doing before. So, uh, yeah, I guess they're living out their life. I've heard that they're also making cuck art related to Jacques now as well, so, uh, you know, that's a cool new development, I guess. I'm sure they also love the Reignited Trilogy and getting to see Jacques in glorious HD, but with all that said, let's go ahead and move on for now. Anthroplanes slash vehicles. Ah, uh, now this is an interesting, strange thing indeed. This entry refers to a subgenre of artwork that, well, is about anthropomorphized planes and vehicles. Though planes seem to really be the most popular choice amongst these people, but there is still plenty of car-related art as well. Art of this variety can come in several shapes and sizes, but ultimately these are usually made because the person finds planes sexually attractive. Have you ever just been playing Ace Combat 7 and looking at the back of that F-22 Raptor and thought to yourself, holy shit, I wanna fuck the shit out of that thing. Well, this is essentially the mindset, and uh, as I looked further down this rabbit hole, I found that anthroplanes were often connected directly to the furry fandom as well. Like they are pretty much one and the same as a matter of fact. I guess to be fair, they sort of are animal-like once you start adding expressions and bend and squash to them. Plus both furries and these fellows both find it uh, sexually gratifying to add human features onto things that you cannot or shouldn't attempt to mate with. It's all rather uh, bizarre to say the least. There are also plain sonas like fursonas. And of course, just like many furries, this obsession with anthro characters usually doesn't stop just there. And you can find loads and loads of fetish art involving anthroplanes, including everybody's favorite, Vor. Yes, indeed. We are so fucking far down this rabbit hole that we are talking about anthroplane Vor art. There truly is no going back. And I am also extremely, extremely tired of looking at Vor art in general. I went from, well, live and let live, to I actively am hoping for your downfall. I think I could happily live the rest of my life without seeing another piece of Vor art. Shame. Shame upon you all, you crazed cannibalistic cretins. 2010 Christmas Hack. This entry is referring to when DA was hacked and up to 13 million user emails, usernames, and birth dates were compromised. The breach is believed to have occurred via the Silver Pop System Incorporated, a marketing company DeviantArt uses to communicate with its users through a mailing list. Forest Dweller Houses An older user of DA, John or Forest Dweller Houses, was a woodcarver who spent his final months posting beautiful carvings of bird homes. Sadly, however, on November 17th of 2015, John's wife announced his death from cancer, and thousands outpoured in support. Viewing his page now comes with a heavy heart, knowing this man knew he was going to die, but still stood strong and did what he loved. According to his wife, he died peacefully in his sleep, a fitting end for a man who just wanted to show the world his cute wood carvings, and yet another reminder to enjoy the little things in life, to create art, to impart beauty onto the world, until the very end. 
Bonnie Cakes. Bonnie Cakes was a user who was most active in the Undertale fandom, with much of their art focusing on feet fetishism. The lower quality of the art, coupled with it being Undertale characters, most of the time meant their art was a constant target for ridicule. However, it seems like their account is deleted now, and nearly all evidence of their existence has been wiped clean besides this video by Deviant Cringe talking about the user. Okay everyone, so here uh, he is. Here is uh, Bonnie Cakes. Don't forget the cheese, a digital art hobbyist. Uh, Johnny Power is a male from the United States and he's been on DA for two years and he's even got his own little group. And uh, as you can see uh, right from this little preview right here, yeah, uh, it basically is what it sounds like. Plant foot fetish. So, uh, before we get into that, let's uh, read his uh, DAID a little bit. It's, uh, I bet it's gonna be fun. Read this, please. Hello, I am a foot fetish artist. If you don't like what you see, you should probably leave. Well, uh, what if I decide to stay? I'm also open for role-playing, so feel free to drop me a note. Foot fetish RP rules. I don't allow feet uh, licking, smelling dirty feet, or toe sucking. Sometimes I will, but don't count on it. Oh yeah, uh, if you want those things, you better pray that uh, that he uh, thinks it is uh, adequate. Let God, their commentary was so bad. But yeah, that's pretty much all that there is to this one. If they were still around, I might look a little bit further, but it seems like they have uh, deleted their account and moved on with their life. Diaper Transformation An obscenely obscure fetish, this one involves a person wishing to be transformed into a diaper. I can't really show any pictures related to this one, but the concept is they want to be turned into a diaper so that they can be used. You know, shit and piston. Though I think an even darker angle of this fetish is the fact that diapers are always used for babies, and thus they want to be used by an infant and close to them in a... Uh... Yeah, I think you uh, catch my drift on why this is really fucking creepy. Yet another disgusting and strange fetish. Hackobart. Real name Kebel Garsavian. Sorry if I uh, mispronounced that. Even with the language barrier and small audience, was immensely active in many Brazilian groups on DeviantArt, as well as founding one of the most popular Brazilian groups on DA, Forum du Blonet. Sadly, however, on April 4th of 2015, Cacao would pass away from ammonia, and his forums slash groups still stand to this day. Jerryman19 Being active in fandoms like Powerpuff Girls, Kids Next Door, and My Hero Academia, Jerryman, real name Jerryman Diallo, was a modestly popular artist based in the Philippines, who also had a small YouTube channel where she did speed paints. Tragically, however, she took her own life in 2017, and while the exact details are still unclear, eyewitnesses state that she was spotted on the fifth floor of a mega mall and jumped to her death. Her art is the only thing that remains now, and it's a real tragedy to see someone so talented throw their life away. Godzilla 713 Godzilla 713, while lesser known, still deserves a mention for the sheer amount of bondage art they've made of various cartoon women. And by sheer amount, I'm talking nearly 8,000 pieces like these done over the course of 14 years. Clearly, the man doesn't get tired of this trope or precise type of drawing. They are still very active to this day. Peyton the Rylu. Peyton is a strange user who's quite infamous for his various fetishes, be them Vore, Diapers, and Pokemon. Often, all together, of course, as well as being quite homophobic and well known for going out of their way to antagonize people. Sadly, most of this user stuff has been cast off the internet, with his DA account being deactivated and his Fur Affinity account being suspended. It's difficult to get the whole scope of this guy's antics, but there are a few screenshots from that time, which I'll quickly give a read so you can get a kind of taste of who this person was. Quote, Hello! Nice try, Miss Lesbian. Get off my fucking profile. Hoi! Hey, f guys. I saw your favorites and I see you like gays. So I'm blocking you because you're a disgusting, worthless f guys who will burn in hell. Unquote. There is also an old The Names Junkie video on the guy which showcases 
uh, much of the same stuff. Omega Rider 99. This is an obscure user who happens to have a strange obsession slash hatred of the Loud House cartoon, which is pretty funny because most of these interesting individuals seem to have some fucking crazy opinion or love for uh, the Loud House. They just cannot get enough of the Loud House, and they also seem to usually be somewhat attracted to these various cartoon kids. But uh, that's just an observation I've made over the years. At any rate, he also has these edits of Drew Pickles from the Rugrats as various Power Rangers villains uh, for some reason. So uh, yeah, that's neat, I guess. Walter Ratley, a seemingly regular user, his profile seems normal on the surface. But one glance at his favorites shows a wealth of commissioned foot fetish art. There is a treasure trove of uh, foot fetish art he's commissioned or commented on under his favorites, and he seems to have a particular interest in Coco Bandicoot's feet from the Crash Bandicoot franchise I've noticed. But he's also not picky. If the shoe fits, he'll be sure to make some quite enlightening comments such as these. Quote, Ooh, mmm, yeah, my love, horny, wet foot fetish and slow jack off to Rouge's light tan soles. Much love it. My favorite love, sexy Coco's tan soles. It's beautiful. Heart emoji. Mmm, my lovely, sexy, horny, wet foot fetish on Honey's light tan soles. Be very shine, beautiful it, heart and kiss emojis. Hearts and eyes emoji, hearts emoji, fucking wet emoji, thumbs up emoji, feet emoji, 100% emoji. Shocked emoji. Damn. Fuck. My lovely, horny, hot, sexy Jane reads 10 souls, very beautiful, much love it, I will. Want see more new pics. A Jane reads tan souls soon. Heart emoji. Mmm, smiley emoji. Wow. Damn, very sexy Sally. Slight and souls. Beautiful it. In love emoji. <laughs> so, uh, he um, definitely has some choice words for the topic. But then when I decided to actually take a peek at this guy's gallery to see what wonders he himself had created, I started to notice an interesting pattern. Can you, uh, tell what it is yet? Ah, uh, yes, why, he's a certified communist. You know, the thing that you guys totally think aren't nearly as bad as, uh, Nazis, despite them also mass genociding people, including Jewish people, might I add. But no, nah, no, nah, I get what you mean. This guy, he's different. He's got a plan, you see. He's a man of history. When he reads books about how everyone historically starved under communist rule, he didn't even try to deny it. He embraced it. It's all part of his big brain plan, you see. If people can't eat, then desperate measures need to be taken for people to be able to survive. Such as eating things that they don't normally eat. And what's one of the first things they're more than likely historically to begin eating? That's right their shoes. That's the goal of the 10-year plan. And then he'll get to see all the feet he could ever possibly want. Truly a mastermind worthy of your admiration. Rafe 15. Rafe is a user who has become a lolcow due to his rather crude mummifications slash bondage art, which you can see here, and has a rather interesting description to go with it, that I, uh, suppose I'll go ahead and give a read. Forever real, tied up Basil, fully permanently delicized, full permanent Bologna head, and a full permanent Bologna body, with two permanent Bologna feet, a permanent pastrami nose, and a permanent Bologna ham and cream cheese tongue, two permanent ham lips, and a mixture of tomato, pizza, barbecue, and taco sauce running through permanent Bologna veins to all permanent Bologna organs and permanent Bologna incise as foreverial tied up basil blood type, fully wrapped, 
all forever tied up all over from fully deliticized head to fully deliticized foot rope mummification leaving only head and feet visible through bondage. The front view of Forever Old Tied Up T-Bone, smiling wide open permanent bologna mouth, happily showing his huge thick permanent bologna ham and cheese tongue. Next image of Forever Old Tied Up T-Bone. Forever Old Tied Up Justin, fully wrapped, tied up, rope mummified, covered in permanent rubbery rope, bondage, also fully delicized completely from head to foot, fully permanent bologna head covered in brown fur with a full permanent bologna mouth and two ham lips, fully permanent living bologna body with full permanent bologna organs and bologna inside, fully permanent bologna legs with full permanent bologna feet and permanent bologna ham and cream cheese tongue and forever real tied up, Justin is enjoying it being this way and wants to stay this way and remain this way for him so he can have fun. Of course, he is gonna get this way since this is permanent, unquote. Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't actually know what the fuck I just read. Comment down below if you have a translation, uh, I, I, I got the idea that they are permanently turned to Bologna. It doesn't really look like they've been turned into that, though, from the pictures. I, I, I don't, I, I guess it's like a totally different fetish. So, maybe even one that's so hyper-specific that only he has it, maybe? I, I don't know. Now, among his many posts, he also has uploaded what is by far one of the funniest pictures paired with a title that I have ever seen. <laughs> the, uh... Description of this fine bit of photography reads, A photo of me laying down being bored, as I am so bored most of the time. Doesn't matter if I am at work or at home, I tend to be so damn bored and I can't get over being bored. Why? Because my life is boring. It's boring as hell. How lame is that? A bored 26 year old human boy child. Unquote. Now, it would seem that people eventually found his extremely strange pictures with the odd and nonsensical descriptions in them, and he would later respond quite harshly, to uh, say the least. Quote, I don't understand this. It seems the stuff I have on here being looked at a lot is the stuff on here that means absolutely at all, and actually wondering if I should have even posted. The bondage stuff and the petrification is something I want to known for. That just random stuff that means. I did that stuff at a time when I was really angry. Not that I am not angry now. <laughs> but to criticize me and demean me over something that doesn't mean anything. That is just BS. If you don't like like or if you hate something, the simple thing to do is not respond. Why not respond on the other stuff, as in the art I actually have worked, the stuff I have been trying to improve on, and better rather than what I put on here because of a certain way I feeling. Plus, just because I posted bondage doesn't mean that something I usually do, and it doesn't mean I like being tied up, who would enjoy. I don't know anybody whom would enjoy being in handcuffs and taken off to prison, even though that has never happened to me, doesn't mean I want it. My main interests are the military and weaponry. I have been also a number of fantasy and anthropomorphic stuff. Why not respond to that instead, instead of the body tissue transformations and bondage? That doesn't really have any meaning for me anymore. That was a short period back in my high school years when I was extremely upset because of the issues and problems I had back then. Why not respond on the Australian native images? That's what I do a lot. I wish I had the skill and talent that many other artists on here and abroad have, but I don't. I don't need BS from people who honestly say things like pinching girls and everyone else on the ass on the time. People whom actually I feel just came on here to criticize the hell out of me which I don't appreciate, unquote. Unbelievably atrocious grammar and general sentences aside, 
Yeah. Remember kids, if you don't want to be remembered online for something, especially if it's extremely weird, then don't post that very thing online. And especially also do not keep it posted on your fucking profile. Seems like a simple piece of advice, and yet so many don't seem to understand this. But, oh well. UTTP. This is definitely a relic of its time, but the YouTube Troll Police, or shortened to the UTTP, is a group of trolls infamous for raiding various communities on Twitter, for affinity, and yes, even DeviantArt. They also made videos around these operations to uh, kill fandoms and harass random people, with this being an example of one. Now from what I've gathered, the ringleader of this stupid gang of cringe is a guy by the name of Tommy Parker, who started all this to, uh, I, I, I don't really know to be honest. I guess it was just for the lols, it was just kind of because it was, you know, funny, just kind of trolling people, I mean, yeah. They also seem to be deeply connected with the Go Animate scene on YouTube, which is kind of its own rabbit hole, but again, they were easy targets for them. There is also just tons of obscure videos talking about being a part of or being anti-UTTP. But I'll be honest with you guys, this shit is so dumb that I can't really be bothered looking that much deeper into it than this. You pretty much get the point. It was a bunch of trolls that were like attacking people and making kind of stupid videos connected to it. And all of it was pretty obscure and it never really hit any kind of real impact whatsoever. It's a bunch of people LARPing on social media platforms and being edgy, and there really isn't much more to it than that. Buzzly Art Out of all the alternatives to DeviantArt, probably none have fallen as hard as Buzzly, and it seems to be a rather untold story, especially because I had never even heard of this site until reading about it via this iceberg entry. So, let's dive into it. According to a Reddit post via r slash internet drama, quote, So basically, there was this new art site called Buzzly Art, branded as Made By and For Artists. It's effectively a clone of 2014 DeviantArt, and was slash still is in beta currently. But it started to pick up quite fast over time. Plenty of people who wanted new, more active gallery type sites to post their art had begun migrating. However, roughly in late January to early February, the site had closed off registration indefinitely. Things were slightly shaky in the beginning, and there were some decisions made and things done that caused some drama. The first somewhat well-known one was when a user had made a slightly suggestive joke about someone's artwork, and staff had basically told them that was inappropriate. To most people, it seemed strange and and over the top on the staff's part. Others had also reported that they had been given strikes over seemingly trivial things. But for the most part, this was not a huge issue for everyone. More so, those who had migrated from other websites. Another later on was the staff's decision to ban content that involved incest, which apparently was a problem earlier on. This caused multiple people with varying opinions to chime in. Supposedly, the official Discord got nuked sometime after this. Staff had claimed it was so that they could focus on the site more. However, some people believed it was to erase backlash. There were also some other things brought up, like how staff was slow to ban Nazi imagery posted on the site, as well as one of the devs being supportive of crypto and NFTs. But none of this was yet cause of any actual uproar among community members. Where shit hit the fan. On March 14th, one of the devs put out a poll about a community moral compass. The options on the poll were strangely worded, and some felt that they had been phrased in such a manner in order to elicit a reaction. Which they did. Because of this, naturally, a lot of people were left confused and pissed off. The members would attempt to confront the staff members about this. However, most seemed hesitant to reply immediately. A staff member would then rush Twitter and tweet about the poll, promising a Google Doc on the matter later on. As they promised, the same staff member would then post a statement 
inside a Google document on Twitter about the whole situation, and an explanation on why the poll was the way it was. Now, what this ultimately amounted to was two of the staff members known as Chris and Pokemutt were the ones to blame, though a majority of people put emphasis on Chris for the poll. Effectively, Chris had thrown away any criticism other staff members had given to the poll he had made and posted it anyway, for some reason. To add insult to injury, some people dug up more info about Pokemutt's past and found details which had suggested that Pokemutt was a pedophile. Pokemutt would then eventually have uh, his mod perms stripped and account removed, as well as a nuking of his Twitter and DeviantArt account. Three other staff members would then quit, but would have their accounts still listed as developers, though later on, Nim's account would also disappear. This resulted in both Chris and Pokemutt's pages, before he left, to be spammed with angry comments, copy pastas, and general bullshittery. People also began leaving en masse, and would spam the main page with memes, statements, and farewells, as well as porn and gore. They'd also post images advising others to delete or replace their artwork files with different images, so that they could not be minted as NFTs. It really is hard trying to figure out what the motive Chris had for shitting the website up, but from what some have speculated, he did so for purposes of promoting crypto slash NFTs, which as mentioned earlier is something he supports, though really this is just a rumor as well as filtering out users he didn't want using the poll. TLDR, newish seemingly promising art site gets launched. People get distrustful due to repetitive sketchy behavior of certain staff members. All hell breaks loose when terribly written poll gets put out and people leave the site due to being fed up with staff unprofessionalism." Unquote. So yeah, that's the story of Bosley Art in a nutshell. It would seem that truly, while DA is full of some of the most stupid and crazy people around, as well as general degeneracy, we must remember that these things are certainly not exclusive to the site, as the same can clearly be found truly anywhere and everywhere on the internet. Bonus Entry Sheezy slash Sheezy Art Speaking of DA alternatives, this one is a classic but not really a true alternative. See, back in the day when I was a team perusing around DeviantArt, destroying my young mind, I remember several people would say on the forums and other such places that, man, DeviantArt is overrated. Sheezy is where it's at. It's got a better community. And I always wondered if that was true. That's when I looked up the site and saw that it was a site made for furry artists and uh, I, Never really looked back to be honest, but I do think it's interesting to look at it now since it was so often brought up back in the day and is a part of uh, artist history that I don't really see people talking about these days. According to Wikifur, quote, Sheezy Art, also known as Sheezy, was an online art site devoted to all types of media including traditional, digital, photography, writing, pixel art, and animation. It originally operated from 2003 to 2013, and it was later revived by a former user in 2021 as Sheezy Art. But the revival ended up being short-lived. The servers for the revived site closed down in 2022, and its community will continue to live on as a Discord server. Sheezy Art's visual template is based on the same used at the DeviantArt art gallery, and as so, allows user commentary on the artwork, journals, and user pages. Sheezy Art, like DeviantArt, offered a set of forums in which the community could gather. Works containing explicitly adult material slash subject matter was forbidden. Sheezy Art had a tolerance for harmless trolling and to some degree, uh, was encouraged. Argumentative and aggressive behavior was often seen and tolerated but outright aggression and harassment was usually reprimanded. Sheezy Art's old mascot was a raccoon named Dante, until it was removed in March of 2007 from the site. A channel cat officially stated that this was done because we felt he didn't represent the artist well. Dante was created by a former staff member 
Venzi, a cosplayer and prop slash product designer. Later on a Sheezy Art Club, the Bring Back Dante Club was created to preserve the memory of the former mascot." Unquote. And on the note of all adult content being banned, quote, In January 2005, Sheezy Art banned all adult material, content on its archive, deleting all media tagged as adult, citing a new server host policies restrictions on said content. Many adult artists expressed disbelief at the administrator's explanation, believing the new policies to be unfair and unnecessary at best, a form of intentional persecution at worst, with some leaving the site altogether. In its original incarnation, Shizu Art allowed all type of content, including adult media, in contrast to DeviantArt's content restrictions rules. This made it a popular archive for adult art and artists, including those in the furry fandom. During the site's 2005 adult art ban, some of these furry artists would migrate to such galleries as Fur Affinity and Y Exclamation Gallery, both of which were, at the time, furry friendly and without content restrictions." Unquote. Fur Affinity is still up and running to this day, of course. Full on min-maxed on degeneracy and all, while Sheezy Art is a thing of the past, which I believe truly does say something about society. I'll let you consider what that something is, but uh, yeah. An interesting note in the online art and furry community, at the very least. Roderick Natas. Roderick features bizarre edits, most of which seem to hyperfixate on Nazis, but to the extent of it coming off a bit as a fetish. There's also a lot of bondage art here as well that can be seen. They also seem to have a thing for a Batman, and it's just some very bizarre looking stuff, but uh, yeah, not much more to say on it than that. Creepshot slash Explanation Stalked Explanation Community By far one of the most disturbing rabbit holes on DA, there exists entire groups of people running pages based exclusively around taking creepy and very compromising photos of women without their consent. One example that Nora was able to find was a user by the name of Username is Taken, who is often commenting under other such posts with links and alike to their own collections. What's most insidious is that there has been no coverage on this whatsoever, and with DA's implementation of subscriptions, you can hide this stuff from the prying public, or even sell outright malicious content without anyone knowing at all. User the Creepy Stalker 101 was another in the community and had this as their profile header. Hi, this girl I'm posting used to be a school bully. She was mean and sort of rough around the edges. So as payback, I'm posting her selfies and her creep shots. And on his page appeared to be hundreds of photos of this girl, some of which could be considered a sort of revenge porn. Most of their profiles also had some variation of the tag explanation stalked explanation on their profile. Now that being said, uh, both of these profiles have since been taken down and I really don't want to show a bunch of pictures of women on DA collected by these creeps or anyone else since again it is completely non-consensual and is, well, kind of giving them what they want if you showcase the pictures. But it's certainly not at all difficult to find on the site, and is one of the far more creepy and at times outright evil underbellies of the site in general. Gamera 1985 Gamera definitely takes the cake for weird amalgamations of multiple fetishes, showcasing combinations of pregnancy, conjoined twins, missing limbs, and even fusion to rather unsettling results. Some of their older pieces, like this of a lion girl or this uh, nine-tailed fox girl, showcase some interesting tastes in anatomy. But it was this piece, Ancient Orange Gift from 2006, that was the first image depicting the odd fetish art they would come to be known by and that they will continue making on into this day, to much more extreme levels. Themes of them being an avid enjoyer of crippled anime bitches can be seen here as well. Now as far as their newer art goes, I can't show you much because the vast majority of it is just straight up porn, but you can see here by some of these more recent 
pieces that they certainly evolved their art style and their extreme to the fetish, creating some extremely bizarre pictures to say the least. A very strange yet also very popular DA page. Bonus entry, Doggy Saga, as suggested by Philemon. So I'm gonna be real, this entry is such a wild rabbit hole that I need to preface it with this. I'm just gonna show you stuff and talk in general terms about this individual because they kind of are hard to grasp. And what I mean by that specifically is they make a lot of really edgy, really crazy content, but it also kind of feels like they're taking the piss most of the time. But also there's like 20 layers of irony and meta on top of everything that kind of makes it hard to fully know where they stand on anything. But there's going to be content where they're literally talking about being a Nazi and then also actively making fun of Nazis and people who associate with it. But to start, Doggy Saga is an individual who has been on DA as well as a YouTube and as well as a BitChute channel and they also have a website and generally speaking create this very strange meta humor ironic art and post some wild fucking shit everywhere they go. Their original DeviantArt account was deleted quite some time ago, but uh, well, let's read the about me. Quote, all my tumblers deleted because DDLG gangstalkers gave me a traumagenic system and interject alters of my abusers, unquote. And here seems to be one of the last journals that they made on this old DeviantArt page, which reads as, quote, My wife and her son. They are my sunshine. My wife can sometimes identify as my husband when she puts on two dildos into my sissy feminine dong and pooper, and then I eat the poop. My wife's son is a cool person, but he does not like poop. He will go for weeks without pooping. When he does poop, though, the toilet gets blocked. I am made to eat poop by my wife's boyfriend because we do not have a toilet brush because she does not like to have plastic objects in the house." Unquote. So, uh, yeah. Here you can also see some of their art, of which I can't really show a ton of, but they have a lot of ironic political commentary to the best I can tell. Looking at their website, which I think is down these days, but was once up back in 2020, you can kind of see the wild and weird aesthetics that they have. And on their about me section of the site, it says, quote, I am a pink dogkin, a white woman of color, and I have two autistic diagnoses. I am also a pro-pink dog nationalist against lizards and their anti-Zionism. My pro-pink dog nationalist husband, Mr. Doggy, is also against anti-Zionist lizards too. When I am not warning the world of evil globalist satanic pedophile lizards, I am thinking of more ways to expose the disgusting lizards. What this website is about. This website is about displaying Doggy Saga comics providing wiki information on Doggy Saga characters, their culture, lore, and concepts, as well as creating Doggy Saga games. The color of Doggy Saga dogs show different meanings as these animals come from a billion year old parallel universe. Lizards lurk in the shadows with the instinct to suck the life out of Earth and destroy all the plants they can. Farts are their only weakness. The website aims to be as interactive as possible, with lots of audio recordings that read out text for the blind, and text explaining what dog is which color for the colorblind. The website adds extra content without altering the original work." Unquote. Here you can find tons of art, comics, videos, and artistic projects of all kinds really. Again, some of which is too risque to show here on YouTube. But they are certainly very interesting, to say the least. Then we have the videos, which if you go to their current channel, you will see various rants from them on camera. And they go kind of something like this. The questioning bunnies will no longer be questioning the human rights abuses of forced drugging. Okay, so I'm really sick of being the only one who's really fucking 
doing any real protesting against the forced drugging and um, I'm fucking sick of it. I'm fucking sick of the mentally ill cowards who don't um, fight for their rights at all and they have literally uh, made it so the system is the way that it is that it's so easily able to continually force drug us okay and i'm actually i've been using affirmations to cure myself and now i'm like i've been making significant um breakthroughs with my affirmations and all i really have to say is you know fuck the mentally ill because um <laughs> because um you haven't done shit and i'm Fucking done. Done. I am now. I don't usually address the lies told about me um, these days, but you know what? Uh, this one thing really uh, grinds my gears. <laughs> it's um, <clears throat> when you're all fucking lie about. Uh, you know how my husband uh, told me and all that it's like um, I stopped being a Nazi and then he dumped me that's how it happened because I told him not to be a Nazi anymore and I'm not gonna fucking do that and he um, he was like no I'm not gonna stop being a Nazi what's the good thing anyway that we're not together because I don't fucking him and never did he's so fucking ugly his dick holes in the wrong place he smells like shit like jesus christ like go further back and you can see some animations and get a taste for their style of comedy how are my little boy hey kyungi oh hey spacey kyungi do e cg can Fuckers doof kyangi, doof fuckers hoodoi, doof impossible maloof, domo ban many watch if be maui. Give me a bitch, fuckers you dish. Go even further back, and you're gonna have to go to their bit shoot channel, in which you'll see there there are several episodes of a series that they called the Legendary Happy Chan, which again I'll just show a little bit of here. Watashi wa happy chan. Watashi wa six years old and a student of the Nazi Gaku. Yeah. Now I could go far deeper, and honestly, this individual might be worth doing a wandering the web episode in the near future. But for now, I think you've at least gotten a taste of their stuff, and you now know where to look if you wish to go check out their stuff a more extensively. Bonus entry, Underwater Peril, suggested by Oop345. DA user and subscriber Oop345 suggested this weird rabbit hole of a fetish that usually goes by the name Underwater Peril. The concept of this fetish being around a cartoon or anime character drowning. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much it, that's the fetish. Some examples of artists in this fetish scene include user Mega Go Go Man, who you can see here actually classifies themselves as an aquaphile, and some of their art just shows anime women diving and swimming in the water happily, while others are much more grim, horrifying, etc. Jim Leisman and Ick the Hearns are some more examples of artists in the scene. The latter of which I cannot show you any of their art because everyone is completely naked and drowning in all their works. The same user who suggested this entry also noted that they are very much into this fetish and really enjoy it. So I decided to ask them 
what they enjoy about this particular fetish so much. To which they responded, quote, Well, I grew up by the ocean, and it didn't really click until I found these old Vince's pornographic images and videos of women pretending to drown. They were made by a company called Aquafan. That's what most people who uh, like this call themselves, which had people pretending to drown. Usually it's bondage and fetish like because of bikinis and stuff. A woman underwater seems more sexy to a lot of people. So what would happen if they met a grim fate? Well, you now have underwater peril. The Aquafan videos are hosted on a forum called Underwater Clip Source, which is where you can find a lot more information in the rabbit hole of the fetish." Unquote. Now I could dive a lot deeper into this fetish, but I think you get the point. I will say that this fetish does seem to be connected deeply with just a morbid fascination with death and suffering, generally speaking. Since drowning is one of those things that isn't instant and looks extremely painful and stressful, it's hard to not feel as though these people kind of just get off to the idea of people dying in a slow, terrifying way in front of them. Which, speaking of, hanging fetish. This is a fetish that revolves around women hanging themselves with captions alluding to spadeas. And this comes in the form of both art and photographs. It's a disturbing rabbit hole that I really don't want to give much attention as it's full of extremely sick fucks and some content you definitely should avoid on DA in general. Once again, this is a fetish connected to death, which I cannot fathom or understand why anyone would get off to any of this. And frankly, I don't ever want to know. So, moving on. Bonus entry. Oni Gojira Kaiju, as suggested by Duncaster. And we have here yet another lol cow. With well over a decade of stupid activity and internet foolishness generally speaking to come over. It all apparently started back in 2003 on a site called RC2000's Godzilla Tribute, which on a random note is a site I kind of remember visiting as a kid, maybe at least once or twice, as I was really, really truly obsessed with Godzilla and visited nearly every website involving him back in the day. While RC2000's Godzilla Tribute is no longer up, there is an old site called Godzilla Website Hall of Fame, which mentions it as, quote, I give it 5 out of 5 Godzillas. Our next inductee has done a super job creating a Godzilla site. He excels in originality and is currently working on a feature that I'm super excited about. Greg Graves runs a superb site that focuses on Godzilla and Angerus. He is a co-owner of the Angerus movement implemented on my homepage. He's a cool guy and fun to talk with." Unquote. Not that it's extremely important, but I figure it's uh, nice to have a little bit of context about a site that you've probably never heard of. Something else that's also been archived, of course, is someone who personally had to deal with and witness the first major sighting of Oni Gojira Kaiju. That someone is user Ghostwalker, who also has a DA page, might I add, and is quite the excellent artist, that has had to deal with Oni Gojira, or his real name, Mark, for some time now, and notes, quote, It all started back in 2003. I was the admin of a small forum called RC2000's Godzilla Tribute, and there was this kid named Mark who posted nonsensical comments and reviewed stories with barely any coherence. And then I told him several times to stop it, and he started PMing me with lots and lots of spamming. And then he board stalked me, and then he did the same on Rodan's Roost and on Kaiju Galaxy. And then finally I told him, fuck off. And that's when he started acting like a dick wanting to make me miserable, because I wouldn't praise him like the obsessive fanboy stalker he is. Yeah, that is what Mark is. He's an obsessive fanboy stalker with no life, one hand on his dick, jacking off the Freddy Krueger porn, and posting on one of my message boards about how much, like, Scorpius he is." Unquote. And Ghostwalker was apparently not alone, as Mark was generally considered a bit of an edgy annoyance to most who he encounters online, 
and he is well known for his wild ass rants like this one, quote, irritating bipolar people. Well, given my stepdad is one, Ghost Walker 2061 here on DeviantArt is one. They can go to hell. Who likes these freaks anyway? Who like to threaten and verbally abuse others? In my opinion, these people are better off than they lick themselves. I wish they'd do that, smiley face. Nothing goes their way. They threaten the person nearest to them that is vulnerable. In my opinion, these freaks and people like them are better having never been born at all. Their incest parents should never have met and created them. Literally, in Ghost Walker 2061's case. She loves dear old daddy too much. Her dad abused her and yet she loves him. Does that not sound messed up or what? Same goes with my stepdad. His dad was abusive and yet he went to the asshole's deathbed. Yeah, my guess was right too. Take the dead guy's money, which he did. People like these two are bad examples of humanity. And in my opinion, since they are not family or friends, they can suffer in hell or raped by the devil. Who cares anyway about bipolar people? I don't, with their annoying behavior and mood swings, etc. Fuck them. I say lock them in a nuthouse forever and let them rot. Ghostwalker once said she was in one. She probably should have stayed in there and my stepdad should have never been born. Seriously, if asshole parents never wanted a kid or abused that kid, why did they meet or have kids to begin with? What a stupid, stupid thing to do. The end result is two assholes who are a pain in the ass. Unquote. And again, this hatred and cyber-stalking of Ghost Walker caught many off guard as he kept this violent vendetta from a fucking old-ass Godzilla form alive and going over on DeviantArt for some time. How long is some time? Well, how about over 10 years? Again, 10 years of cyber-stalking and fucking molding and seething on DeviantArt all over a Godzilla fansite forum drama, as well as some stepdad relay complex that he is for some reason placing onto this random person online. And they are far from the only other person who has been a victim of his never-ending spamming and stalker behavior, with users like Cindy, who actually has their own EB article, like Mark actually, and Eternal Mothra, the creator of the website Kaiju Galaxy, also being victims of his torment. Cindy had this to write about Mark. Quote, Oh God, Mark, I won't go into the past. I'll just tell you straight up what he did recently. He has utterly disgusted me in every possible way I can be disgusted by a person. This dude snapped. I mean, snapped. It happened over somebody on DeviantArt with legit autism who was making the same mistake that led to my ED page. I tried to warn her about it nicely. I don't want to see her get hurt by them the way I was. I know why they trolled me. I've taken measures to atone for and not repeat that behavior. Experience is a great teacher, and I knew she'd get hit hard if she continued. I replied to a thread she posted telling her why sites have ruled and that her behavior is coming off as a special snowflake. Mark got wind of it. He started attacking me in replies to the thread and blocked me so I couldn't respond directly to him. Then he wrote a short story with Freddy Krueger committing violent acts against me and he had it sent to me via note through a friend. Mark gloated that he knew I hate gore and hoped I liked his little story. Reading that story tells me he fantasizes about either doing this or seeing this happen to me. This disturbed me enough to not sleep well for a few nights, and I hope I never meet him in person at a con. I don't trust him to keep his hands off me. Just seeing his name anywhere makes me feel like throwing up." Unquote. Some more general info about Mark is he thinks that he is Freddy Krueger. He also thinks that he is like Scorpius. He'll often try to be an internet tough guy using intimidating roleplay style text and death threats. However, if you say anything negative to him, he will write you off as just another person who he doesn't have to listen to, whether you're a forum moderator or a random internet person calling him out for his stupid behavior. And as much as a evil, hard ass he likes to pretend he is, 
he is actually extremely sensitive and will break down at the slightest bit of resistance from anyone calling him out or making fun of him. The attention he also craves from something like an ED article, for example, he then goes on to whine about how people are bullying him. This being a clear case of someone who can dish it out, but certainly cannot take it. Oh, right, and I, uh, almost forgot to mention that he also has a fetish for reptiles and finds them sexually attractive. Quote, rubbing a raptor's slit here in her purr and growl while rocking her hips against my hand, eyes sliding shut, and at times yelping as she near. You know, crocodiles and humans did have sex together. I read a book on ancient Egyptian life, and the book even said such stuff was common for women to ride a male crocodile. I bet the crocodile didn't see the human as food, but a pleasure toy. Not to mention if she sucked him off, the reptile would find human anatomy most enticing, especially after that experience." Unquote. This is beyond one of the craziest and most disgusting things I have ever seen someone write. But uh, on top of all that, he has also made a ton of porn related to Godzilla and other kaijus having sex with humans. And it's uh, all very, very, very disturbing to see and obviously stuff that I cannot show you here on YouTube. I really could go on for quite a while longer as Mark's history online is quite storied and full of extreme stupidity and cringe. Maybe it's even worth a wandering the web someday. Who knows? But for now, I think that you more than get the point. Timbox. For our final entry this tier, we have a very interesting rabbit hole of a user to search through. Timbox, or Timbox129, has been around for a very long time online and has some very interesting creative projects and history to see. To start, their profile says, No Bullies Allowed Please, and one of the newest posts on their page is about online bullying, clearly showcasing that people have taken an interest in him, and he has taken an interest in their interest likewise. If you come over his DeviantArt account, something that you'll be quick to notice is all these faux fan film projects, like his latest one, Planet of the Toons, which he describes as, At the end of the 21st century, a great adventure will commence, and an epic battle of good versus evil will be joined, and help will come from the stars, all on a distant planet where cartoons are real. He's made a ton of posters for this and written quite long descriptions about the project, though as far as I'm aware, this is all just kind of mock-up, though he does speak about it like it's going to be a big ambitious animated film, but I guess this could also end up being a fan fiction, or more than likely, nothing at all. It definitely reminds me of the Pooh's Adventure Wiki though, which is a subject best saved for its own video, in a given due time. But the big collaboration aspect of this, and the whole fan-made movie posters part of it, is very much in line with it. He's made a ton of these, but also he's made some fan art on two other accounts connected to him. Rugrats Kid 91 and 21 Jumbo Street, both of which feature a fair amount of Nicktoon-related fan art. Now, Tim Box has been making fan projects for some time. In fact, as far as I'm aware, he's been doing it since, like, at least 2009, if not earlier than even that, with his past projects being Dexter's Odyssey, which is described as this epic series-slash-trilogy and in this poster is noted as a journey beyond your imagination, an epic battle between good and evil, a legend like you've never imagined, Dexter's Odyssey. Now, what's interesting is this guy has been working on this particular project since 2009. He has a YouTube channel by the name of Bob Their Buff, where back on July 4th of 2009, he made this video which consisted of giant fucking walls of text describing his plans for this Dexter series, which ended up later on being a trilogy consisting of Dexter's Odyssey, Mandark Strikes Back, and Daughter of Zen, which he describes as the following in this 2021 post. Quote, I was thinking that even if I do get Dexter's Odyssey made someday, especially with these 6,000 plus minutes of material, or far less than that, and even as a very ambitious mix of animation, both hand-drawn and CGI, 
special slash visual effects, both practical and digital, in live action, filmed in both widescreen and super high resolution 15 by 70 millimeter IMAX film, even with all that, I do think that my lifelong dream project, Dexter's Odyssey, based on but also inspired by everything I've seen, heard, and read about, and whatever catches my taste, interest and fancy growing up, Gendy Tarkovsky's Dexter's Laboratory and Craig McCracken's proper original classic Powerpuff Girls series, among them, could still be divided into three volumes or films, and certainly structured as some massive live action slash animated epic film trilogy. Even with a hundred plus hours of cinematic material, are far less than that. In addition to the first volume, which could still be titled Dexter's Odyssey, there could be two other film volumes, in all planned live action slash animated Dexter's epic film trilogy, Mandark Strikes Back and Daughter of Zen. Now the first volume, Dexter's Odyssey, clocking in at probably around 1,500 minutes of material, or maybe far less than that, could chronicle the unlikely epic journey of two reluctant souls, Dexter, voiced in the original run by Christine Cavanaugh and in the newer run by Candy Milo, and his sister Dee Dee, voiced alternatively by Allison Moore and Kat Cassida from Gendy Tarkovsky's first popular cartoon show, Dexter's Laboratory. Now the second and probably longest volume, Mandark Strikes Back, clocking in at probably 3,000 plus minutes of material, or maybe far less than that could focus on the epic struggles between the free world at large by the Powerpuff Girls of Townsville, consisting of Blossom, their commander and leader, voiced by, okay, you fucking get the idea who they're voiced by, moving on, moving on, and the evil forces of Mandark, Dexter's rival neighbor and voiced by Eddie Deason. And finally, the third volume, The Daughter of Zen, clocking in at probably around 1,500 minutes of material. Or maybe, hear it with me, Far less than that. Could wrap things up with Dexter, Dee Dee, and the Powerpuff Girls themselves achieving ultimate victory against Mandark with the divine help of a beautiful woman named Zushi, the ashy like daughter of the shape shifting Mistress of Light, known to some fans of Gendy Tarkovsky's Samurai Jack as Zen, and a much better version of Gendy Tarkovsky's Samurai Jack Season 5's Ashi. In that, she will have all her mother's powers and be kind, caring, and as well as being divine. In other words, much like Samurai Jack's Season 5's lover Ashi, as she would have, could have, and should have been born good rather than being born evil like Aku's daughters. That's all, unquote. So, you know, it could be like 6,000 plus minutes of material, you know, pretty much the longest trilogy of films ever created, I would say. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely possible. Could be 6,000 plus minutes of, uh, animated material. Or, you know, far less than that, as in nothing at all. Now, that video from before and this post, by the way, are over 10 years apart. Timbox loves coming up with fan films and sort of pretending like they are going to eventually turn into a full-length or, like, Mega Goliath-length film and acts like he's constantly planning and working on stuff with it despite the only things he really has are basic descriptions of them and posters. Makes me wonder why he doesn't just try writing a fanfiction with all this stuff at this point. But, uh, whatever. Speaking of his YouTube channel, though, he also appears in a few videos from way back in the day, like 14 years ago. Like these, for example. And, oh, by the way, one more thing. I'll be coming back to school in a free year holdover pattern starting in August 2008 and ending in 2001 or 2020, you know? So... <laughs> well... Have a, as this, as, as, have a safe rest of the summer, you know? Bye! Well, you know... I think I better go now. Bye. Ah, what a beautiful day. Blue skies. White puppy cloud. Yeah. Hello, the name's Tomfrey Robert Embox McKenzie. 
I gotta take you to McDonald's to go way on the land, you know? So let's start with either the landfill or go well, you know? And I really think good well. I think uh start with the landfill or good well first. Okay. Okay. And oddly enough, he also has these videos on this channel where he uh talks and coos with this Asian child character from Dexter's laboratory, which is uh a bit unnerving, to say the least. Hi there, Lily, my love. Hi, Lily. What you doing? I love you, Lily. I love you, Lily. Oh, I love you, Lily. I love you, Dee Dee, Lily, and Mimi. I love you. I'll check on you later. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Among his many creative endeavors, he's also written articles on retro junk, like his My 12 Favorite Gendy Tarkovsky Characters article, which in case you haven't noticed, he really loves those. Or the Whoop Ass Beginnings to Powerpuff Girls article. Now the thing is, people began A-logging this guy a little bit after a while due to him being an eccentric character and others began trolling him outright, and he definitely hasn't taken too well to this, notably anything connected to the Kiwi Farms thread on him. Quote, To Jackass Tracker of Kiwi Farms, You always talking about me getting my ultimate comeuppance for things that I'd rather not do in real life? Please knock it off, Jackass Tracker, and please keep my name and my personal business out of your mouth and just leave me alone. I really beg it this time, from now on, I'd rather keep my ideas and concepts private until I am ready to get them realized in some way, shape, or form someday, and that in the future our hearts and even our understandings will meet again with love and generosity. Thank you." Now being fair to Tim Box, as far as I'm aware, he's mostly just been making these fucking like fan film posters that never end up going anywhere. And besides the kind of like weird obsession with that Dexter girl, I, I mean, the guy just kind of makes shit and he's mostly completely harmless just doing his own thing. Cringy, perhaps. Over obsessive with uh, cartoon characters, definitely. Maybe a little weird, a little bit creepy at times. Yeah, I would definitely say so, but I certainly wouldn't call him a threat to anybody. I could go on a little while longer, but at the end of the day, Tim Box is pretty much just the guy who likes to LARP that he's going to make a big animated film and stuff. He likes talking about 90s cartoons and movies, particularly the stuff made by Genny Tarkovsky. And while he's certainly eccentric, I say, just let him cook. Even if what he's cooking is a bunch of invisible chicken wings. At the very least, he's probably having some fun making them. reached the very bottom of this museum of art and degeneracy. And where do we find ourselves now? Purgatory? Hell? Perhaps some combination of the two? Nay, it is but the final layer, the dark catacombs of this place, where the most obscure, disturbed, and interesting subjects and stories lay in wait. Some are perhaps forgotten here. Others, perhaps, wish to be forgotten. So, 
Let us finish our journey, dear traveler. Sasha Tigris. To start things off, we have an extremely tragic and dark entry. Born August 5th of 1955, Donna C, or more known for her fursona's name, Sasha Tigris, or Tigris perhaps, was a furry who frequented many furry meets and furry conventions, including Anthrocon since 2005 and FA United 2007, who didn't really make much of a name for herself outside of something I'll get into in a moment. She was just but one of many in a sea of furries, but soon her name would become known by many after a tragic incident. In mid-August of 2015, Sasha was found murdered and body left in the yard of her at the time boyfriend's place, whom she met on a dating site called Plenty of Fish. 57-year-old George Bagenwald was an immediate suspect as he had a long history of assault and battery on women, as well as being the last person Donna was spotted around with resorts from co-workers that Donna had bruisers all over her body just weeks before she was murdered. George would plead guilty to criminal homicide, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence with an autopsy showing massive blunt force trauma to the head and chest area. In fact, it was so brutal that her skull had caved in. She had several broken ribs and there was even signs of sexual assault. In 2016, Bagenwald pled no contest to the charges in Sasha's death and was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison, likely at his age to die in there where he belongs. Now, that is where her story ends, with her various pages remaining as a reminder of who she was and what she was passionate about. However, in my research for this topic, I found that Sasha also had a son, a son who I feel is worth bringing up. Lupin Wolf, in full Lupin V. Wolf, real name Matthew C.C., born October 2nd of 1986, is the son of Sasha and has become a very infamous figure in the furry community for all the following reasons. To start, around 2005, Lupin was in an abusive relationship with fellow furry Dive Fox, who is also, again, a rather infamous figure. Man, I'm starting to see a bit of a pattern here. For assaulting other furries at cons, amongst many other things. which saw Lupin starving and locked in, unable to leave their rented room due to Dive Fox keeping him held captive. This particular situation was actually commented upon by Sasha in a live journal post entitled The Truth As I Know It, where she notes how Lupin wasn't even allowed to go to the bathroom without Dive Fox's expressed permission amongst many other things. However, that's where Lupin being the victim ends, as on September 11th of 2008, Lupin chased after a 13-year-old boy in Stockholm in the hopes of having sexual relations with him. You really, really can't make this kind of fucked up shit up. He also admitted to having CP on his computer, despite being on probation for also having the same thing on his computer back in 2007, apparently. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, having previously pleaded guilty on April of 2008 to second-degree attempted sexual assault, fourth-degree endangering and welfare of a child by possessing CP, and probation violation. Uh, so yeah, and once again, on December 8th of 2020, Mr. C was then arrested due to parole violations. He is quite clearly a menace to society and a monster who should take up permanent residence in prison at this point. After all that he's done and continues to do, it's clear that he will do it yet again. It is yet another disgusting tragedy in the web of furry drama, murder, and sexual abuse. Magazine 7. Now this one is best explained in detail by YouTuber The Internet Investigator, with her video covering the topic being the only remaining evidence of this account existing, since it has since been taken down. The basic rundown is this account featured a 40-something year old man talking about how his parents beat him, punish him for various insignificant things, bathe him, make him have an exact bedtime, and all sorts of other weird stuff. That is both abusive and also just kind of strange to be doing since he's 40-something years old at this point. Now, there is more details about this uh, from looking at the page and the crazy comments, posts, and thoughts on the page from 
both the 40-something-year-old son and the supposed parents of the man. But to cut to the chase, there are two conclusions that can be taken from this page. Either it is a page of a mentally disabled man who requires the constant care of others, others being his parents who love beating him and think that it is legitimately helping him and making them more healthy, I guess. Or this is just a weird-ass fetish account, probably related to BDSM, or a sub-slash-dom type relationship. And this page is all just part of a LARP that they are all participating in. It could also be all that, but it's also just run by one guy LARPing as the whole thing. Again, if you are looking for more details about this one, then I highly recommend checking out the Internet Investigator's video on the topic. Tollop07 Remembered for both her role on the Planet Dolan YouTube channel and the art that she shared on DA, Tollop, real name Miranda, is an utterly tragic loss of life. While the events leading up to it are still not known, in April of 2021, Miranda would take her own life, the news being broken by her girlfriend. Mean Mark 93, as suggested by Limeberry Peach. This strange user seems to have quite a few fetishes, though they all connect together under the general umbrella of transformation art. There are several pieces depicting women's youth being taken from them, or growing old, or people's ages being swapped, that sort of thing. This is also sometimes combined with foot fetish stuff as seen here in this animation. Oh yeah, he has a major foot fetish as well. I suppose I should have noted that. He also has a thing for vegetizing female celebrities, which as you can see here, he has done quite a few times at this point. However, what is without a doubt the strangest of these transformation pieces are the ones where he transforms female celebrities into Fooglies from the Spy Kids films. If you know the context for this, then it's even more creepy. But honestly, regardless, even without that, these are shockingly uncanny. It would also seem that people commission him for this art, or at least he makes a lot of posts about commissions being open. I guess we could never really know how many he actually gets, since they probably just all go to his DMs to uh, work out the prices. He's also a part of the Hypnotized Feet group on DA, which is, uh, well, according to the page, says, quote, We are a group of people who have both foot fetish and hypnosis fetish. This combination of fetishes is quite underrepresented in the art and fetish community. Therefore, Hypnotized Feet was created to bring together people who share this apparently rare kink, unquote. So, then as one does, I took a little peek around just to see what this actually was all about, since the opener didn't really explain it all that well. And for the most part, from what I gathered, it really is just people being hypnotized, which is indeed a fetish all of its own, but with bare feet being involved in the picture somewhere. It's not your feet being hypnotized or people being hypnotized by feet, it's just people who are hypnotized with feet showcased somewhere. But also as another side tangent in the comment section of this group, I couldn't help but notice that the chat was almost entirely dead besides one man who went by the username Evil Twin Mordred, who had some choice words for this group not accepting his written works. Quote, Again, I have requested my story, The Mysteries of Armand Dupal, be posted in the literature section of this group. Nearly a month has elapsed since I submitted the first chapter. Each chapter involves age-appropriate women both barefoot and hypnotized, and otherwise conform to the rules here. I appreciate your efforts, but would like some word that they will be accepted, or some explanation as to why they are rejected. Hello? Is anyone planning on responding? Is this your way of saying my submissions are no longer welcome? Still no answer. My stories are all within your guidelines. I have been posting here for several years. Suddenly, I have stopped doing so. Several months ago, I politely asked why. No answer. I asked again. No answer. If I have broken some obscure rule, please have the courtesy of explaining what I have done to deserve this degree of rudeness. If I am no longer welcome here, have the guts to tell me that." Unquote. I guess the thought never occurred to him that the group admins and people running this thing might have since fucked off, and that's the reason no one's responding to him. Because the group is dead, but uh... 
you know, but yeah. Very interesting and obscure little corner of DA to say the least. SpongeBat 1, as suggested by Cherry in GT. So I could tell this one was gonna be interesting as soon as I noticed the blacked out icon and a bio that read, quote, I like writing not safe for work fetish fan fiction of children's cartoons and games. Or at least I did until it all went wrong. <laughs> I wonder how it all went wrong, fellas. Let's find out. Well, to start, he does make art related to him being a starving artist with emotional issues who is awkward and, uh, you kind of already know how that story goes. He also makes images like these, which depicts his Sonic OC looking to spend some quality gamer time with you. He notes under this post, quote, I wanted to save stuff like this until after the relevant story, but I just like this too much, and I feel kind of bad for making you guys wait so long between uploads. Just a fun little image of my Sonic OC gamer girl, Chillaxin. You'll find out more about her as soon as I get off my lazy ass and start writing again." Unquote. Also, in bold font, he notes, quote, "...any comments asking about my old animations slash requests slash anything else irrelevant will be ignored. If you absolutely need to ask me something, send a note or comment on my profile." Unquote hinting that he used to have stuff he made that has since been taken down. This is foreshadowing, by the way, not just for this user, but for something far grander we will be getting on to later on. That involves the entire website. Besides that, he has a ton of fan fictions he's written, usually of the erotic nature. However, sadly the bulk of this man's work and what he was most well known for has since been wiped off the internet, by him, as noted here in this comment from Looking for Stuff 1248. Quote, I loved your animations. You should have at least kept them in some deep, dark catacomb instead of outright blasting them off of here in DeviantArt. I understand if you want to take a break though. Unquote. I'm not sure of what these animations entailed, but judging by the descriptions and the general fact that they are now gone from the internet, they were probably a bit too raunchy to show on YouTube anyway. So, Oh well. Coco Tapioca, as suggested by the Dill Pickle Man. Aw, oh, now this one is legendary in some circles. So while his account is still up, nothing here art-wise is why he is on this iceberg. No, instead it's this comic titled Hey Andy Sweetie, which while the exact upload date is unknown, it was far from the only piece done by Andy, depicting him and Princess Peach's loving relationship. Later on, on December 17th of 2004, a thread about Ray's artwork was submitted to the Neo Geo forums, where his artwork and comics were ridiculed and were generally seen as cringy. Then later on, on February 27th of 2008, YouTuber The Wesker uploaded a video titled Hey Andy Sweetie, which has an interesting twist on the webcomic as seen here. Hey Andy Sweetie! Hmm? What's that you're drawing? I'm making a map. A map? But that looks like a close-up of my eyes? That's exactly right, Pete. A map of your eyes, because I, I can find myself getting lost in them. This video would end up getting pretty popular, and as time went on and people's senses of humor uh, became extra acclimated to this, let's just say, it only got more popular, and with many making drawings, memes, and other such content around the comic and the video, as it became a funny in-joke to share around and talk about and share, generally speaking. Later on, YouTuber Salty DK Dan would also make a pretty popular video about the meme back in January of 2019. It was the joke that just kept coming back. But, uh, what about Andy? What did he think of all this? Well, actually, in July of 2019, he wrote a DA journal expressing exactly how he felt and reflecting on how now over a decade of internet, uh, stardom, infamy, whatever you want to call it, has affected him. Quote, I don't know what inclined me to check my page here, but I was surprised to see how many people are messaging me and wondering where I am or what I'm up to. So here is one final update. Let me begin by saying that although I am not very proud today of the publicity I received in 2004, 
I wouldn't change it if I could. I met some interesting people because of it, and formed bonds and friendships with some of the most wonderful people I know today. I think the majority of people will agree that my art has improved tremendously, and I actually really like my more recent stuff. I'm still drawing from time to time, but I'm no longer posting it here. My old username will always be relevant to me, but alas, it is one I can no longer use, as I feel it will forever be associated with my past works, rather than the cool boss from Space Channel 5. I can't blame the trolls and haters over the years. I had it coming. I was so naive and posted some pretty bold things without even considering the possibility of the inevitable outcome. I wasn't too internet savvy, and in all honesty back then, I thought I was original in the stuff I created and posted. Of course, today I look back on it in facepalm, but I've moved on. I want to thank everyone who praised me over the years. To know there are kind-hearted people throughout the globe gives me optimism in my outlook on life. Someone can set themselves up for mockery and yet some people will see beyond the quirks and see a side that haters are oblivious to. It's you that I will forever be grateful to, including some of the closest friends I've made out of it. I also want to thank the haters and the trolls, shocking as it might come. I feel they also played a huge role in shaping me into a better person. Don't get me wrong, I don't condone that behavior at all, and I don't wish it upon anyone for being themselves. Nonetheless, as much as I don't like to acknowledge it, there were a few hateful comments that, whether intended or not, ended up being constructive criticisms. Still, trolls will be trolls, and I can't say I'm surprised that there are still people 15 years later who are living in the past. In a way, the trolls won in somewhat forcing me to abandon my old user screen name, while at the same time I feel as though I won in that I've risen above them and have moved on and improved in life. For those who have been wondering what I am up to nowadays, whether or not I died, well, here I am, alive and well. I currently work as a building engineer and am practically running an entire office building on my own to include electric, HVAC, and overall repairing just about everything. It's a challenging and greatly rewarding job, and I am well on my way to retirement. I mean, I'm in my mid-30s, so it won't be anytime soon, obviously, but my life's goals are being exceeded. I thought it might be cool to also say that I am happily married with two kids, but the reality in that department is that I am happily single and am fulfilling my own passions in life. I've done a bit of traveling and have a few places I plan to vacation to in the near future. In summary, I want to say thank you to both the people who supported me since the beginning and the haters who have had nothing but negativity to throw my way, but mostly to the supportive individuals. I'm thriving in life and felt I should let everyone know what's been up with me rather than just disappearing from the internet altogether. This will likely be the last time I'm on this account, so farewell to all. Sincerely, Andy Sweetie. Edit. I especially want to give a huge thanks to the Giantess community for making these past few years very enjoyable for me. I simply cannot express how wonderful it felt to be part of such an awesome thing. Your love and inspiration will always be with me." Unquote. So yeah, all things considered, pretty reflective and interesting to see. Sort Timid slash Bimbofication, as suggested by Cheeseball. To start, Bimbofication is a type of fetish and genre in which people are transformed into hypersexualized caricatures of themselves, typically featuring big ass and boob combos and things of that sort. I've also seen some stuff where there is a gender swap element with men transforming into women this way as well. While it is unknown where this fetish came from, by 2013 a subreddit was created around the fetish and there was, of course, plenty of art related to this on DA. Anyway, that's the general gist of bimbofication. But an interesting controversy sprouted from this community when artist Sortimid, who was also very much popular for making art related to this fetish, created this image on February 9th of 2017 of a tanned blonde woman in heels in a dress transforming into a brunette in jeans after reading a book titled CMSN, Debimboification, which was meant to be a joke related to the fetish. However, then on February 15th of 2017, Twitter user at Hasofria posted this tweet about the drawing, mocking it, and this ended up stirring up a lot of controversy as most people thought that this drawing was specifically made as a social commentary about sexism and society and all that other shit. 
when in reality it was just a stupid joke shared around in a fetish community related to said fetish. YouTubers like Philip DeFranco would also end up talking about this image and several sites and people shared it around, as well as laughing about the fact that so many people got upset over fetish material that they ended up taking way too seriously. Which funnily enough, also spread word of said fetish to way more people and jump-started a bunch of careers for people in that said community. Apparently since so many eyes were now on them at this point, so, uh, I guess it was a pretty good accidental advertising campaign, I suppose. Big Knee Lover slash Big Knee Fetish, as suggested by Shiny Lorantis. This one, as the name implies, is about people with a big knee fetish, or weirdly saggy knees like these seen here. Big Knee Lover clearly being a big fan of them which was interesting to see since this was one of those fetishes that genuinely made me take pause, as I realized that I am going to go my whole life continuing to learn of strange little fetish corners like these, and no matter how much I think I've seen it all, something will always come around to prove me wrong. And speaking of... Bonus Entry Peter Griffith Fetish Now when I say Peter Griffith, what I mean specifically is Peter Griffin from the adult cartoon Family Guy mixed with Griffith from the manga series Berserk. This is based on a pun with their names being somewhat similar of course and many might be familiar with some of these images. But what many probably don't know is that on DA there used to be an obscure group dedicated to drawing pictures of this mixture of Griffith and Peter, and while it was never super huge, it did have several more pictures of the character mashup, including, but of course, Fetish Art. Now some of this seems like it was done for a bit of a LARP, you know, a bit of a meme, but there was also people who were pretending to worship this depiction of Griffith as a sort of god, and many comments praising him could be seen there. And some of that art was just pretty detailed anyway. Sadly though, the group seems to have been wiped clean from the site, so I can't really show you anything from it. But I do remember coming across this a few months back in my research for any truly obscure corners of the site. I would show you some of the pictures, but again, they are way too much for YouTube standards. Really makes me wish I took some screenshots of the group at the very least at the time. But still, all the same, a very strange, obscure corner all the same. Dev Cat Scratch, as suggested by Nanini Sandwich. Aw, oh, now this one is yet another one of those entries. Where I knew I had my work cut out for me as soon as I saw the absolutely massive ED page that was dedicated to him. To start, first though, looking over his DA page, he was born on March 24th of 1985 and has been a deviant for 17 years. And checking over their account profile reveals some interesting content. To start, he makes a lot of these posts called your thoughts, which are just a picture with a question accompanying it with some examples being your thoughts, censorship of navels, which he notes, quote, some cultures consider showing one to be taboo, such as in K-pop. And I've seen a number of pieces of Indian animation which do not show them on bare bellies. In the case of Star Trek, Tyrrhenians have two navels due to a dual circulatory system. The censors objected to them being shown, unquote. To which the first reply here says, and I quote, suck my dick again. Or in one, <laughs> or in this one titled, your thoughts, nudism cleansing your spirit, which he notes, quote, a number of murals contain a hidden message that nudism can help cleanse your spirit, unquote. To which the first comment said, Are you fucking insane? Clown emoji, skull emoji, concerned look emoji, camera emoji. He also has these pictures where he requests that more fan art be made of random kids cartoons. Oh, and uh, fetish art, such as these hundreds of drawings of children's cartoon characters being depicted as fat asses many of which happen to be in wheelbarrows I suppose to get around. A lot, and I do mean a lot of stuff, related to belly buttons such as button bows or characters popping stuff out of their belly buttons or characters with an actual like shirt button for a belly button etc etc are all on his page as well. However, beyond the basics of what one can read from his DA page, I decided to then take a look over at the ED page 
as well as the farms to see what other info about this man was available. My god, did I ever get some info. To start, in addition to his inflation and belly button fetishes, he also has a thing for power line insulators because, uh, they have pretty colors. He even has a Blue's Clues OC based around insulators. So, th that's pretty unique, I guess. He also likes raising awareness for certain things and makes a lot of PSA drawings with many of his favorite cartoon characters, as can be seen here. Which ties in nicely with his YouTube channel, where he also often talks like a walking PSA, as well as rants about various things, all of which he has ran for over 13 years. So let's take a peek at a few of them, shall we? Starting with one where he talks about his wheelbarrow character drawings from before. I have made it to my 100th piece of a cartoon character, mainly children, a beast in a wheelbarrow, just like the original parody, of which I would like some insight from who masterminded it. Do you know of anyone else who capitalised on this parody, and if so, when? I believe that I was the first to capitalise on this parody in May 2012, and on average, when I started, I made one character like this every week. As mentioned earlier, my first piece was Pajama Sam, and my first female character I made her like it was Blue from the once popular Blue's Clues. The first request of such a piece I received was Gumball from the Amazing Wall of Gumball. Over time, I happened to include characters from minorities, which not only highlights childhood obesity, but also the fact that fast food companies have been known to prey on minorities, such as African-American characters such as Myron from Wayside, my first piece with a minority group character, and Molly from Bubble Guppies, as well as Hispanic Latino characters such as Diego and popular Dodd Explorer, and I even received a request for a minority character, being Reggie from Rocket Power. At one time, I mainly did male characters, but I have surged ahead with female characters at another time. My 100th piece is Nick Jr's Little Bill and that there are no plans to stop. For new additions for such pieces, please go to the link in the video description box. Then we have a video about his sudden interest in baby versions of Nicktoon characters. Back in 2002, I started thinking about baby versions of Nickelodeon cartoon characters since I watched Rugrats earlier on. Then it really started in 2008 when I started turning Nickelodeon cartoon characters into cute babies, of which my favourites are Walden from Wow Wow Wubsy and Dana from Wayside. In Google Play, Cupcake Digital offers a game where you can look up the baby Yo Gabba Gabba characters, so I think there should be a Wow Wow Wubsy version of this game since Cupcake Digital makes a number of Wow Wow Wubsy games. Also, there should be other games where you look after your favourite baby version of a Nickelodeon cartoon character as well, or which should be kid friendly. There is even a Wikipedia article on younger and junior versions of characters as well. I even think that there should even be a baby Nicktoons hour every week on Nickelodeon, with shows where a number of common characters, especially children, have been turned into cute babies. Be sure to check out my baby Nicktoons group on DeviantArt as well. Then we have one about why baby characters should be breastfed in children's cartoons. You may know of the benefits of breastfeeding for both mother and child, and is important for the first six months from birth. Two cartoons which had at least one commonly used baby character, those being Arthur and Nickelodeon's Rugrats, did not have any breastfeeding of babies at all. Children may have seen calves feeding off mother cows, and even family kittens and puppies feeding off their mother's milk. If such children's cartoons with commonly used baby characters are breastfed, this can promote the value of breastfeeding of babies, especially if the parent watches the cartoon with their children. Breastfeeding of babies in cartoons. Natural, not offensive. If it wasn't apparent to you by now, Bryce isn't exactly all put together, so to speak, but was all the same an individual who people were fascinated by, from his weird obsessions, thoughts, demeanor, and general oddity that surrounded him, eventually leading to a thread in Kiwi Farms being created about him, something which Bryce is aware exists, 
and happens to have made a video addressing, as seen here, which is a bit longer, but I'll show you some clips from it. In February 2016, I have discovered unsavory discussion about me regarding having autism, which were Kiwi Farms, a hostile and abusive online environment where people are abused, harassed, and trolled based on real or perceived disability. A few months later, I was sent abusive messages on DeviantArt regarding my disability, autism, and I had to avoid this instead of being subjected to it because the comment reporting system of DeviantArt was not easy to use compared to YouTube where comments can be flagged without having to leave the current page. It took a great amount and gathering of courage to report this abuse considering the difficult to use reporting system on DeviantArt. The owner of Kiwi Farms, Joshua Connor Moon, has actively engaged in this hostility and to a certain extent actively controlled, directed, encouraged, supported and facilitated the activities of members of Kiwi Farms and acts thereof in violation of United States law. I could go on a while longer, but by now I think that you've more than gotten the point. He's a rather strange subject, who is still continuing to make content and stuff to this very day. Ultimately though, it doesn't seem like he's really harming anybody, even if some of the things he's requesting and wants are really weird and kind of creepy. Erkan Sabat Turkish artist Sahit Erkan Sabet didn't have the largest following, but his talent certainly garnered him some modest collection of eager fans, always excited to see his next detailed portrait. Unfortunately, as many are aware, the country of Turkey was in shambles with a rising cascade of violence that eventually erupted into the 2016 a Turek airport attack. Gunmen armed with automatic weapons and explosive storm terminal 2 of the airport. Chechen rebel and Islamic extremist Archimed Chanchev is believed to have been the instigator of the attack, along with Rakim Bulgarov, Vladmin Osmanov, and a third unknown suicide bomber. Sahit was one of the 47 that lost their lives that day in a senseless act of violence. May they rest in peace. And on a sadly similar note, Maxi Official, Ukraine Flight 752 is still remembered as a horrific tragedy, and nowhere is that more evident than in the death of Maxi Official. At just 16, Maxi, real name Dorsa Ganchi was an immensely talented 3D artist, with much of her art garnering overwhelming praise and admiration from many. She had boarded Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 for a scheduled international passenger flight from Tehran to Kyiv, accompanied by her brother and mother. The three, along with all the passengers and crew, will be shot down shortly after departure resulting in the deaths of all 173 aboard. Viewing her page now comes with the somber realization that such a young person was cut down in her prime, happily replying to comments and gone the next. Even so, people to this day still visit her page with wishes of a peaceful rest. The Angelic Bliss, March 25th, 2017. Angelic, real name Lachelle Goodwin, and her younger sister were murdered by their father, Carlton Goodwin. This piece of shit shot Lachelle and her sister before killing their mother and then finally turning the gun on himself. It's a real tragedy, especially when you look at Lachelle's page and see what a sweet and positive person she was to all her friends and loved ones. May she rest in peace. Timon Berkowitz, as suggested by The Real Abby. All right, time for yet another extremely strange account full of some extremely strange rabbit holes to dive into. My favorite. Timon Berkowitz is, to start, a very, very, very big fan of The Lion King, and in particular the character of Timon, as you are sure to see across their page. In fact, he was such a big fan of Timon that he actually runs a Timon fan club on DeviantArt, and is well known for being quite prolific in the early scene of Lion King and Timon related fan art on DeviantArt. Which is interesting because that also means that many were subjected to Timon, as well as various other Looney Tune characters and cartoon related characters being put into fetish situations of all kinds, including scat and diaper related stuff 
being the most common on his page. This is often mixed with Christian stuff and social justice stuff as well from time to time. It's all a rather bizarre combination of things, such as this piece entitled Soulful Moment, where Timon is talking to this girl about the Bible, I guess, and seems to have started to shit his pants. Or this one entitled Sissy Kinky Timon at the Meerkat Library, where Timon in drag asks the librarian, Oh, hello, Mr. Librarian. Um, I have to go poo-poo. I, uh, would like to poop myself. Can I do it in the library? Um, <clears throat> and uh, then we have uh, this one, uh, entitled Simba, Marilyn Manson fanboy, where Simba is uh, clearly a huge fanboy of Marilyn Manson, right next to a drawing entitled Simba and Mufasa's Feet Play, where the adult Simba licks his father's feet, who should be dead, but, uh, you know, isn't, and uh, what the actual fuck is this? I, uh, I guess you can add uh, incest to the uh, various other fetishes you can find on this page. Mind you, there are dozens of pictures like these, many of which I cannot show you here on YouTube as they are far more explicit. We also have this one entitled Black Lives Matter, Furry, which is, uh, yeah. And then you have this one about gays against guns. And then you have this one titled our Big Brother, which shows the Warner siblings all cr together crying in happiness, all having freshly pissed the bed together. Now, isn't that just wholesome, wonderful content? There's also more in a Google Doc that he has on his page, but again, I don't want to delve into that because it is, well, too much for YouTube. But beyond his drawings, there are also a ton of pictures of his plushies, and himself in various poses. I'll just show some of these off for you in a real quick fashion, along with their accompanying title. Here's one of Scooby-Doo in a, an outfit titled Giant Scooby-Doo Plush and his bulges. Bugs Bunny loves gunk. Gay Tigger large plush. Footsies with Miko. While E. Coyote wearing a Disney princess swimsuit. That is a fucking big plushie, by the way. Holy shit. Huge Tom from Tom and Jerry plush under a urinal. <laughs> Giant Disney plush Mushu by Douglas. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's enough plush pictures for now. Mind you, there are several pictures I have here of him hanging out in his house cuddling with his plushies, and generally being himself, I suppose. Yeah, this is one of those pages that the longer you look at, the more filled with dread one becomes, or at least I certainly did. Then, by the time I thought I had seen pretty much everything this person has to offer, I noticed that they were a part of the Basil X Olivia group, which, bear in mind, these are characters from the Great Mouse Detective movie by Disney. Basil being an adult mouse, and Olivia being a little child mouse. So I clicked on the page, wondering what the fuck I was about to see, only to be greeted with an opening picture stating, Basil and Olivia Fan Club, for those who still believe in this couple, are not afraid to say it. Then, when you look at the rules, it states, quote, We are a club that ships Basil with older Olivia. We just changed a bit their ages and made them fix. In Victorian times, older men married younger women. So it's not so weird, as long as we keep her older enough. If you don't ship this couple, it's okay. But please don't spam our club with annoying comments about what's right or wrong. We respect other shippings and clubs, and we want people to respect ours. Thank you for understanding." Unquote. So, um, you know, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I wonder, I wonder how these people first thought of the idea to make this child character pair up with an adult. I wonder if it started with them being aged up in their mind, or if it, uh, if it, uh, wasn't. I guess we'll never know. Now before we go on to the next entry, I figured I'd show you his YouTube channel, Captain Woodruff, in this video by him titled, Captain Woodruff's Easter Celebration. Happy Easter, everybody. I am Captain Woodruff, the bunny. I'm here to share with you guys some nice Easter snuggles 
for all those fans of bunny plushies and everything soft and fluffy that there is out there. So I want you to first meet some friends of mine. Just wait there. Oh. Right here we have Benny. Big, big Benny. Look at this Benny Benny. He's a nice Benny. This bunny was made by Kids of America. I don't know exactly when, but he's very big. He had to be specially stuffed because they made him very understuffed. He looked much smaller until I gave him a little bit more fluff and snuggles. Got him a little denser. He's got beautifully big cute face giant bunny beard that goes all the way down to his super fluffy chest huge strong legs nice soft snuggly pink color so extremely friendly he's just very snuggable there yeah. bend bend You like the bunny? Isn't he nice? Snuggle time for bunny. Bunny, bunny, bunny. Okay, we got a couple more friends to get through, so I can't wait around. We'll snuggle you some other time. Okay, and here we have another Benny. Benny, Benny. Yeah, I think that's enough for this guy for now. So, uh, moving on, I suppose. Austinator 06302012, as suggested by Pokemon Trainer Andre. Okay, so this one is very obscure and appropriately bizarre. Austinator, or Austin M. Small, describes himself as, quote, I am Austinator Numbers, aka Austin Michael Small, and I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't post art here much, as I'm primarily a YouTuber. The numbers in my alias refer to my baptism date of June 30th of 2012. Unquote. His gallery has pretty much nothing besides two rants about the state of Paper Mario and Wario Land. However, Austin is well known on DA for spamming his YouTube page and other stuff around for people unprompted. And then when people respond or make fun of him for doing this, or any other stuff we're going to get to in a moment, he then says something like this. Quote, At this point, I have no qualms with you telling apostates on YouTube about me. Besides, your responses are just as worthless as Hayao Miyazaki and the entirety of Studio Ghibli." Unquote. With a link to a video. A video which I suppose, since he's so keen on sharing around, we ought to take a quick peek at and see what it's all about. A video which, might I say, starts out with a picture of someone's feet. We're, uh, we're off to a wonderful start. <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> what a loser! Hey everybody, welcome to the animation essay. And as you probably may have figured out from the thumbnail from that teaser trailer, this talks about this really talks about the van, the van. This really alludes to the, to what was supposed to be Hayao Miyazaki's final film, *The Wind Rises*. So today, we're gonna, in this essay, I'm gonna today. So today marks the tenth, uh, tenth, tenth anniversary since there's a little Japanese release in July twentieth. 2013. So, because it's the 10th anniversary, I'm going to discuss why its vanity, vanity and futility is, is so sniffed. But to, to understand it, we have to take a look at the situation with animation back in 2013. It was back in 2013, and by this time, in 2013, as indicated by the article you see here, there's actually concerns because 
they're concerned about Hollywood producing too much animation. And as seen as these articles that are, that will be in the script that will be as you read that will be linked in the description. I'll show you more of this, but I'm going to be real with you. If you thought he was building towards a point in this animation video essay, as he calls it, you wouldn't find any. He just kind of says stuff, stumbling over his own words, and clearly seems to be suffering from some sort of mental issue. Looking over the rest of his channel, you can find various videos of him playing what looks to be mobile games, uh, speed running some of them, I guess? While the audio is clearly way too fucking loud in all of them, with an overlay of several feet all over the screen, as seen here as an example. He's been making this sort of content for years now, by the way. Looking back over on his DA page, I then noticed that his most recent journal had nearly 600 comments and a ton of views for a journal. So I decided to take a peek at it to see what it was all about. Oh. My. Goodness. Uh, well, while I'd like to read all this to you, actually I'm lying, I really don't want to read all this to you, it's a waste of mine and your time. Nonetheless, I think I'll just skip past the giant rant about, uh, Wario Land as a series dying or some shit, and move on to the part that's actually about Pizza Tower and his beef with the fandom of it. Which in case you didn't know, Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer video game and indie game that looks like this and has some influences from Wario Land games, while also being its own thing. Quote, Pizza Tower, a pathetic imitation of Wario Land. As one of Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not difficult to see how Jehovah God views these types of games, especially considering that he opened, labeled, the political power of Egypt as feeble as a piece of straw in Ezekiel 29.6, as well as his rejection of all of David's older brothers as successors to Saul as king of Israel in 1 Samuel 16.7. In case you're curious what these verses say in the Bible that we currently use, here's what they say. Note, the Bible we currently use is the New World Translation of the Holy Scripture 2013 edition. First scripture is Ezekiel 29, 6. Next is 1 Samuel 16, 7. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt will have to know that I am Jehovah, for they were no more support to the house of Israel than a piece of straw. But Jehovah said to Samuel, do not pay attention to his appearance and how tall he is, for I have rejected him. For the way man sees is not the way God sees, because mere man sees what appears to the eyes, but Jehovah sees into the heart. Also as mentioned in the DeviantArt, you see in my comments on your Pizza Tower fan art, Wario Master of Disguise ruining of the Mario Land series was a deliberate act by Nintendo, especially considering how common of a practice this is in the world of video game business. Thus, no matter how hard indie developers try, nobody can truly replicate the feel of a Wario Land game. Besides, despite the game's visual and gameplay style, Pizza Tower has nothing in common with Wario Land despite being used as an inspiration. This is because the story of the game misses the point as to why Wario Land for the most part replaced for 2D Mario for 14 years, as well as the fact that the main protagonist of the game's Pepino Spaghetti has one of the physical attributes and personality traits of Wario. The same can be said for other games that are inspired by the Wario Land series. Also, nothing in this world lasts forever, so the ultimate destiny of indie games is no different from AAA games, for it is written, furthermore, the world is passing away, and so its desire, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Uh, he, he uh, then concludes with this. 
Quote, conclusion. In conclusion, what I'm currently doing regarding Pizza Tower, and to a lesser extent, Anton Blast slash Ball, fan art is simply warning of the inevitable slap to the face Nintendo will be giving to both the Wario Land series and R and D one. So no matter what you say in response to what I constantly post on your Pizza Tower fan art, I will not stop what I am doing until one Wario gets sidelined in the next 3D Mario, like he has in the spin-offs. Two Nintendo uses Wario in the next 3D Mario game as the main antagonist in a way that flies in the face as to why. R and D1 created him in the first place, or 3 just simply don't use him at all. So get used to it because no matter what nasty things you say about me in response to what I put on your piece of tower fan art, I'm not stopping what I'm until either those things come true. Unquote. <clears throat> now, you're probably wondering, ah, hey, Dylan, my, uh, my, my, my bud. <clears throat> oh, what did you just read? To us right now what was the last few minutes just spent doing what does wario and pizza tower have to do with uh, god or the bible and uh what the fuck was this man talking about half the time he you were uh you were reading it and uh my response to that dear viewer is that uh, that's an excellent question so anyway from what i've read in the comments he's been posting under nearly every single piece of pizza tower fan art in calling the art of the series a waste, which managed to piss off the fandom generally speaking, and get a fair bit of trolling tossed his way, which made people also realize that as much as he loves preaching about how he's a Jehovah's Witness and the like, if you go and look at his favorites on DeviantArt, you would then see several heaping pounds of fetish material, from foot fetish, to fat fetish stuff, and general DA degeneracy, which caused many people to call him a hypocrite and a degenerate, generally speaking. It's clear the man wants attention and doesn't really have much of a life to speak of, though so many have since gone to just simply block and ignore him. Since it's clear that he's just a weirdo and maybe even a slight bit of a troll, maybe? But regardless, is a guy that just doesn't really make much sense, and mostly just wants a reaction out of people. So yeah, moving on. EJW. Furry artist Elizabeth and her sister Tatiana, along with their two dogs, tragically met their end in an apparent murder-slash-break-in. On the night of February 14th of 2015, the apartment of James Wilbank and Tatiana was set ablaze with the two along with Elizabeth and their two dogs meeting their demise. The cause of death was quite puzzlingly, wasn't due to the fire however, as all were found with gunshot wounds, with the identity of the shooter still a mystery. Elizabeth's page still remains to this day, with her art still gaining comments as people visit to pay their respects. Nay, they rest in peace. Flutterby727 on yet another terribly tragic note, cosplayer Samantha Michelle Nance was a budding anime artist whose life was tragically cut short in September 2009, as Daniel William murdered her in cold blood quite gruesomely, mind you, as crime reports show that she was nearly decapitated. He apparently killed her out of a jealous rage because he lived with her boyfriend and wanted her boyfriend for himself. Thankfully, that piece of shit got life in prison for his crimes, but it cannot change the horrific fate of this budding artist and massive Persona fan who had her whole life ahead of her. Seeing all these people meet their ends in such a tragic and horrific way truly does make one, or at least me, reflect on how precious life is. Not just for one's own life, but for those I love and how truly evil those who would hate the lives of others, and in such a horrific way, truly are. May she rest in peace. Screamer Claws, as suggested by Dr. Squidman. So this one has a bit of infamy attached to it, but it has less to do with the actual DA account, and more to do with the two animated films this person has created. See, this DA user has a website of his own under the same name, and has created two extremely infamous animated films the 2012 Where the Dead Go to Die, 
and the 2015 When Blackbirds Fly, and some more recent short films posted onto his YouTube channel as well, as being available to purchase uncensored on his website. These films, where the dead go to die specifically, have been well known for being some of the most dark, gruesome, trippy, edgy, and overall crazy-ass animated films to be produced of their time. And though I'm not actually sure they are actually the darkest that exist, I've seen some darker ones, they certainly do go to some pretty crazy extremes. And I've even had some people call it them the worst animated films ever created due to their over-the-top violence and edginess. Having seen at least the first one of these films, I can say that yeah, it is pretty gruesome, but also at times interesting visually, as there are some very abstract and trippy and strange animation techniques used throughout. It's somewhat experimental, which seems to be something he continued to do on into this day. And I've also heard some people say that his work has actually gotten better in his more recent stuff. I've not seen those, and I don't really plan on watching more stuff from him just for the sake of this iceberg, especially because it's not a movie review we're doing, but I think you get the point. So, moving on. Brandon the Brony Pony, as suggested by Goat. So this is yet another one of those rabbit holes of a content creator that seems to go on and on and on and on, but admittingly under a much more simple premise and type of content. See, Brandon, as you might have guessed, is a brony. But more than that, he's in love with it seems like nearly every female pony in the cast of the show. The majority of his gallery are commissions and art pieces he's made of himself with many of these characters of the show, be they both in pony form, sometimes human form, sometimes he's in human form and they are a life-size pony, and other times he's shrunk down small and yeah, I think you get the idea. Also, he occasionally dips into other fandoms like DuckTales, I guess once again shipping himself with some girl character from it. He's also got a second account specially made for art of him and this sunset character, of which he has more art depicting his OC with her. And he also has a third account, which he says he's dating, but in actuality is just an RP account of him uh, being this character from the show, My Little Pony, um, that he talks to himself with to pretend that he is in a relationship with said pony. Yeah, moving past his DA though, he also has a YouTube channel with quite a lot of videos on it. And uh, many of them are very interesting, might I add. To start, he has a channel intro, so why don't we give it a look to kind of see how he presents the whole thing. Song downloading. Do you want to see content you can't find anywhere else? Here on the Brandon the Brony Pony YouTube channel, you can find tons of content related to My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Such content includes audio stories and song covers. The audio stories you can find exclusively on the Brandon the Brony Pony YouTube channel include an equestrian tale, an MLP in real life audiobook featuring Brandon and Aaron as the stars, who suddenly one day have ponies come into their lives. Our Mini Brony, A Friendship Tale, which follows the journey of Brandon as he travels to the magical land of Equestria after being sucked through a portal in his mirror, and he may even find love. Equestria Girls, A Brony at Cantrilla High, which follows the journey of Brandon as he gets sucked into the world of Equestria Girls? Yep, and he gets adopted by his new mother, Lightning Star, and he has to go back to high school once again and he may just meet his high school sweetheart. It'll be one shimmer of a spark. And many other smaller audios are coming to the channel as well, all based on Generation 4 of the My Little Pony series, whether it be shipping related, having a good time with Rose, or even just the son bonding with his mother. There will certainly be no drought of content on the Brandon the Brony Pony YouTube channel, so subscribe! You don't want to miss the exciting Brony content coming to the channel. And don't forget to hit that bell! As noted in this channel trailer, much of his content is of course brony and self-ship related. Such as this one, of which is an audio self-shipping drama. Come on, Brandon. I I'm coming, Dry. Something the matter? You look like you've seen a ghost. N no, I I'm perfectly calm. Oh, God! Brandon, are you scared of a bit of thunder? No, 
Why would I? Because you're as pale as a cloud. That's just... just a side effect. Right. And you're totally not scared. Come here. There. Is that better? Much better. Yeah. Good. Or how about this one in which is his own rendition of the Persona 5 intro to a series where he has a self-insert um, inserted into the Persona 5 story. Who am I? Am I not from here? That's right, I'm not from here at all. Press the button, find it, a contract unbreakable. Oh, it's useless. What could it mean that I'm here? Can I make a difference? If I don't break out of here, woke up into a new world. Time to adjust to my new life. I will not take this with strife. What's wrong with a little change? Just imagine being me. Probably wouldn't be easy, but I must do my duty. My entire life has changed. Now, when I realized he also got involved with the Persona fandom and has a 36 minute episode one to this series of his, I just had to watch it to find out what sort of interesting content lay inside. Little did he know that his life would soon turn upside down, just from something as simple as beating a game. Man, I can't wait to start New Game Plus. New Game Extra? Huh? What's that? I'd better search this up. One Google search later. Weird. Nothing's coming up. Is this some kind of new automatic update? Well, I'm not complaining. More content for me. Let's try it. What the hell? Why did the TV turn off? Oh man, I was really looking forward to playing. Oh well, maybe some other time. <sighs> I'm going to bed. I've been playing this for a while now. Later that night. Huh? Where the hell am I? Welcome to the Velvet Room. Ah, I see you're new here. Or are you? Ugh, my head. Jeez, what happened? Whoa! Jesus, you scared me! I almost thought you were just brought back from the dead. <sighs> it was most certainly unusual to find someone passed out in the middle of Shibuya. Especially someone like you. Who are you? Uh, I'm Brandon. Brandon Hackwith. Nice to meet you. You two are Ryuji Sakamoto and Yusuke Katagawa, right? How did you know our names? Yeah... How the hell did you know that? Some sort of stalker or something? Well, uh... I, uh, heard about you guys from Shujin Academy. Yeah! <laughs> I'm not a stalker, I swear! Right. I would make the assumption that you're a student there. You don't seem to be from Japan. Oh... You think he's one of them foreign exchange students that were mentioned last week? I wasn't really listening, but that was the gist of what I got. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, I'm an exchange student. Actually, would you guys want to hang out sometime? You both seem pretty cool. I mean, sure, new kid. You're definitely on the weird side, but don't worry. You'll be with the right crowd. Indeed. Normal isn't really the word I'd use to describe us. Awesome! I'm so excited! <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Yep. Definitely got a weird one here. Yeah, I tend to squeal a lot. I'm pretty energetic most of the time. I hope that's okay, bro. Hey. Oh, hey. Brandon, shouldn't you be playing with the others? Well, I noticed you were over here all by yourself. You think I wouldn't notice? Of course I'm gonna keep you company. That's sweet, but I'm fine, really. I want you to have fun. I'm... I'm nothing special. Of course you're special. You're special to me, Han. You're really sweet, Brandon. Thank you. Hey, um... How about you and I hang out sometime? Just the two of us. I'll get a job in the city. It's my treat. I'd like that very much. Great. When are you free? I'm free this Saturday. 
what day is it today? It's Monday, silly. <laughs> um, then why aren't you in school? Summer break, duh. Oh, right. <laughs> you sure are something, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now that's, that's it right there. That's some pure Kino content. He's also tried his hand several times at a series where he either gets inserted into the pony world or the ponies get inserted into his world. The latter of which half the cast gets transported to his house and the other transported to this other man's house, which is a complete and other shit den. Thinking to yourself, hey, so let me just tell you, this is the story of how my life changed. But in a weird way that is. So basically I'm just coming home from a short walk to the supermarket and picking up a few things. Why does it always have to be this? Chili pepper! Okay, this isn't funny anymore! Who are you? Where are you? Oh, it's just a talking horse. A TALKING HORSE! Ah! 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 What just happened? Hi everyone, my name is Brandon. You may or may not know me. You just saw Zach's part of the story. Now it's my turn. This is the story of how my life completely changed forever. And not in the way you'd expect. Let's just say, things are about to get really weird. My story just starts with a normal day of me just watching some Milo Pony and my Roku. Back to watching MLP. Can't be real. Am I seeing things right now? Are the ponies from MLP actually standing here in my room? Oh, this is so amazing! Yeah! Ah! Now I'd show you more, but I figure if you want to see more of this guy's content, you can go check out his channel for yourself. He is certainly a man who knows what he wants and is willing to make and pull people together and pay for said thing to exist. That thing being, having every character he wants to fuck, also want to fuck him. Charcoal Man, as suggested by Mew. Consider this one a little callback to the creepypasta iceberg. Charcoal Man is often considered one of the most prolific creepypasta artists online, with over 500 pieces of art depicting creepypasta characters old and new as well as analog horror series and just general horror, but particularly stuff that comes from online stories. I know for a fact that I used several pieces of art from Charcoal Man during the process of making my Creepypasta Iceberg, because often when no one else had made a piece of fan art relating to said Creepypasta, you could always depend on Charcoal Man for a cool depiction of it. X Minotone Maestro Jasmina Jazzy Green's life was tragically cut short due to heart failure, brought up by an eating disorder as a result of severe bullying. Though she suffered in life, her DeviantArt page shows the story of a budding young artist 
who went out of their way to make others smile and happy. Her obituary shows the love her family felt and their heartbreak along with her DeviantArt page being showered with wishes of restful peace and even many visiting every year to wish her happy birthday. Handbandana001 DA user Handbandana001 Real name Sergeant Christopher Frost was a war photographer using the art hosting platform for documenting the battle up close and personally during the war in Iraq. Akin to the news reports of the Vietnam War, his photos give an uncomfortable level of detail into a conflict you'd only hear bits and pieces of on the news. However, he and seven Iraqi Air Force members would meet their end in a helicopter crash on March 5th of 2008. While the exacts of what caused the crash are not known, what we do know is that a dust storm was likely the cause. Zovanorath. In 2015, DeviantArt user Snoopy Femme had planned and set out to commit what could have been one of the worst mass shootings in Canadian history. On February 12th, police received a tip that Snoopy, real name Lindsay Kanita Savanarath, and two others, Randall Shepard and James Gamble, were planning an attack at a shopping center near Nova Scotia. The next day, one of the gunmen who would have joined in on the attack was found dead from a suicide, with Savanarath being arrested hours later. Shepard and Savanarath faced charges of conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit arson, conspiracy to use weapons for a dangerous purpose, and unlawfully conveying threats through social media, with Shepard getting 10 years in prison, and Savannah Raff, or Lindsay, I have no idea if I'm saying her fucking name right or not, who gives a shit, getting life in prison, her being the puppet master of the whole thing. The two were also apparently frequenting Nazi groups online, and supposedly had planned to eliminate illegals in what she called a race war, or some dumb shit like that. But while we're on this terrible topic, Randy Stare slash EGS Productions. Now this one is a lot to go over, and is no joke one of the darkest, weirdest, and most bizarre sections of this iceberg, and goes well beyond the world of internet stupidity and degeneracy though there is still plenty of it involved in the story. And it just so happens that I have a very special guest here to collaborate with me to tell you all about Randy Stare. Randy Stare slash EGS Productions. Hi there, most of you don't know me, my name is Saber. Um, I make content very similar to Dylan, so if you want to check my shit out, then go ahead and do that. The story of Randy Stare was quite the rabbit hole to go through, and honestly, I think it warrants its own video. Just just because of how much lore there is to, th to this shit. But this is an iceberg, so I'm going to be as straightforward and to the point as possible. Back in 2006, Randy started out as a YouTuber. His content was mostly gameplay and unfunny skits. The gameplay itself was super unremarkable, and the skits themselves were, uh... What? You know what? Why don't I just show you? Why don't I just show you one? Now stop it! Stay here! I'll have a word with you later! Randy, no!
all of his skits were like this. Like, they were so funny, they make Fred look like a creative genius. And it got to a point where he started to realize that his skits were just unfunny. Alright, so if you're making an art piece and people just aren't interested in it, what do you do? Most of you would probably say, just stop right there. You see, that's what a rational, mentally stable person would do. But, uh... We'll come to find that Randy was the farthest from being mentally stable. So like this skit I just showed you, uh, he would start a series where he would systematically kill off the characters from his skits. Said characters being stuffed animals. Yeah, that's kind of the level of unfunny that we're working with here. After he would do this, seemingly out of nowhere, Randy would create not just a series on YouTube, but like a whole social network thing. It's kind of hard to explain, but I'll try anyway. But Randy seemed to like Danny Phantom. To be more specific, he was interested in a specific one-off character from the show, a ghost girl named Ember McLean. This guy was fucking obsessed with her. I mean borderline Chris Chan levels of obsession. I mean like it got to the point where he made six original characters based off of her. Most of his artwork was posted to DVR, hence why it's on this iceberg in the first place. But you remember that social networking thing I mentioned earlier? This guy made a wiki fandom page for these characters and I think like 7 different Twitter accounts for them. He called this fictional group the Ember Ghost Squad or EGS. His YouTube channel and his Twitter accounts are all suspended now but his DeviantArt is still up. Because his accounts are suspended, I've had to go out of my way to find archives of all this shit. So, some of the material you'll see was taken from other people's videos. And I'm not doing this to like plagiarize them, I actually can't find this shit anywhere because it's been deleted now. Whenever we get to that point, I'll put their usernames in the top corners so at least they'll get some credit. But essentially at this point in time, I guess you could call this the EGS arc of Randy's story. Anyway, whatever you want to call this part, this is where his mental state starts to decline, like a lot. Somehow Randy's content went from shitty to fucking batshit insane. Here's a couple of my favorite examples. Also, apparently Randy seemed to really care about the Super Bowl. I hope you all fucking die. Now you probably thought it was unfair of me to compare Randy to Chris Chan earlier, but this is where the similarities start to actually line up with each other. So you see, Randy started to have these beliefs, like how when you die you become a ghost girl and you join the EGS squad in the afterlife. Even if you're a man, you still become a girl. The reason why he believed that part is because Randy was a closeted transsexual. This is just when things started to change with me in 2013. It's when I started, um... I guess you could say cross-dressing, which is something you never knew I did. I was cross-dressing ever since high school. And what would happen would be when you guys would go to your bowling leagues and Jeremy would go with you, which was every Wednesday, I would either film a YouTube video, you know, back in early high school, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th grade. I would pretty much always film a YouTube video between 9th and 10th grade on every Wednesday when you would go out the door. So I would either film a video or I would cross-dress. And that's something I've kept to myself my whole life. I never told anybody about this. The more I wore girl clothes, the more I felt like that was who I was. Like I felt like I was a girl and I found out that I was. I was never meant to be a guy. I was just a female soul trapped in a man's body my whole life. Every three days since like 2016, I've been shaving my arms and legs and entire body every three days. You wonder what I'm doing in the shower for so damn long? I'm shaving my entire fucking body. Nobody ever questioned that, which I don't know why. <laughs> I hid it for the longest time. I, I kept the, the girl razor in my freaking desk over there. And I just got tired of hiding it. I'm like, well, they're going to have to eventually know anyway. So I just started leaving it on the counter, but nobody questioned it, which I couldn't believe. That shocked me. As time went on, I thought like Rachel, like I thought my name was always Rachel, but I don't know. But that's when that started, and that was the lead character for EGS. 
me. This was one of many feelings that Randy would state in his manifesto. He couldn't transition, so he made up a world where he was a girl the whole time. I'm saying manifesto. It was really more of a collection of files uploaded to Mediafire, which he would then tweet out on all seven of his Twitter accounts. It was a collection of photographs of what he wrote in his journal, videos of him talking to himself while driving to work. So, my last meal will most likely be Taco Bell. <laughs> and, uh, an art piece that, uh, <sighs> Trust me, you are not prepared for it. Let's start with the journal. The journal itself further details Randy's descent into madness, but it, um, it's a pretty long read, like a three hour long read. I ain't gonna do Dillinger like that, so just go watch that video and come back. Second was Randy talking to himself while he drives to work. These videos kind of give you a better picture of what's going on in his head. What happened? What the fuck happened, man? Swear to goddess, what the hell happened? So, this is surreal right now, but I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think this is gonna be my last video. This is it. The last one. Just looking at everyone at the supermarket. The manager's coming in. Ah, da 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 da, just messing around, talking about this, and making fun of this, or bitching about that, or whatever. And it's just like, Four more nights, your whole lives are going to be turned upside down. Because of me. I'm going to fuck your life up. I can't wait. <sighs> Alright. This is Andrew Blaze signing off for the last time. I'll see some of you soon. Enjoy the rest of your lives. Andrew, out. And now, let's get to the fun part. In this art piece, actually, should I call this art? I don't think this qualified, whatever, whatever. The video, we'll just call it that, begins with two messages. To all the people who screwed me over on this video and left me hanging, fuck you. To all the animators who agreed to help and shoved me aside as if I didn't even matter, fuck you. To all the worthless people involved with this video in general who made me feel like I didn't even matter, fuck you. To anyone who agreed to help in general and made me feel like I didn't even matter, Fuck you! To the fans who will appreciate what I managed to get done within five months completely on my own. Thank you! There are going to be some missing shots left unfinished in the video with animatics in place of the black holes due to zero of the 10 plus animators whom I reached out to even lifting a finger to help out. This was going to be something amazing. This was going to be something awesome. This was going to be something unique. In the end, what do I have? Hardly anything! Thanks to you good for nothing fa- Not sure if I can say that here. All of you animators can drop fucking dead. This was meant to be something spectacular, and all you did was crush my dreams for it. The animators just pushing me aside for more important work, when I was able to pay you for your outrageous fucking rate. Just fucking die. I'm gonna be fucking dead by the time you see this video. Congratulations, you fucking blew it. I hope you forever rethink what gets sent to you from now on. I hope you forever have the way of the world crushing your spine into the fucking pavement. We then cut to Randy making out with his Mossberg 590 shotgun. We then get a scene of one of his OCs playing an Ice Spice song. We then cut to some fan art of- My fucking god, I'm gonna say this out loud. We then cut to some fan art of the Columbine shooters after they've 
exited the server. I drew it. I drew my own version of that spy picture. I literally traced over it and made my own version of it. If you look really close, you will see it. But unless you know exactly what it looks like, you won't even notice that it's there. While in the background, people are trading middle school level insults at each other. Andrew's the lankiest, gayest kid in the county of Westboro! What'd you say, bitch? Shut your mouth, you goddamn whore! Hey, Andrew! I heard you like to print out girls' Facebook pics and jizz on their faces! Hold her down, grab her legs! Hey, look, there's Andrew John, his little girls again! Snip that bitch's hair off! Hey, Andrew! How big's your dick? I bet you jerk to your precious drawings because you can't get any real pussy! Hey, Rachel, how does my semen taste in your mouth? And then what happens next? <sighs> J just see for yourself. Yeah, someone made that. I know I said there were three main things included in the manifesto, but I don't know, think of it like side content, I don't know. Anyway, also included in the file was a video of himself flipping a coin. That coin flip would determine what would happen on June 7th of 2017. If it landed on heads, then his free trial of life would expire. But if it landed on tails, he would go to the supermarket where he worked at and end the lives of everyone there. Got a 1983 quarter right here. You believe in fate? Here's the fate test. I'm gonna flip this three times, or the best out of three, rather. And if it's heads, I'll do it here. If it's tails, supermarket. Just to the side. Tails. Which means there's gonna be a loss of a human life besides my own. Ultimately, the coin would land on Tails, and from that point on, Randy would start tweeting about what would happen on June 7th on all of his Twitter accounts. This sick fuck was actually excited for what he was about to do that. Randy would then arrive at the supermarket with a duffel bag full of 200 shotgun shells and two Mossberg 590s that he had named after his original characters. Randy would then fire 59 shots, killing three victims, 25-year-old Victoria Braun, 47-year-old Brian Hayes, and the 63-year-old Terry Sterling. Another co-worker, Christine Newell, would escape and alert the authorities. Basically, we were in one of the uh, um, cashier side of the store, and we both had our headphones in, and I'm in the middle of the aisle, and V and I were goofing off, and then she walked over to where we had our, our tags for the night, and she was getting another stack to put up, and I heard a couple popping sounds and then a thud. So my reaction was okay what did i just hear and i turned around to where v was to ask her and i saw randy there with the guns and uh v on the ground and i'm in the middle of the aisle and they're towards the end of the aisle so there's a like, several feet away between us and he let off two more rounds into v and then for probably three to five seconds he and I stared at each other and then he walked up through the next aisle and that's where he got Terry so reached into my pocket and I uh grabbed my cell phone and I called 911 while I was in the store I ran to uh where the cell scans were and I crouched behind there and I couldn't see him still so I ran a little further till I could see where he was and when I saw that his back was turned to where my location was I made it to the front doors where he had locked it with a pallet I was able to reach through to unlock the door, and when I tried to slide it, it wouldn't slide, so I slammed against it and popped it open. After this, Randy would then turn the boomstick on himself, ending his own life. In Terraria. Sorry, I know it's not tasteful, but I have to keep it safe for YouTube. Although Randy is dead, and therefore he doesn't make EGS content anymore, apparently he's actually cultivated a fanbase that's interested in the lore of what he's created. All I can say? Uh, don't harass them. Don't even get involved with them. Um, you're probably messing with all kinds of crazy if you do. Uh, just, just, just stay far the fuck away from it. But uh, yeah, that's kind of it for this part of the iceberg. 
There's a video by Mr. Medicare that goes more into detail about Randy's personal life that I didn't get into because of time reasons and because it kind of doesn't matter. But like, it's still funny so it's kind of worth checking out. I want to say thank you to Dylan for letting me collaborate with him on this and if you like what you see here or if you like the sound of my voice or just the general vibe of this part of the video then make sure you head over to my channel and subscribe. I'm sure Dylan will link me or tag me somewhere. So uh yeah. Thank you, Dylan, and uh, bye for now. Big shout out and thank you to Saber for helping me with this section and getting this iceberg done a little bit quicker. And again, you can check out his channel down below. But with that said, let's go over the final few entries of this iceberg together. Bonus entry, the self-help forum. So this is one that I've been alluding to for some time now on this iceberg, and I think it's time I get to it in full. So amongst the many dramas and the like that happened on the DA forums, never was there a more vicious and disgusting area than that of the self-help forum, or the help with life forum as it's now called. While normally this section is already pretty dark, as it is due to this being a place for people to vent their issues regarding everything from IRL drama, their living situations, relationship stuff, etc. It was also used for discussing online drama, usually the sorts that were happening between users on the site itself. It could get very heated due to that. It also was a place where people grieved the dead, and sadly a place where people talked about taking their own lives. While this is strictly prohibited now according to the new rules, it used to run rampant on the site back in the day, usually involving friends falling out, online relationships, or trolls messing with people. I distinctly remember as a kid reading through the forums and then eventually this one took my interest because I sort of liked observing people. And this was a place where you could look into others' most intimate and vulnerable lives. I never dared write anything in there in response to any of it, but I do remember reading about people's relationship issues and lots and lots of posts about people being angry at their parents for one reason or another, and even terrible stories of their parents abusing them in various ways. It would be quite difficult to read at points, and I remember the ones where people talked about ending it all, were often met with people trying to reach out and help them, and others mocking them. But ultimately, they were all strangers on the net, with little to no real knowledge of what the other person was really going through, or if it was even real to begin with. See, while there were many who did use the forum to discuss their issues, there were also many that simply went to the forums for attention, usually to rally others around them, a strange way of advertising their page, a manipulative way of gaining friends, or in some cases because they're a compulsive liar and they just decide to fucking do it. There were even people that would set up fake troll accounts to make it seem like they are being trolled or harassed or stalked online so that they could then rally people behind them as a victim, only for people to discover these people were lying later on, usually through a dumb mistake they made or them just straight up telling someone later on who would then go on to spill the beans. This became such a prevalent problem that many found themselves being cynical to anyone posting about this stuff or the taking of their life, or really just stuff in general, with many trolling people who came to the forums after that, no matter what the reason, which was already a thing before, but it became far more prevalent as time went on and fact from fiction became all the more blurred. There were also people admitting to enjoying many of the fetishes across the iceberg as well, as one in particular I remember being a pedophile, who was talking about why they were the way they were, uh, much to the debate and disgust of many on the forum. While none of this stuff is archived to my knowledge, it seems like it's not used as much these days. Back in the day, this was a prime place for some of the darkest, most pathetic, saddest, weirdest, and just general, most sickening dramas on the site. And needless to say, I don't think DeviantArt is exactly the best place for you to be airing out this stuff. But then again, nowadays people seem to do that in vent channels on Discord servers, which I don't think is very much better. In fact, it seems to be even worse depending on the community. 
So in general, I'd say maybe it's just not the best to uh, air out this sort of stuff online. At the very least, not in a public forum. Bonus entry, Impaling Fetish. You guys familiar with Vlad the Impaler? You familiar with impaling in general? You know, where you uh, shove a rod up someone's ass and usually through their mouth? That terribly gruesome way to die or be tortured? Uh, well, there is a fetish and a fair bit of fetish art centered around characters being impaled and dying in this terrible fashion, usually in quite gruesome detail. I can't really show you any of the pictures of this fetish, again, because of the detail, and they're usually nude on top of all that, but trust me, it's out there and it's extremely fucked up looking, and even outright horrifying in some cases, and I really, really wouldn't recommend looking it up. Bonus entry. Purple Kecleon. Ah, now this one is going to take a bit of time to describe. It's a real doozy, so buckle in. This is the type of creator that you could create an entire video around, all by itself. And it has had several very good videos made about them, at that. So excuse me while I try to make sense of it for you in an iceberg entry. Big shout out to the Kiwi Farms thread, which I'll be referencing and quoting from quite a few times during this entry for documenting this monster's behavior. Behavior that they were very happy was temporarily wiped clean from the internet back during the whole Keffel's Drop Kiwi Farms thing that was going on. Funny how all the worst people with the worst crimes seem to celebrate that day. Very, very interesting. But anyway, to start, Purple Kecleon, now known online as Glitched Puppet, real name Melanie Herring, and current legal name Ash Hazel Woods, is an infamous furry webcomic artist known for not only her terribly written Chris Chan levels of inserting real life drama and self pity into, and completely incoherent webcomic by the name of Floriverse, but also for her history in the Pokemon fandom, various fallouts and spouts of internet drama, her obsession with porn and inserting it into spaces that have children in them, which she is fully aware of, her pensions for Pokemon and Sonic porn that she creates in particular, contributing art to furry cub porn magazines, that's child furry character porn, just to be clear, oh, and her interesting lifestyle of being in a polyamorous relationship and fucking dogs. Yes, you did hear that right, and we will get to that in a moment. So to start from the beginning, PK, as I'll now be referring to them as, originally made a name for themselves outside of Oki Boards and Fur Affinity on DeviantArt, as the admin of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers group. She ran the group with Marl, her husband, Evie, her boyfriend, <laughs> as uh, well as an extensive group of associates whom she had several fallouts with. The group was advertised as a family-friendly Pokemon roleplay group, which if you remember from a past entry like near the beginning of this iceberg, they were pretty common on this website back in the day, and naturally attracted many young users and teens to the group, looking to have some roleplaying adventures. However, it didn't take long for this group to devolve into PK's fetish den, rife with drama that involved multiple characters being raped, PK and Marl rigging their own contest at one point so that their sock puppet account could win, PK's Mary Sue having sex with underage characters, oh, and tricking users to go off-site to her porn Tumblr blog to read more from her stories and roleplays. Again, purposely exposing and playing in sexual roleplays with minors, amongst many other things. Due to this, much drama ensued, and at one point, nearing the group's ultimate end, PK had a fallout with another admin named Mike. This incident was based entirely on petty grievances, which led PK to make an overly long detailed callout on Mike. And when I mean overly long, I mean good lord in heaven. This being a prime example of PK's tendency to write novella-length documents to destroy someone's credibility, based on her word alone, leading the subject of said callout to be dogpiled by her minions, which sadly, yes, she does seem to collect around herself. But at some point, the group finally completely fell apart, 
and so PK and her husband left it behind in pursuit of an original project, that being the aforementioned Floriverse, which of course, like the Pokemon Dungeon 1 before, had a family-friendly appearance with a porn-themed sister site named Forbidden Flora. Of note, on the Bad Web Comics wiki, where they, uh, you know, document and review bad web comics, they note in regards to Floraverse, quote, It can be said that Floraverse itself marked the downfall of Melanie's career as an artist. Much can be compared between Melanie's art prior to 2013 and the art that is featured in the comic. Bean Mouth is a symptom of Melanie's quantity over quality approach to creating as much Floraverse content as possible in a short amount of time. The story of Floraverse started off well, and many readers enjoyed the comic in the first year of its run. Due to the lack of resolve, the plot started to become incoherent following the publication of Try Try Again, and several concurrent and overlapping story arcs would run at the same time. Floraverse is also used by the author as a vehicle for their personal ideologies, further alienating their user base when readers discovered how insane Melanie and her herring can be. They also note, quote, An adults-only extension of the comic, Forbidden Flora, also contains stories relevant to the main plot of Floraverse. Thus, reading pornographic comics is necessary to get the full story, something which is concerning as there are many underage fans of the comic. The authors have made no attempt to prevent minors from accessing Forbidden Flora, even though they acknowledge that minors read their comic. They also, on a last note, on the actual plot of the comic, quote, A bird and a blob go to deliver some seeds. Eventually, they end up in a place known as Hellside. The importance of the seeds is never quite established. In fact, the original Floriverse story to start in 2013 never quite ended. Ask any Floriverse fan about the plot and they'll probably shrug their shoulders. Over the course of the story, there are several omnipotent beings that tell the protagonist they will find out about the importance of the seeds soon. But this never actually comes about. The main plot never really advances. So a lot of content in smaller episodes that take place within the universe and over the story becomes more convoluted into the introduction of many one-shot characters and plot arcs that are never resolved." Unquote. So yeah, but going beyond that and into their own personal life some more, around this time frame, PK started using Tumblr way more often and thus began to, uh, shapeshift, shall we say, to it, including adopting the non-binary label, expressed a deep hatred for all things male, went on a rant about Spyro the Dragon not having enough female characters in it, and how she vows to make the female gender the default in her own webcomic. Oh, and, uh, she then took on the mantle of a sex guru of sorts, where she would give people on Tumblr, of all ages, advice with sex and with uncovering their sexual identities. Again, let me be clear, including minors, which she was called out on in this post. Quote, Anonymous asked, I noticed you were giving advice to minors, and is it wrong that I find this kind of problematic? I mean, usually it's their teacher's or parent's job to talk about these things, not a random person on the internet, even if they have good intentions. Sorry if I sound rude, but it's just an observation that kind of irked me. To which PK replied, If you feel the need to come to a random person instead of their teacher or their parent, then I'm not going to stop them. What would you prefer? They receive nothing instead. When I answer the questions from people who say they're underage, I take into account how I felt during being their age, and I take into account experience I have now. Be irked all you want, but don't do it at me or them. Be irked at the teachers or parents for making these kids feel like they don't have anyone else to turn to." Unquote. Hmm, very interesting. Funny how sex talk and sexual content and minors keeps coming up for this person as we continue. But nah, I'm sure they have only the best of intentions. Some other miscellaneous Tumblr and Twitter drama from PK include PK and her boyfriend chasing a Steven Universe writer off of Tumblr, uh, that is to say that PK and Evie decide to go after Matt Burnett because of a consistency issue in an episode that had a character, that being Pearl, expressing that she liked pie. She has had her followers attack random people in the past for criticizing her works or her in general, and really doesn't seem to respond too kindly to people criticizing her, period, on the internet. At another point, when she was with her husband Marl and boyfriend Evie, 
Again, being polyamorous in relationship, Morrow had sex with someone without telling PK, and she threw all the dirty laundry out for her minions to see, as you can see here in this Tumblr post, where she cries about how none of this would have gotten her angry if they simply would have said something to the, her first, to uh, get her permission because, well, I guess she rules the roost of this house of degeneracy, and while she's able to do as she wishes, her two uh, minions are not allowed to do the same. Funnily enough though, right after that, her boyfriend Evie also wanted to have sex with someone without asking PK's permission. So in her anger, she made hate art of her Mary Sue decapitating both Marl and Evie for their merch store as seen here. Uh, the two of them eventually groveled back to her for repentance. However, as noted in the Kiwi Farms thread, Quote, the tables turned on the furry drama queen as an ex by the name of Pengo Solvent called her out on Tumblr accusing her of being emotionally abusive in their relationship. Well, these allegations are based on Pengo's words alone. One thing that did surface are testimonies that PK's cuck husband Marl is a zoophile and a dog fucker. Multiple people came forward with allegations that Marl would slip into their DMs and ask them to fuck off his dog. When Morrow caught wind of this, he and PK immediately threatened Pengo with a lawsuit, and Pengo took everything down as a result. However, in all this whirlwind of drama, Morrow confirmed that he is into having sex with dogs, but that he doesn't appreciate it being dragged out into the public, as per quoted here. Yo, Pengo, I will admit that I am into what the Anon person, who I am pretty sure is either Invader Pichu or Minon, mentioned, but I do not appreciate things I like being dragged out into the public eye. I've never pressured those people, and I've never posted things you've done to be ridiculed and scrutinized. I would ask you not to publicly publish this ask, but I don't know if that request would be granted. I have never once in my life had any ill will towards you, and I still don't." Unquote. Um, <clears throat> yes, of course I love to fuck dogs, but, um, you know, you didn't have to be, like, rude about it and, like, tell everybody about it, you know? But all well, this actually gets far worse. Quote, In 2015, a person by the name of Lane posted on Kiwi Farms that Marl attempted to groom her when she was 13 in a Floriverse chat room to both have sexual relations with him and his dog. While there were no logs or receipts that confirmed her accusation at the time, PK, Evie's, and Marl's reactions and outright denial of anything happening set the stage to the incoming shitstorm. PK did her best to defend her dog fucker husband and insisted that she was 100% sure that nothing happened and Lane was a liar by trying to frame her as an underage temptress that tried to get older men into trouble. PK never provided any logs that proved this accusation despite promising to do so." Unquote. And then after all these accusations, confirmations of both her and her husband's strange and disgusting fetishes and behavior, the full truth finally came out. But not before an attempt to rebrand after the recent controversies was done. Uh, Melanie actually changed her username from Purple Kecleon to Glitch Puppet or Glip at this point. Glip continued to do as she always did, however, and then the polyamorous trio started to become active in a Discord server that was originally used to discuss her webcomic that eventually devolved into, you guessed it, yet more degeneracy and kids aplenty being there. But then, in 2018, a shitload of logs were leaked, finally confirming and showcasing just how demented, evil, and disgusting both PK and her two cucks were. The TLDR summary goes as follows. Quote, 1. Her husband Marl tried to groom a minor, that goes by the name of Big Fluff, to have sexual relations with him and his dog. 2. Marl pimps out his dog and is involved in the zoophile community. 3. He is also 100% aware that Big Fluff was underaged. And 4. He showed her a dick pic, his creepy zoophile listing, and how he could introduce her to a prostitute friend of his, 
if she was interested in an escort gig. They arranged a real-life meetup to help out in the Floriverse merch store. Big Fluff visited the Huffgod Trio's Vegas house, and while there, ran into Melanie, or PK, in the nude. Marl confirms that Melanie doesn't care about her age at all. After the business visit, Marl was pestering Big Fluff to visit again, so they could finally have sex bragging that he had bad dragon toys. It's implied in the logs that Big Fluff had multiple visits to the dogfucker home, and Melanie flat out ignored her. Consequently, a user dumped the logs on the official Floriverse Discord server, where Marl confesses through a moderator that the logs were true and that he had no ill intent. This caused a shitstorm of epic proportions where the mod attempted to backpedal and said the logs were fabricated because they came from Kiwi Farms. The logs were leaked on Tumblr and Twitter alike and spread like wildfire. An ex of Melanie tweeted about Morrow also trying to get her to fuck his dog as well. The log also ended two business ventures for Floriverse. The comic was taken off of the Hiveworks website and the ESC toy ended their Floriverse toy campaign." Unquote. So, shit's looking pretty bad for the trio. What's gonna happen next? Well, it seems they got, uh, rather scared for once. Quote, Two days after the incriminating logs were leaked, Melanie made an announcement of leaving the internet forever and locked her Twitter account. She firmly insisted that the logs were fabricated and that this was part of a harassment campaign. Evie claims that he believed that the logs were edited, but like Melanie, can't provide any proof. But then things took an unexpected turn a month later, when their Vegas home was put up for sale, and they fled from the state. Hmm, definitely the actions of a innocent trio. Evie broke his silence with a Patreon blog post, proclaiming that Kiwi Farms killed Floriverse. The Floriverse Patreon, however, remained active and still charged monthly payments. Months later, the Glitch Puppet Twitter became active again. Melanie posted pictures of her new designer cat, and with some internet sleuthing, it was discovered that they were staying at Marl's parents' house in Arkansas, based on the cat pictures. Then, quote, On July 22nd, 2018, Melanie announced that she was divorcing Marl after months of silence. She also published an apology allegedly written by Marl where he confesses that he is a zoophile, but only in fantasy, and the logs were edited to make him look worse than what he was. The apology is extremely suspicious in the way that it frames Melanie as the one true victim of his crimes mentioning her 27 times, and how she was completely unaware of his suvilic fantasies. A leak proved Melanie expressed that she was fully aware of the dog-fucking however. In 2020, when people made note of this inconsistency to Melanie, Melanie backpedaled and edited the apology with her commentary. More suspiciously so, the Zoophile trio changed their legal names. Melanie was now Ash Hazel Woods, Marl was now Lycus Argent Woods, and Evie was now Evelyn Clover Woods. Melanie and Evie officially moved to Colorado while leaving Marl behind in Arkansas. Evie tweeted their new location publicly on Twitter, despite expressing fearing for their lives beforehand. Thus, they were immediately located and doxxed." Unquote. This left many angry and suspicious because it was clear these people did heinous shit and were trying to get away with it. And what's more is because PK is such a manipulative person, she managed to paint a picture in which it appeared she was perfectly innocent, despite the fact that the logs and all the facts do not line up with her tailored version of reality. On a couple final notes, quote, Now that Floriverse is tanking in relevancy in readers, Melanie has completely lost her mind, and shits out barely legible MS Paint comics and VNs. Melanie and Evie also created a game named Cherry Kisses, published on Steam. The objective is to run a sex shop as you're terrorized by a miner who wants to shut it down. The Floriverse Discord server was remade, but this time its intended purpose was for Melanie to use it as a therapy tool for her fans. She uses attack therapy through weird BDSM rituals, and she calls scenes. It is also worth noting that after divorcing, Melanie married Evie and quickly found a new moral replacement and attack dog by the name of Axie, whom she cucks Evie with. 
There's a couple additional notes. She also loves playing with her own period blood, bathes with her various designer cats that she buys. Oh, and in case you were wondering what was up with that Eevee person, well, they are a whole other can of worms full of their own strange behavior and degeneracy. But I think I'll just simply showcase this picture here with all these tweets um, defending pedophilia and owning CP. Very, very interesting. Yeah, so in short, PK is one of the most disgusting, weird, degenerate, and manipulative people on here. But what really makes them bad is that they are still around. They have an active Twitter account in Discord and have continued to repeat the same bad behavior they always have done, but just under a different name, so that they might be able to have the chance of manipulating more into their sick games. In addition to all this, PK, or Glitch Puppet's current Discord server, is currently operating like a pseudo-cult of sorts, complete with, of course, child grooming, several confessed pedophiles and fetishistic freaks helping to run the server, and several testimonials and leaks showcasing just how fucked up everyone is in there. Which, in case you want to see all of this in more detail than what I can provide here in this iceberg, you can go check out the webcomic reliefs video series on the topic of both everything I've already covered as well as stuff that happened more recently. Is people like PK that make sites like Kiwi Farms important, if only for documenting and spreading word of dangerous people like this, who should, along with their lovers, be put in jail at this point for all the heinous shit that they have done? But unfortunately, they have managed to time and time again get away with it all, despite their behavior being truly disgusting, evil, and illegal. A wretched sort that first came from DA, but now finds their home anywhere they can talk to children. Which brings me to one of our final entries. Bonus entry. The current state of DeviantArt slash porn being banned. This one is pretty topical and, well, it's gonna have some widespread effects. More than likely, anyway. The long and short of it is that very recently, DeviantArt has changed its policy about adult content on the site. Now, they've always been very wishy-washy on this topic, before as noted throughout this iceberg, with porn not being allowed, but still clearly on the site anyway. But now, they have changed their policies to be this. Quote, DeviantArt will remove 18 plus slash adult material which features real people, subjects fictional or otherwise that are under 18, including aged up characters, content offering sexual services, glorification of sexual violence, certain fringe sexual fetish topics, or other fetish creations that are hard to distinguish from non-consensual sex." Unquote. That, uh, underage thing, as well as the fetish material part, is what really is starting to hit some artists on here very hard, with many of them having their art taken down, or their entire accounts being banned from the site. It's unclear why this sudden shift happened, though it does seem rather similar to when the site Tumblr did a very similar ban on adult content. And if history is yet again repeating itself, it means that there will be a grand exodus from the site, and whatever people were still using it will begin to jump ship elsewhere. That elsewhere usually being sites less niche, though some may opt for that, which means the fetish material and porn and content that they are making will now begin showing up far more often than it normally would have on your everyday websites. And any weird cultures that they have cultivated over there will also begin to blend in over on the general web as well. Though it should be noted that Tumblr had a very distinct culture it cultivated that made it quite the shock and change to other platforms when they were forced off their original domain. And DeviantArt doesn't quite seem to have the same unifying culture as Tumblr did at the time, especially since DA is often considered dead anyway these days. But nonetheless, this will have at least some impact on other platforms getting this finished material showcased more often since their domain has kicked them out. It also means several pages I've talked about across this iceberg may cease to exist soon enough. So in a strange sort of way, this iceberg marked the death of the site 
and many of his users, documenting what may be their last days before they move elsewhere. Kind of funny that, but also tragic in that I will probably have to see Vor art more often than I would like to. So thank you, people running DeviantArt. You have unleashed the beasts upon the world from what was once your den. Take this as a warning, dear viewer. The tidal wave is sure to be messy. But now onto our final entry on this iceberg. Bonus entry, Reicheru Ketsuki. So often on these icebergs, I tend to end on a rather existential note, or on a particularly dark figure that really isn't funny, kind of interesting maybe, but really is just more so horrifying and disgusting. And we certainly have had quite a few of those across this final tier at this point. For a bit of a change of pace, I'd now like to shift gear to some good old fashioned, charming yet weird cringe content, or as I like to call it, art. To start with, she of course has a DA account, which I suppose I'll give the bio of which a read for you. Quote, I know Japanese and I like to draw like the people on anime shows. My favorite hobby is singing. I like to write fan fiction too, and to anyone that says otherwise, you can suck it, XD. My best friend is Leela Chan, or Yuki, whatever you prefer. We've been together for a long time, and I'll never meet anyone as wonderful as you. I love you. Someday I want to draw very well and make my own manga, if I can. Right now, I make animations. I'm the creator of Blood Raining Night on YouTube. Reichiro, I'm part vampire, neko, hunter, and demon. I can do sorcery and I work for the Yakuza because I must kill people to satisfy my own needs and to protect the world. A lot of my friends really love me and I love them. I would die for them. I have special powers like being able to read people's minds and fight really well when I'm not hurt. Sometimes I can seduce people and then kill them. I can transform into a cat demon, not by choice. My favorite thing to do is shing and love Denny Kuhn from Italia. is my love. This is all my character's info. Ray Cherry loves to write. I love to write too. I love to sing. I love to draw. So don't mess with me unless you're ready for a fight. Okay, thanks, bye. I write poems and make tons of pictures, so if you're looking for something, you'll find it here. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. I don't bite, unquote. So I think that perfectly gives you a taste of their personality. I'm sure it took a few of you back to the days of using DA because this feels like classic DeviantArt bio incarnate. Fitting, it should be the last we read. She also has several pieces of art, as you can see here, all of which showcase her mastery over the craft. Of a similar nature and quality, Reichiro has also wrote a fanfiction, which I would love to read in full for you. And maybe we can via Patreon slash membership bonus video. But for now, why don't we quickly read the first chapter together? Quote, Chapter 1, The First Rainy Night. The sky was blew out. Reichiro had just opened her golden eyes to the morning, like she has for the past 17 years of her life. She groggily rubbed her hands on her eyelids and rolled over. She was staring Denmark in the face, or she liked to call him Denny. Denny Kun! She spoke softly, like floating butterflies on the breeze. Good morning. I've missed you in my sleep. I've missed you too. He took his hand and ran it down to the tip of her soft furry ear. Her ear twitched with delight. I get worried about you sometimes though. Really? Her golden eyes lit up like a light in a lamp in the dark night. Yes, of course. You work for the Yakuza. How else am I supposed to feel? Her eyes gazed downward, like as if trying to see something on the floor. It's good to know there's actually someone who cares about my existence. I love you with all my heart, Raycoon. Yeah, you do? I know you do. I love you, Denny Kun. Rechiro purred. They kissed passionately like a woman and a man that haven't seen each other for 40 years but have loved each other all that time. She wanted to drink his blood really, really bad, but she couldn't. For if she were to suck the life juices out of him, it would turn him into a demon vampire. Of course, she would never let anything bad happen to him. He was the love of her life and her only love. Rechiro dressed in her outfit. She wore to the Yakuza and got ready for work. She wore a white schoolgirl's outfit that had long sleeves 
a red ribbon around her neck, red trimming that went on her sleeves, a red skirt, her brown hair tied up in a red ribbon as blood, and a big gun. Her long brown hair and blue highlight in the middle swayed in the breeze so beautifully. She could almost kill someone with her lips were really red, but she didn't need expect that she would have a tough assignment today. Richero was out, prowling in the woods, when she heard a certain cackling. It was a witch! Oh, the witch said in a nasty voice, like you're eating something slimy. I see there's a girl out to get me, and she thinks she's prettier than me, eh? Well, Rachel smiled, you're old and ugly, and I'm assigned to kill you. This will be the last time you fight me. Rachel ran towards the hag, her breast delicately bouncing in the wind. The witch took out her staff and tried to smite her but fell short when Reichiru suddenly disappeared and reappeared behind her. I told you not to mess with me, she said, slitting the witch's throat open. She put her lips to the wrinkly neck and sucked on it, really, really hard. The blood came pouring into her mouth like a waterfall of gore and violence. She was going home after killing the witch when she heard an unusual noise coming from the bushes. He said, I've come back for you. Rachiro was astonished. Father? She yelped. You're supposed to be dead. Why did you come back? Why did you have to come back? Tears of pain and darkness rolled down her eyes as her worst nightmare stepped towards her. I'm undefeatable, bitch. You had your chance years and years ago, but you failed. Now I'm back to get you. You don't want to fight me, father. She drew out a long, bloody sword and looked at him in a cruel way. I haven't come to kill you right now, but someday beware. With that, he threw a smoke bomb at her and disappeared. Unquote. Ah, truly brings tears of inspiration and light to roll down my eyes. You know what? I've decided. There will most definitely be a full reading of this fanfiction over on my Patreon and YouTube memberships. So if you want to check that out, it's most likely going to come out next month. Uh, be sure to follow both of those. Just a reminder that I already recorded the entirety of the Sonic.exe remake over there if you want to have a listen to that. But anyway, enough shilling. But while all this is cool, the main thing Reichiro may be known for in some circles, and it's without a doubt their magnum opus, is their animated series posted on YouTube all the way back in 2012 by the name of Blood Raining Night, which seems to have been heavily inspired by many of her favorite animes, in particular, Elf and Lead, it would seem. And while the full series can be found on YouTube, and someone has gone through the trouble of putting it all together into a nice 40 minute movie, I do feel as though that we simply must see a couple more clips from it. Wouldn't you agree, dear traveler? Hey, good morning, Rage Heru. Good morning, Denny Kun. Yeah. I have to go to work today. You gotta be careful. I worry about you. Don't worry, I'll be fine. You work for the Yakuza, that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you'll be okay. Man, it is dangerous working for the Yakuza. I better be kept on my toes. Huh? Who's there? Ah, hello! You think you're so pretty and so awesome like you're gonna kill me. But I know better. I'm gonna kill you. I'm supposed to. It is part of my job. Neon! Goodbye, you pathetic bitch. Worthless. <sighs> Well, I guess that's it for today. Hmm? Why, hello there. It is me, your father. My father's dead. I've come back to finish what I've started. I've come back to destroy you, bitch. Hate you. <laughs> Good luck with that. My dad. He's back. Oh! Well, it's nice to see you again, Rageru. Uh, 
Huh? Oh, an Iyashisama! How did the battle with the witch go? Great! But, uh... My father, he is... Alive. No! How can he be alive? Your father is dead! I don't know how it happened... Crap, where am I? Yeah. Yeah, D did I kill someone? Uh. <sighs> hey, who the fuck's there? <laughs> it's me, the Shomaru, the Vampire Lord. Yeah. How the fuck are you still alive? You died! So you all thought! My brother, I have come to take vengeance on our mother. And kill him. He loved your mother. You need to let go of the past. You think you can stop me? Break Jeru, catch the wreck, and Nekioni? Your time is up. But, I can't let you do that. Nyan! Oh, God, what the fuck? There are no Neko Onis with us. You were wrong about that. Ah! What a fucking show off. Shut up, Lucy. No need to be a dick. <sighs> Calm down, guys. Did I introduce you guys to my new TA? Hello, class. You may call me Alucard. Oh my god! He's beautiful! <laughs> you pathetic whore. I'll end your misery. Don't push me, Lucy. Or what? I think that's enough of that for now, but if you'd like to see more of this masterpiece, links will be down below. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our journey. We've seen all that there is to see within the DeviantArt Museum, and it only took like, what, a year or so of, uh, walking about? I hope you all have enjoyed the journey as much as I have, which is to say, I hope that you've enjoyed the videos, but on the other hand, Congratulations! It's over! You never have to look at another one of these disgusting fetish-filled landmines or pits ever again if you don't want to. I know that I will certainly be avoiding almost all of this disgusting shit as much as I possibly can within the near to distant future. But all the same, it has been fun going down memory lane a little bit and showcasing some of the more interesting figures on the site. Once again, a humongous thank you to Nora for not only making this iceberg, but also creating a Word doc for me to be able to quickly look into things and have have a kind of like basis for all the entries going forward as well as reaching out to me to do this whole DeviantArt iceberg thing to begin with so a humongous thank you to them I also want to thank all the people who helped me in both researching as well as well as the suggestions for the final tier of this iceberg you all have some very interesting stuff and in case you're wondering, the next iceberg has already been decided, and I am currently working diligently to have it all put together. 
because it is yet again going to cover another website and its history and its many users. But I will be taking pieces from other icebergs as well as developing some of my own and getting some suggestions from you guys to fill it out to make it as comprehensive and interesting as possible. But all that being said, what is the website in question? Why none other than Newgrounds. That's right, I'm going to be covering the entirety of a well, yet to be fully developed Ultimate Newgrounds Iceberg. The first part of which you can expect early next year. It's gonna be a big one, so if you want more updates regarding its progress and what have you, then you can go and join my Patreon or channel memberships and you will get updates as it is being produced. But also, if you happen to want to be part of the uh, iceberg, possibly having a suggestion or two from you, on it, then you can also join my Discord server and suggest things there. Or you can just DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I might see it there as well. Yet again, if you're going to suggest something, make sure you provide links and a little bit of information about the topic beforehand. So that way I can quickly decide if it's going to fit in with the iceberg or not. But all that being said, I hope that you all look forward to the next big iceberg project, as well as all the other stuff coming out within the next couple months, including the Linkara chapter of the Channel Awesome Retrospective. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members, including all of my night eggs and my night outlets, as well as a very special thank you to all of my great night owls, including Channel 11, Hexmaniac Hannah, Tony Teramaya, Icy Dice, Ho Hot, and Medusa's Hex, as well as a super duper special thank you to all of my arch owls, including the Savory Salt, the Wise Nicodemus, the Talented Cherry and GT, the Good Chi Vibes Zen Garden Party, Tad, aka I Said Fuck It, Heaven's a Really Long Walk, the Super Saiyan Star Punch Gaming, the Fearless Forgotten Ace, and the other Super Saiyan Sword. Thank you all so very much for your support, and thank you all for watching this Iceberg series to its end. I hope to see you next time we take a deep dive. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.